officially started, but I would say we are here. Our chief, once our chief guest comes in, then we shall do the really official uh, remarks. But uh, my my communication now, I would want to first of all uh, recognize all the dignitaries in the house, uh, all protocol observed. Uh, we shall have a very um, that moment that uh, we then have to go a little formal. But I would want to invite us to to the Guild Leaders Summit 2024. This is uh, the inaugural uh, Guild Leaders event. And uh, on that, I would want you to, to clap your hands and say we are here as a Guild Leaders. And uh, the intention, and, and of course, you, you've shared, most of you have this concept, is we want to have all of us reunite. All of us, uh, the Guild Leaders, come back together, creating one movement, and we create that civic, uh, to, to, to ensure that you have that civic competence and uh, civically engage in the development of uh, our country, Uganda. So I would want you to, to take your seats, I feel at home. We're going to have a very interesting conversation today. I'm sure you have the programs around you, you have the files, you have uh, the, the documents shared uh, in both soft copies and uh, hard copies. Kindly uh, feel at home. We also uh, very important is that uh, this event is an opportunity to network. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to, to rekindle all the memories of uh, the past, including the present. That's why we are to, to invite the former guild uh, leaders as far as 1962. We have uh, the, the, the Honorable Matthew Richikiri, I think he's uh, the oldest of all of us here. And we, on that, we also have the most current uh, guild leaders in the house. Uh, please uh, take your seats. Those are, that are having breakfast should hurry so that we are able to kickstart. Uh, the VIPs that are getting in, as uh, guild presidents, as guild leaders, you love the opportunity to meet. You love the opportunity to network. You love the opportunity to share those contacts and also see to it that uh, as we are moving into this uh, journey of uh, leadership, we are able to connect with uh, these uh, dignitaries that will shape us in one way or the other. As the Guild uh, President's Leadership Academy, we are designing a curriculum for all the outgoing guild presidents. And uh, the, the guild president's leadership academy is intended to bring a new generation of politicians in parliament and political party structures. Over time, most of us as uh, guild presidents, as guild leaders, once we are done with our, with our, with our tenure of the guild, we find ourselves uh, losing touch of the politics of the day, we are getting, we are, we are into the hustles of the day, and in some way we've left the politics to the people that uh, that have really watered down uh, the, the, the 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 democracy that we really really uh, aspire to have as a country. So, as guild presidents and as the academy, we are going to be very intentional on ensuring that we empower the guild presidents, equip you with the right skills give you all that that is needed to make sure that you win, to make sure that you get into those parliament seats, to make sure that you're into all those uh, political party structures, to make sure that we're in charge as young people and uh, as the people that uh, have already been tested and tried through the politics of the university. Kindly, as uh, the announcement will come out at some point for registration, especially the current guild presidents, I would invite you so much to apply for the academy. The academy will be a six-month program, very solid, very uh, rigorous, but also the academy will allow us the opportunity to send you down to the grassroots. And we shall move you with you down in the grassroots to make sure that you have this election won and to make sure that we ensure that you are delivered to the position that you want. So kindly and kindly as a good leader, as a good president especially, please, once that call is out, we are inviting you to apply. We shall have faculty uh, uh, facilitators into, 
into, that, into the academy that are renowned and well-tested and tried, people with credibility, leaders with credibility, that will be coming to facilitate. We shall have guest facilitators across the globe. Like we are using this opportunity to, to, to host and also have uh, the former, the fourth, uh, president of the Repub United Republic of Tanzania. We are, going, we are not going to, to, to drop into the level or, or the mark that we've set, the pace that we've set. The summit, the academy, will have the kind of people, the kind of African leaders that we aspire or that we look up to, those that have mentored us from afar, those that we look up to, those that have inspired us, all those will be part of us in the academy, but importantly, in the summit. The summit is intentional because we want to ensure that uh, we bring, as we are coming together, as a guild leaders, we are going to have conversations happening today. From these conversations, we are going to have recommendations after the day is done. Those recommendations are going to inform the thematics that uh, we shall be working on across the year. I, I am not sure which kind of thematics, but I know we shall draw those thematics according to the discussions we'll have through the panels, but also through the keynote speakers. Those are going to inform what has come out, what has come out so loud in these conversations. And those thematics could be environment, could be climate justice, could be AI uh, and, and its wave now could be all these. So if we have the thematics drawn down, we shall have you as the guild leaders come through your areas of interest and engage through these thematics. Now these thematics will inform our direction of our advocacy across the year. We shall have all of us engaged in these thematics, in these programs, the different programs. We are happy that we have uh, the teams that are coming on board to support us in partnership to ensure that we realize this dream. As young people, we are going to expand our scope. I was talking um, briefly with the chief guest, and I'm sure he will raise it. We want to expand this, and especially now that the, the East African integration and the conversation around is so loud. We need to make sure that we expand our conversation across the region. So we need to set pace for the region so that when we interest the other young people in the other regions, they should be able to see that there's something that is happening in Uganda already. So I welcome you in the Guild Presence Leadership Leaders Summit. And uh, all of you are members by the fact that you're Guild Leaders. And those that uh, haven't really gone through Guild Leadership, we shall ensure that we incorporate you in one way or the other. The Secretariat is drawing all these programs to make sure that the events around the summit are all involving, all young people will be part and parcel of the proceedings of the summit. No one is going to be left behind, just like all of us are here. Uh, thank you for listening to me for now. I would want to invite uh, Professor uh, Sarah Sali. I don't know where she is, as a host and as a, uh, as a lead in Makere, she should uh, give us her address. And from then, we shall take on the proceedings as uh, we'll be guided by the program. I thank you very much. His Excellency, Yoweri Kagutam Seven, President of the Republic of Uganda, Her Excellency Jessica Alupo, Vice President of the Republic of Uganda, our Chief Guest, 
His Excellency Jakaya Mrisho Chikwete, Right Honorable Rukakana Rugunda, Ambassador Major General Paul Kisesa Simuli, Ambassador Colonel Fred Mwesje, Honorable Matthew Ruchikire, Professor Alini Twe Henry, Vice Chancellor, Acting Vice Chancellor Makere University, all our distinguished, distinguished guests in your different capacities, and all our guild presidents and leaders in the house. It is with honor that I stand before you this morning to give welcome remarks and set the agenda for this inaugural Guild Leader Summit. The Guild Leader Summit is a pivotal platform for fostering collaboration, sharing insights, and driving impactful change in our country and on our continent. It is a brainchild of the Guild Leaders Presidential Leadership Academy, comprising several Guild presidents and leaders, past and present, of the different institutions of higher learning in this country. Over time, Guild leadership in higher institutions of learning had become more of a contest of money and violence as opposed to a contest of ideas. The two vices had gained a significant role in determining student leadership, including winning political positions and the events thereafter. Often, this was normalized with several justifications, crowding out intellectualism and the culture of debates and ideas which defined guild politics in the past. Hence, today, it's not uncommon to have younger people demanding to be at the table, yet without a clear focus on the contribution they seek to make while at the table. The consequence has been a reproduction or a worsening of the status quo they seek to transform. Several institutions are fortunately doing their best to change the, guild, the guild's political culture. However, effective transformation requires the stakeholders, and in this case, guild leaders, to come on board. That's why the initiative of the Guild Presidential President's Leadership Academy and the Guild Leaders Annual Summit is worth celebrating as we are going to observe today. And why is this important? The failed development programs on the continent require the concerted effort of Africans, especially its youth, who the Guild Leaders are. Undermined by several years of slavery, colonialism, and plunder, our continent today remains marginalized and exploited. Seeking to mitigate this, the African Union came up with several initiatives, including African solutions to African problems, regional development blocks such as the East African Community, COMESA, ECOWAS, PTA, African Continental Free Trade Area, among others. These initiatives require our concerted effort, especially the younger leaders. Unfortunately, our youth continue to see no future on the continent, preferring to sell their inheritance and to seek opportunities elsewhere, sometimes to their demise, as we often see on TV in the Mediterranean. This trend illustrates the epistemicide or the destruction of our knowledge systems we have suffered as a consequence of colonialism and later neoliberalism. Hence, while we live in an age of information overload, we continue to exhibit limited knowledge about the opportunities the continent has to offer its people and their ways. And there are many that are responding to this by attempting to decolonize. And younger people have a pivotal role to play in this journey of decolonization. And as we do so, I would like to offer a few nuggets that will enable us to get there so that the guild leaders we have in the house today become the change agents the continent requires. One of these is to seek knowledge and this involves seeking to learn, 
especially about our context, in a more critical way than from the only Eurocentric lens we have been trained to see things from. Leadership comes from being immersed in your context, understanding the contradictions therein, and seeking to respond to them. The second piece of advice that would enable us to get there is to observe that leadership comes with service. Before you lead, you have to serve with excellence. As it is from that very calling, your calling, that leadership will arise. If we are to just give a few examples, previous Pan-Africanists like Amilka Cabral and the rest I'm going to mention had skills they had, they had professions. Their aim was not just to lead for the sake of leading. For example, Amilka Cabral was an agronomist and from observing the exploitation of the farmers by in, in, in Guinea-Bissau, by the Portuguese, he developed his agenda, formed the PIGC, and led that country to independence. Frank Fanon was a psychiatrist who got inspired by the oppression of Algerian patients. Julius Nyerere was a teacher. Kwame Nkrumah was a sociologist and a theologian. Samora Marshall was a nurse. Eduardo Modlen was an anthropologist. Our own president was a great soldier, or is a great soldier, and from those experiences, the leaders were able to form their missions on how to transform and make a change to the context in which they found themselves. The third thing, the third nugget we could go with is that we should seek to be responsible citizens, nationally, regionally, and continental. And as you sit here, you should ask yourself, are you a responsible national citizen? Are you a responsible East African citizen? And are you a responsible continental citizen? And as I conclude, allow me to note that this summit theme is spot on. Just for a rem as our own reference or as a reminder, the summit theme is legacy and leadership the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning. We believe that through the summit and the exchange of ideas from the different generations of guild presidents from 1962 to date, and the discussions that will ensue, we are going to have a cross-pollination of ideas which will improve our leadership journey today and in the future. We are certain that this will make the guild leadership in Uganda a bedrock of ideas. And the guild presidents as a whole, and by this I mean current and previous, great agents of change. I wish you all successful deliberations for God and my country. Let's appreciate Professor once again. We're very humble that before us we have different leaders, directors, commissioners from the different government agencies, those from the diplomatic corps, you so much welcome. We have already started and uh, to take the conversation out of this room, the hashtag is Guild Leaders Summit 2024. Guild Leaders Summit 2024. Kindly tweet and let the world know what is going on. At this juncture, allow me to welcome Okay, we are going to listen to more pronounced speakers, but where we are, we are at Makerere University. Allow me at this juncture to welcome Honorable Nsamba Rubega, the Guild President of Makerere, to come and speak to us. Let's welcome him. Let's welcome Mr. Nsamba to come and speak to us. Clap for him until he gets here. This man is in power here. 
and he's in charge. He had a very strong campaign from the media perspective. It was such a great wave. And he will be followed by the WOMSA president, who will equally come and speak shortly after him. You're welcome. The former president of Tanzania, His Excellency Jakaya Amrisho Chikwete, in his absence, I recognize the vice president of uh, Uganda, Her Excellency Jessica Lupo, in her absence, Makerere's delegate president, Honorable Ladit Nobat Mao. In his absence, I recognize Makerere's Independence Guild President, Honorable Matthew Ruchikili. I recognize the EC Chairperson of Uganda, Justice Simon Biawakama, and other various dignitaries for purposes of time saving, the administrators around, the different current and former guild leaders from all knocks of Uganda, East Africa, and Africa, gallant Makererians, a very good morning. My name is Lubega Vincent Insamba, the 90th guild president of Makerere University. It is my extreme honor and privilege that this very monumental and exclusive summit is happening as I'm the guild president at this hill. As the head of the student's body, allow me lay hold of this singular latitude to welcome you all at Makerere University. <laughs> Legacy and leadership being the core and fulcrum of this great summit. As Makerere University, we every day take a strive to create that particular legacy in building and producing great leaders. Like you will all recall that the founding father of the great Republic of Tanzania built his leadership footings from this great hill of endless possibilities. Kenya's third president, Mwai Chibaki, was also here, and other big and bigger personalities in this country, continent, and the world at large have passed through Makerere. So it is such powerful legacies that act as a propelling force for us as a generation to continue pursuing, doing good, not only as zealous Pan-Africanists, but also as statesmen. Thank you so much. You're welcome to Makerere University. Feel at home, and I wish you the very best of this great day that the Lord has chosen. God bless you. We build for the future. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Nsamba. Let me welcome Honorable Okot Francis, the WOMSA president, to equally come and speak to us. Let's welcome him. This guy unites all students. President of the Republic of Uganda, His Excellency Yoweri Museveni Kaguta, in his absentia, the former President of uh, the People's Republic of uh, Tanzania, or the United Republic of Tanzania, His Excellency Dr. 
Jakaya Kikwete, the Vice President of Uganda, Her Excellency Jessica Lupo, the Ministers, the Chairperson of Electoral Commission of Uganda, uh, different leaders for the past guild leadership in different universities in the country, and the current leadership and those to come in future. Good morning. My name is Okot Francis. I am the 34th president of the students of Uganda, leading the Uganda National Students Association. And I served as the 22nd guild president of Gulu University. I come from Gulu, so allow me to say Kopango. Uh, with me today, I've come along with uh, a team from Gulu, and uh, it's an honor to always visit sister universities, not just to enjoy the ambience of another university, but to exchange knowledge and ideas, and to learn at the feet of great elders of the land. I have the president-elect that is His Excellency Oketayot Aaron of Gulu University, who is here with us. I have um, ministers from Gulu, and I have a colleague who is a member of the Guild President's Leadership Academy, Her Excellency, the Vice President Emeritus, Amanya Belinda, who is serving as uh, the Speaker of the East African Youth Parliament. She is a law student at Gulu University. I thank so much Makere University for the host and the leadership of the Guild President Leadership Academy, the organizers, the partners, for putting together this event. From the theme as clearly spelled, uh, legacy in leadership, but the most founding part is the cross generational discussion. I know we are here to borrow the experience of the past and punch it to what we have in the current as we look to create a future that we shall all appreciate. Now, as a leader of the students of this country, I'd like to implore all guild presidents and leaders of the different guilds in the different universities here today that we are tasked with a great mandate not to put forward our statuses, but to put forward the service that we've been given into as responsibility. Today, as we're speaking the language of leadership and legacy and cross-generational discussions, we are well aware of the foundations that has been laid by our forefathers on the regional integration and pan-Africanism. I am a pan-Africanist, and therefore I will not leave this stage without speaking about that. As leaders of today, we are supposed to contribute in the integration. We are supposed to contribute in bringing forward key research questions that will make us to derive answers, that will answer the question that we're asking. And therefore, I would call on all the guild leaders to be part and partial of the process of creating the Africa we want, of creating the East Africa we want, of creating the Uganda we want. If you are appreciating the beauty of Uganda, you cannot only just appreciate the beauty of Uganda that you've been watching on NBS, that you've been reading on newspapers, but the travel to Kampala and to other places will make you to appreciate and love Uganda the more. Now we are in school, we interact with different people from different corners of this world, but allow me to say that your meeting is not in vain. Let your leadership create an impact in them, and let your leadership be memorial, so that tomorrow when you meet, you have a point of discussion. Today, as we are here, I am just humble to be listening from the great speakers and panelists of young people that have proven to stand the test of leadership in this generation. As UNSA, we are here with some executives that we will 
stand to represent the students of this nation from post-primary to university levels. And the aspirations we are going to get from here, in one way or the other, shall be passed down to the people that are not here. Conclusively, I challenge the young people today here to walk away with something that they will say I appreciated from the convention or the summit. Why am I saying so? When I was elected as a guild president, I was very happy and excited to be in office. But soon I realized someone else was coming to replace me and I had to stand and back him up to take up the office of leadership. This therefore means being a young person is just a journey that we are going to transverse and pass through it. But the question that will remain is, what have you done in your youthful days? Thank you. God bless you. I would like to challenge you, if you're youthful, if you're below 50 years, turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, what have you done with your youthful days? Below 50. Below 50, please. Below 50. Below 50, what have you done in your youthful days? So I've seen Honorable Mbide, someone asking you, <laughs> and I still you're still youthful as well. Friends, as we are convening here, I want us to appreciate all the universities that took the time and came today. Let's give them a round of applause. I know we have quite many. I won't mention one by one, but we are very gratified that you're very here. Those who are coming from East Africa, Gulu University, Mbadada University, we have UCU. You're quite very many, but you're all so much welcome. <laughs> Round of applause for Makerere. <laughs> You know, when you're the host, you can get away with quite a lot of things. <laughs> and as a moderator, I cannot actually impede on that. We have been joined by His Excellency. You're so much welcome, sir, from the European Union. And we still have more delegates that are going to join us. But please note, whoever is going to be a part of the very first panel, that you get ready and you get closer, it will be Honorable Anna Adeke, the Guild President, Makerele University 2013 to 2014. And we shall have Honorable Priska Nanjiro. We shall have Mr. Christopher Okidi will be speaking on this. And we will have Honorable Fred Mbide Mukasa, the Guild President 2001 to 2002. So I want to request that you get ready for the first panel. But before we have that, Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking about cross-generational learning and a leadership conversation that traverses from one generation to another. This is crucial when we hear from those who work under quite intense pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, together with me, join me as I welcome the most calmest man under pressure to come and give us a keynote address, Justice Simon Biabakama. <laughs> Let's welcome him, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Your Excellency, Jakaya Murisho Kikwete, the former president 
of the United Republic of Tanzania, Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Uganda, the Right Honorable Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda, Prime Minister Emeritus of Uganda, Your Excellencies, the Ambassadors and Heads of Missions present, Honorable Members of Parliament, and all of you distinguished former and current Guild Presidents and student leaders, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I thank you for inviting me and the Electoral Commission to be part of this very important dialogue of current and former Guild leaders. The people in this room and beyond are a critical constituency of our work as Electoral Commission and indeed for our country, Uganda. Young people, as we all know, constitute a demographic of our country with the people in the age bracket of 18 to 35 years making close to 70% of our population. To be specific, a total number of 7,392,676 youth above 18 years and below 30 were registered for the 2020-21 general elections, which constituted 40.8% 40, of the total number of registered voters, which were 18,103,603. This therefore makes young people key stakeholders in all aspects of Uganda's political, social, and economic spheres. For this reason, my commission considers it critical to sensitize and engage with you with respect to your rights, duties, and responsibilities in promoting a prosperous, stable, and peaceful Uganda through peaceful participation in elections, governance, and public administration. Our association with guild leaders is further seen in our continued readiness to support your institutions that often request for materials for organizing guild council elections. In this way, we have patterned with you in promoting the culture of choosing student leaders through open, transparent, and participatory process. Allow me to briefly tell you about the Electoral Commission, who we are and what we do. The Electoral Commission is established under Article 60 of the 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda and is mandated under Article 61 of the same Constitution to do the following. Ensure that regular free and fair elections and referenda are held. To organize, conduct, and supervise elections and referenda in accordance with the Constitution and the other laws related thereto. Demarcate constituencies. Formulate and implement voter educational programs related to elections, to compile, maintain, revise, and update the voters' register, to hear and determine election complaints arising before and during the polling, and ascertain, publish, and declare in writing under its seal the results of the elections and referenda. The above functions are undertaken in fulfillment of the aspiration and declaration of the sovereignty of the people of Uganda, as enshrined in Article 1, clauses 1 and 4 of the Constitution, which stipulate, I quote, all power belongs to the people who shall exercise their sovereignty in accordance with this Constitution. At clause 4, 
the people shall express their will and consent on who shall govern them and how they should be governed through regular, free and fair elections of their representatives or through referenda, end of quote. The Electoral Commission, therefore, can be likened to a vehicle or a channel or a conduit to which the people's aspirations are carried to their final destination, and that is determining leaders of their choice. Our vision is to be a model institution and center of excellence in election management. Our mission is to efficiently organize, conduct, and supervise regular free and fair elec and transparent elections and referenda to enhance democracy and good governance. As you may know, the Constitution in Article 69 states that anyone of 18 years and above is eligible to vote and also to be registered as a voter. Therefore, everyone in this room is our customer or our client or potential client at the Electoral Commission. Wide and inclusive participation of all stakeholders, including young people, in the electoral process is a key ingredient of democratic elections. As student leaders, you have already demonstrated passion and commitment to leadership and service. You have already been through competitive processes. You are there for agents of positive values and practice that are needed in nurturing democratic conduct among your peers. The objective of the Guild President's Leadership, Leadership Academy, which is to bring which is to bring a new generation of politicians in parliament and political structures, makes you our mutual allies. Indeed, you are critical partners in the work that we do. Young people have many positive attributes that should be harnessed to enhance their participation in the democratic processes in this country. You have energy, you have stamina, you have the vibe, you have skills, and the resilience. However, the trajectory of our electoral processes has at times not seemed to see the above attributes brought to bear positively on the electoral processes by our youth. Participation of young people in voter registration, voting, or as supporters or candidates remains low. We have, often, we have often seen multitudes of youth at rallies, but when it comes to polling day, many are not registered as voters. The only, you, the, only, the only way you can become an active participant starts with you being on the National Voters Register, and then seeking information on how to exercise your right. We therefore need to ask ourselves these questions and look for answers there too. Why do our young people of early eligible voting age not, why do they not show up to get registered as voters? Why do they offer, why do few of them offer themselves as candidates? And even those who get registered on polling day, why don't they turn up, turn up to cast their vote? Why should our young people accept be used in electoral-related violent episodes? Why should our young people accept their vote to be bought at 1,000, 2,000, or 5,000 shillings, which is, the, which is less than one chicken in someone's home? Why do our young people allow themselves to become agents of hate speech on using social media. These questions are of great concern to us, not only the Electoral Commission, but Uganda as a whole. Accordingly, we took cognizance of the above unacceptable state of affairs and deliberately included a well-fledged component of youth engagement in our strategic plan 2022-23 to 2025-26 as well as the roadmap 
for the 2026 general elections. We have a deliberate voter education program targeting youth in schools and tertiary institutions. Our staff across the country have been tasked to do outreach in schools as well as other occupations where young people are found to give them information about the electoral cycle and why they should participate. This is an ongoing process. When you do not participate in elections, then do not complain about the quality of leaders that have been elected. Young people have roles, rights, and responsibilities in the electoral processes. But to be able to undertake this meaningfully, you need to be the following. First and foremost, you must love your country. When you love something, you cherish it, preserve it, protect it, and strive to add value to it. Secondly, you must be well organized. Organization is the beginning of clarifying goals and developing an action plan to fulfill that goal. This association of guild leaders is a good first step, therefore. Thirdly, be disciplined. I repeat, be disciplined. As leaders, you must train your body and mind to focus on the goals you have set for yourself and commit to attend to the tasks you have been assigned with a passion. Be reliable and honest. You must be truthful as you lead, as this will earn you the trust and respect of the people you lead. You must at all material times be law abiding, no matter the circumstances. You should lead by example, by respecting and observing the laws of the land, and always know that many people are looking up to you for guidance. Be patient. This is an important but rarely practiced virtue, and yet it helps you to remain in control and avoid making avoidable mistakes. Many young people have given in to negative impulsive actions of instant gratification because they have not waited a little while with the serious and often irreversible consequences to life and dreams. Be good managers of your time, your money, and all other resources, including your health, the environment, the facilities at your workplace, institutions, and the community among others. This calls for engaging in productive activities. You must learn to be adaptive you have to adapt to the environment and circumstances of the day while focused on achieving your goals. If I may indulge in my small experience, I started working in 1982 as a young state attorney. And by then, we were very few. And uh, my first posting was in Fort Potro. State attorneys were not as many as they are today. In, today, they are in every district of the country. By then, we were in regions. And the then greater western region where I was posted covered the area from Kazinga Channel to Karuma Falls. And we were two state attorneys in Fort Potro handling all the criminal cases in that area. Those of you who know the geography of Uganda, I hope many of you do, can now fathom the size of the area. There was only one department of vehicle in the whole the Department of Public Prosecutions. It was with the DPP, who was then Chief Justice Emeritus Benjamin Otoki at headquarters. All these officers did not have vehicles and was required to perform dual duties. Mind you, we were handling criminal cases. We had remand prisons in Masindi which is still the position, for all the people, the suspects who have been arrested and from Bunyoro sub-region, we are all being remanded in Masindi. We are also remanded home in Katojo, where the suspects from Kabarole, as it then was, now it is a multiple of districts, were being held. 
Now, the files from Masindi would be sent to the state attorney in Fort Potro for handling. And if I was satisfied with the conduct of investigations and were required to move this case further to the High Court, I had to move from Fort Potro to Masindi with the files and then attend to the prisoners in the court in Masindi. No vehicle. Public means were very meager, unlike today. Vehicles were very few, unlike today. So any means that could convey me to Masindi, I had to use that. I remember one outstanding one was when I had to board a lorry carrying 50 files of murder suspects, robbers, rapists, defiers, 50 files at the back of a lorry, all the way from Kagadi, as it then was, with those terrible roads as they were by then, not today, up to Masindi, state attorney carrying 50 files. I became adaptive to the environment. My objective was get to Masindi, go to court with these files, and do my work. And I can assure you, I did my work. Young people, you must learn to be adaptive to the environment if you are to achieve your objectives. <laughs> be informed. When you are informed, you broaden your knowledge on issues around you. And you can form informed opinions and engage in meaningful conversations and profitable actions. Be respectful of each other and the different opinions. Tolerance, tolerance is key in building peaceful and prosperous communities. Unfortunately, the element of tolerance in our political discourse is on the wane. That's most unfortunate. We need as young people to address this. We must tolerate each other's different views. Have some slight respect for the elders. Mind you, even the elders were youth like you. We are once youth. Be active. Allow yourselves to be mentored. Allow yourselves to be mentored. I mean, look at the crop of the elders, present and even those who have passed on. They made positive contributions to this country in their youth. They made positive contributions to this country in their youth. So please, accord them some bit of respect and recognition. Mentor, always be eager and use every opportunity to learn from those who have succeeded in the careers you are pursuing. Desist from acts of violence or refuse to be used to engage in episodes of violence, particularly during electoral processes. We urge you to become agents of peace, unity, and harmony in your institutions, political parties, in your communities, in our country, the only substitute for peace is anarchy. Therefore, if we love our country, we must always strive to ensure that we have peace and stability. It's very easy to generate anarchy and mayhem, but difficult to restore peace. We must always remember that. Be confident. This is important as you aspire to take on leadership responsibilities, which come on with many challenges. Confidence helps you to face uncertainties that are inescapable in leadership careers. Abhor corruption and avoid, avoid voter bribery. I don't know how you do your elections here at Makere, whether the candidates are required to, to do the needful. One of, the, some of the, one of the candidates in the national elections told me, Chairman, you go to a, a rally, you're addressing people, then they start signaling, we are thirsty. Can you do something? What do you do? I think we need to discuss this. Commercialization of our electoral processes is unacceptable. What do you do? Everybody looks at the electoral commission. You are in charge, you are in charge. Granted. However, an election involves so many stakeholders. You have the candidates. They are not from the electoral commission. 
You have the supporters. They are not from the electoral commission. You have political parties, civil society organizations. Each one of these has a critical role to play in the quest for a free and fair election. If you perpetuate violence, then it is disingenuous to blame the electoral commission for a, a, a violent election. If you engage in voter bribery, then you are doing a disservice to the quest for a free and fair election. So please, let us join hands. If the people of Uganda want a free and fair credible election, each one of us must recognize the role we are required to play and play it according to the books, according to the law. I can assure you it's very possible to have a peaceful, credible election in this country. Devoid of violence, devoid of anything that taints a free and fair election. As the Electoral Commission, we look forward to continuous engagement with you as we implement the roadmap towards the 2026 general elections. By the way, it is around the corner. It's less than two years now. In fact, by next year, I think by April, May, we are having the first phase of what we call the special interest group elections involving you, the youth. That's the first phase. Less, so less than two years, we are there. Ask yourself, what am I required to do in this election, electoral process? What can I do to advance the cause of social economic transformation, peace and stability in the country? That is the responsibility, the burden upon each one of us. Finally, I know that over the years, guild councils in our institutions of learning have produced many persons, distinguished professionals who are serving in Uganda and beyond in important and influential positions. They are shining examples before us today. It is my prayer that their success inspires you to aim high and reach your fullest potential. Once again, as electoral commission, I reiterate our commitment to work with every, every individual in this country who feels you have a stake. Our doors are open. My office is open as chairman. Other than ostracizing me, demonizing me on social media, why don't you come and engage? Say, Chairman, I don't like this and that. Come and engage. Come and engage. Because elections are not for the Alakama. They are for the people of Uganda. I'm a mere servant. I have said the electoral commission is a mere vehicle that is, conveys the aspirations of the people to elect leaders of their own choice. So at um, your behest and call, we need this country to remain stable, peaceful, prosperous. Mind you, many people from other countries have run to this country because in their countries, they have one fundamental aspect that is missing, peace and stability. It is in this country. You Ugandans, you have a responsibility, a duty to preserve that peace which other people cannot get in their countries. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to me, for God and my country. Another round of applause for the great speech that has been read here. Can we have it louder? Having young people in the room, we expect to have energy. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking each and every speaker that has shared with us something today. And I believe that as young people, we're already fast tracking the knowledge we came to get from today and you're already, you know, making notes and looking forward to what we can do 
for this country. As the precurrent speaker said, what is our contribution to Uganda? I hope we are answering and thinking about the possible answers to that question. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Amanya Belinda. I am the speaker of the East African Youth Parliament. And uh, I am humbled and pleased to say that in front of the ambassador of the European Union delegation, that I also serve as the vice chairperson of the European Union Youth Sounding Board. I saw other Youth Sounding Board members of the European Union in Uganda. Hello to you all. And I hope we carry the views that we have here and share them with the rest of the team. Next on agenda is going to be a panel discussion. Well balanced, well formulated with great ladies and gentlemen with various backgrounds of inspiration and enthusiasm that I think we shall all learn and benefit from. But before we jump to the panel, allow me to recognize the universities that are present so that whoever is following online should be confident that their university is represented. So when I mention your university, kindly wave to us. Is, it that, is that okay? Can we see Kawale University? Thank you very much. Gulu University. Isbat University. Mbara University. Makerere University. commend the Makere University energy. However, I hope in the Avalala Z we are not the Avalala being talked about. <laughs> All right, can we see uh, Uganda Christian University? Victoria University? Yes. Uganda Matters University? University of Kisubi? Mountain of the Moon University, IU, IU University. For the universities that I've not mentioned, I request to be updated, and as we proceed, we shall keep on recognizing the various universities that are present and the various dignitaries that are present today. So straight up, jumping to the panel we are having today, allow me invite uh, the following people that will be on the panel and welcome the moderator to allow me start by welcoming the moderator of the first part for the first panel who is none other than miss isabella akiteng give it up for her a round of applause she is one of the great inspirational ladies that i follow on uh, social media and it is an honor to see her here today on the panel, ladies and gentlemen, we shall be having Honorable Anna Adeke. A round of applause for her. She was Guild President, Makere University, 2013 to 2014. We shall have Honorable Priska Amongin Nanjiro. She was the President of UCU, 2016 to 2017. We shall have Honorable Christopher Okidi. He was the Guild President of Gulu University, the university which I come from, from 2008 to 2009. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we shall be having, should we, should we call him the top linguist? You know, they talk about English dialect and language in Uganda. The only name we know, ladies and gentlemen, is Honorable Fred Mbide Mukasa. You're welcome. Thank you.
Good morning to you all. Good morning. Thank you very much for responding, especially because if you hadn't responded, then we would have begun to ask Damian if he really fed you in the morning. So good morning to you all once again. And my name is Isabella Akiteng. I will be moderating today's panel. I choose to stand for one reason and let me come back. I choose to stand for one reason, and that is, um, despite the fact that we have a great grand panel of historicals, I would like to give my seat uh, to a young woman who believes that in the next guild election, you will be guild president. So if that is you, please hurry up, because we only have 45 minutes and uh, you only have 20 seconds to come, otherwise we will declare the seat vacant. So 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, you just come, 14, 13, 12, 10, we are still counting, nine, <laughs> eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, let's give her a hand of applause. Mm. And I hope that if she belongs to your university, you will remember that she declared her intentions early enough and join her campaign team. You may take your seat. Today's panel, and we will give her the opportunity to introduce herself once she takes a breath, given that she did not anticipate being on this panel. But today's panel is around exploring the influence of political parties um, in student guild elections and looking at what our present says about the future in Uganda. It is important for us uh, to know that this panel has been made possible by the Civ Legacy Foundation, which is a non-profit expression of Civ Source Africa that is a philanthropy advisory firm here in Uganda. Civ Legacy Foundation is a philanthropy support and advisory partner, passionate about curating and facilitating spaces for conversations on, on contextual issues on leadership, governance, transitions management, and succession planning across sectors. So to Civ Source, thank you very much for making this panel possible. At this point, I am going to invite our latest entrant to please tell us your name and what university you're coming from so that we are sure that you're even legible. And we disqualify you quickly just in case you're not. So, oh, there's a microphone right next to you that you can use. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All protocol observed. My name is Sheila Princess Obia, uh, the first female guild president for Uganda Matters University. Thank you. Oh, but you're not standing. So I'm not sure whether to disqualify you in my 45 minutes, but let's proceed. Uh, <laughs> looking at political parties and looking at student guild elections, um, this panel is supposed to look at the extent of political party influence in universities, but also look at the impact of political party involvement on student politics and governance in the country. We are also on this panel supposed to look at envisioning the future of student governance in Uganda in light of the current trends in political uh, party involvement. And so without wasting time, I will go straight um, I'll start with uh, Honorable Fred Mbide Mokasa because of the number of hand claps you received. So reflecting on your time <laughs> as a guild leader, how significant was the influence of political parties in your election during your tenure? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I will not take the invitation for me to come here for granted. I definitely would thank you, the organizers of this, that you invited me. I equal associate myself with the protocol as has been adumbrated by all the precurrent speakers. Mm. <laughs> and and uh, 
for, for purposes of saving time, you, you have, uh, your invitation to me here has saved me the nostalgia of, of always wanting to be here. <laughs> what exactly was the effect of political parties? Let me also thank my teacher. You, you have been accusing me of being grandiloquent and magniloquent. One of my teachers is here. Uh, I'm beginning uh, to wonder if it was a good idea for you to start, but please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and uh, my Prime Minister, thank you. Uh, first of all, I can able to tell you, I stood here in 2001, 2002, when political parties were actually by law in abeyance. They were, not, they were stopped from, 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 and in fact, I was disqualified for much of the bigger time of the campaign because I was a candidate for the Democratic Party. Uganda Young Democrats. I was disqualified. We petitioned. We argued the case. And during the campaign is when now the disqualification, of course, was extinguished. That's when I returned to the fold, behaving like an elephant that jumped into a pond, thereby displacing all the waters that it found there and ultimately won. So political parties generally are the fonts that already go. They are the beginning of the ideological orientation of a candidate for any election. Be because if you now facilitate the independence of minds in terms of elections, you are only establishing uh, the, the kind of leaderships that are actually so dictatorial. For me, an independent political leader is to the extent of, of beginning of his origin of politics, a dictator. Why can't you, because belonging to a political party, is first of all to subject your own opinions and options to the common good, to the extent that then you can even lose out on the opinion you, because it is known philosophically and scientifically that everybody believes he's right and that the other one is wrong. Otherwise, why would you keep an opinion you already believe is wrong? So the meaning is that you subject the kind of opinion to other opinions to the extent that then the majority wins. The extent of the effect of political parties to the politics of young people in universities is extremely important. Today, it is, I think, diminished because the, the honchos and the sachems of the university now have, in my opinion, diminished the applicability of political party practices here. And, and this is something I need to report to you because we enjoyed it and the young people are not enjoying it. You invited me, so my opinion is we'll definitely go to the public and that is something that we need to Thank actually you. curtail. Thank you very much, Honorable mm. Mbidi. I had to come in very quickly because you had jumped to another question altogether, which we will, which will come back. But thank you very much, much for sharing um, mm. and reflecting on the significance of your political party on your election. At this point, I will bring in Priska, because I know Priska was guild president at the Uganda Christian University. And uh, the, at, at a certain point, I'm not sure if that point still exists, you couldn't stand for presidency under a political party. And I will send the same question over to you. Um, was there any significance or influence on your election? Was there a political party that you allied with or are you fully independent? Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, all protocol observed. And uh, I must say it's an honor this morning to be here, to be on this panel and to share my thoughts with everyone in this room. I want to thank the organizers of this summit in a very special way for organizing this for us. It's very, very timely. I shared with Demin and told him, I think there was a gap in the affairs of our country, the governance of our country. There was a gap in participation of former student leaders as, at, on, all, on all levels, all that from the presidents, the speakers, the entire cabinet, let's say, as, as, a, as, a, as a guild government always is. And I think this is very timely for us that we shall be able to share our thoughts and put our minds together. So having come from UCU, those of us who are aware, uh, UCU does not have party politics. That is uh, what the university charter says. That is what it is by law. So we don't have partisan politics. So you run as an independent. Of course, in most instances, some candidates lean. But if you're discovered as, as someone who's leaning on a political party, it's also a crime. So you really have to be independent. So I didn't have that experience in my campaign. I remember we were 12 candidates, and after vetting, we eventually came down to two. And uh, it was very, very tough. It was the first time we had a female president, first time in 20 years of the university. That was in 2016, November. 
uh, for the last 19 years, we had had a uh, gentleman. We had a lady, but she came after Ariran. That is the Honorable uh, Blessed, Her Excellency Blessed Murunji. But she came after Ariran. So we had never had a direct election where a girl comes through. So it was timely. I believe it was timely. And I said, you know what? Uh, it's time to put my best foot forward. I ran that, that, that race. It was tough, but I won it. I want to thank God because we won overwhelmingly. We had very big numbers, and I knew I wasn't running that race just for me, but to set a precedent for the rest of the girls who come after me. And in the last five years, we've had two other girls win the guild election at UCU Mukono. Yes. So we don't have party politics from there. So the, the experience that I have with political parties is after I left the university. That's when I got the experience. I joined the NRM at district level, and I was able to run through the through those different stages from the village to the parish to the sub-county to the district level. And it was amazing. I was like, okay, this is beautiful. And uh, there is a way the political party makes an election easier for a candidate as opposed to when you're independent. Yes, that's my experience. And uh, over to you, Isabella. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Priska. And the reason we are also rushing through this panel is because it's only 45 minutes and we'll only take five questions from the audience. So when we open up for questions, make sure that you're very alert. At this point, we'll move on to Honorable Anna Adeke. And Honorable Anna, uh, I'm going to ask you a two-in-one question. The first one is, given the experience that Priska has just shared, does it make sense, does it make sense to have political parties in universities? Or is there a bliss, you know, because uh, from her explanations, it sounds like UCU elections are very blissful because there's no political party involvement. But the second question to you is, uh, what are some of the most challenging moments you faced while balancing the interests of your, of your student constituents and the expectations and pressures of your political parties? And I make this assumption based on how active you are, you are within FDC, even during the time that you are a student leader here at Makere. Over to you, Honorable Anna. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's such a privilege to be here in the midst of such young, youthful, vibrant energy. So, uh, Isabella, you ask if it makes sense to have political parties, and yes, my straight answer is yes, it does make sense to have political parties at the universities, in the universities. Um, I would make a strong case for political parties to continue to be present because the freedom of association and expression is a fundamental freedom which our constitution recognizes. And university students as young adults are very conscious, politically conscious of the decisions that they make. So enabling them to identify with political parties that wh whose values they consider important to them is very critical. But also for a university as a center of excellence and research enabling innovation, one of the easiest ways to encourage innovation and creativity is to allow free expression. Free expression among the academia, free expression among the student body. So if they freely express, then they can also be encouraged to be creative. It extends even to their creativity in the academia. It's so important for students to be f allowed to freely interact with their political parties because it's, it's such a transition stage for them. In no time, they are going to be out in the world. They want to easily transition into these political parties. We've seen several youth leaders who are involved in uh, guild politics easily transition into national politics. And one of the things that makes it simple for them is because they've already associated themselves with political parties, they've become very conversant to the working of political parties. They know what they are going, the challenges they are going to meet. They know how to navigate uh, their way around them. 
So it's so, so important. And I, I would make the strongest case for political parties to continue to be present in universities. I do not think that political parties are the reason as to why there's been violence that has characterized these different elections. The violent nature of our politics is actually something that comes from above. It's how we have managed our politics as a nation. It has been, it, we, we, we have so, so much force, so much brutality, so much militarization in our politics as a nation. That is why we find even the simplest LC1 election will be a violent one. So I really, I would not fault, I wouldn't fall, uh, look at political parties as the reason. So it's, it's really important, even for the university, to continue to grow in its rankings in research, as I have already stated, if people are allowed to freely express themselves. That is when the university will thrive as a center of research, excellence, innovation. Okay. You asked me a two-in-one question. Uh, and the second part to it was the challenges that I faced, having to balance uh, political party and students' interests. First of all, as young adults, it's so important that you allow yourselves to go through this process. Allow yourselves to be challenged, because that's what life is. That's really what life is. If we continue to um, grow students who, who do not understand the challenges of what it means to be in a political organization, then we are just blinding them. And it's only for a short while, because the truth is that that's how the world is. So I did have challenges, um, uh, challenges be, uh, managing the two uh, because of the different interests. Uh, students and my political party, of course, my political party, as is with every political party, is interested in numbers, mobilization. So I had to deliver also for my party to mobilize students. But student politics is a bit different. Uh, yeah, students are really interested in the causes that bring them together. At my time, it was tuition, 60%. I think Makere students overcame it. Uh, the rampant strikes, Moasa. So the interests are different, and you have to balance them. Um, also, the transitioning was not so easy, um, moving from student politics to national politics, because you move from you know, a body politic like this one, which you can discuss with like this, to dealing with um, a population that has not necessarily acquired an education up until this level. So how you deal with both is different, yeah. So that's basically it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Anna. And at this point, we will bring in the other DP member. It seems DP is overly subscribed on this panel, but uh, bringing, in, um, bringing in Christopher Okidi, who was Guild President, Gulu University, 2008 to 2009. Um, is it possible for you to share with us any specific instances where your political party involvement could have impacted your election either positively or negatively, but also post the election, how your political party involvement could have affected how you governed as guild president of Gulu, especially because you are also very active in the Uganda Young Democrats. Uh, thank you. Not only active, I was president of the Uganda Young Democrats, actually the immediate past president, yeah and national youth leader of the Democratic Party, immediate past year. So I think I can speak about all universities because as president of UID, one of my terms of references were to strengthen the Youth League of the Democratic Party. And strengthening the Youth League of the Democratic Party means uh, outreach in various institutions of higher learning. And the best price you can ever get out of uh, a higher institution of learning is to get a guild president. And I am so excited that even when I'm in this particular hall, I can see many guild presidents who have actually moved through my hands. Now, to the question, I think uh, nowadays I wonder what kind of students we have in universities. 
because if you were to if you were to take if you were to journey through students' movements, uh, the senior president of NUSU, <laughs> yeah, uh, the the prime minister, the former prime minister is here, and other guild presidents are here. They know how their role in not only engaging unfair policies within the university is something we all talk about today. They did not only go against the institutions, but they also fought for democracy in the country during Idi Amin. We read all these stories in books that were written. They fought for democracy. Uh, I have no kind words for the NRM, but sometimes I make concession and say a group of young people formed what was called FRONASA and then engaged. And by the way, FRONASA was a very, was an equal partner with Kekosi Malum in liberating Uganda in 1979. So, and those were students. Uh, you've heard about stories of uh, students such as uh, General Mugisha Muntu finishing his last exam in political science at Makerere and joining his comrade in the bush. What was the objective? To fight for democracy. Now, I want to put this thing in, in, a, in a conceptual context. Political parties conceptually comes from what we call liberal pluralism. And, and that is democracy. Democracy is about pluralism. In fact, Alexis uh, de Tocqueville, uh, a French-American political theorist, said democracy thrives through citizen associations, through citizen groups. The Democratic Party is a citizen association that belongs in con liberal, conservative political ideals. The National Unity Platform is a political party that fights uh, for the common man. Am I right on that? Or the hoi polloi, if we are to use Makerere political uh, lingua franca, <laughs> you see? Uh, we have the UPC, which is a social democratic political organization. Now, the problem is that in Uganda, we don't understand what democracy is and liberal pluralism is. And that is why an institution like Makerere can come up with a very obnoxious policy saying we need to stop the operations of political parties. No. Political liberal pluralism is a function of modernity. Modern political engagement requires that you become part of political associations. Now, if you have a country, because uh, colleagues here have told you the challenges. They have told you the challenges we face. Political parties face, even when they're engaging on government, with, with government and governance. And all these fights are completely unnecessary. If you understand that politics, political differences, political organizations are just representation of views. It shouldn't go into fist fights, hatred, and nobody should ban this. And for me, I think that if we can understand that particular context, modernity, that we want to modernize our politics as a country, we have to embrace liberal pluralism. If we, these are very basic things, so the mere fact that even our democracy is failing, we are banning political parties. We are actually saying we are banning democracy. That is what we are saying, that we are banning democracy. Because democracy is anchored based on citizen association. I think, uh, let me drop the mic on that, yeah. All right, thank you very much. And I noticed that our dignitaries all left which we can. And we will move on to Sheila Obia uh, from the Uganda Matters University in Kozi. Are there instances where your involvement with your political party impacted you positively or negatively and how it could have impacted your governance long term? And once you're done, I would like Honorable Bombide to please do a rejoinder around what um, Christopher talked about. So Christopher talks about modernization, but he also talks about 
the curtailing of citizen grouping and how that is affecting um, um, uh, leadership at university level. And I would like you to do an analysis of the time that you were a guild president, because I think you were a guild president longest backwards, if we were to look at anyone on the panel. So draw a relationship between then and now. So you can think about that while we bring on Sheila. So over to you, Sheila. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, during the time I served as the first female guild president, 2016, 2017, at the time, there were no political parties. I don't know if there are political parties involved in Uganda Matters University um, Guild poli politics, because um, the only political party, perhaps I would say, is in those Christian universities. First of all, it's a Catholic institution, and so political parties are not so much involved. I never heard of any at that time. And also, it's only religious political party, I would say. Because for one, to contest as the guild president, you must be a Catholic. So for me, that I think it's safe to say that it was only a um, religious political party. Because other than being a Catholic, you wouldn't be able to you know, be allowed to, to contest for such a uh, critical role. So there were no political parties. Whereas um, just from the question you asked Honorable Anna Deke, about political parties being involved in, um, or being, uh, not being ruled out in universities, uh, I somehow bet to disagree because I believe uh, political parties in, in universities, in schools, in tertiary institutions, they limit students from exploring um, a, a lot of things. You are limited to that, uh, you subscribe to that particular political party, and so your ideas, so many other things, are limited to what that party subscribes to. And so you cannot explore other opportunities. But when you're given, uh, when, when it's a free uh, kind of elections, like where we, we, we involved ourselves in, even the sister university, uh, UCU, you are able to traverse and get to understand a lot of things from, dynamic, uh, from different dynamics. But when you're limited to party activities and then a lot of things, cannot, you cannot explore a lot of things. But then it gives you um, a go ahead when you're now out uh, in the world, you can now choose which party to subscribe to. But I would believe that in universities we could be free Anyone can practice, except, of course, the, the religious one I talked about, so that you are able to traverse and get to understand a lot of things. So when you're out in the world, you'll be able to choose the party that you'd wish to subscribe to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And the issue of religious political parties has now come up twice. Uh, Priska may not have given it a name, but she... But, but, but it was there, it was alluded to. And then when you, look, when you look at the panel as well, and you look at the guild president of IUIU who will be on another panel, I, I think there will be an issue of religious political parties. And so as Honorable Mukasambide comes on board, I would like to already uh, preempt and ask Anna to think about, uh, to just do a rejoinder around the notion around, around the presence, like make a case for political parties in, 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 in what, in institutions of higher learning, because um, Sheila just said that we had no chaos because we did not have political parties, so we, we, could, we were able to focus. So one might argue focus and peace, and yet another might argue, like Christopher said, the realities of society, that even if you decide to avoid this thing, it's your reality. So I would like you to come and give us a rejoinder on that. But over to you, please. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it is extremely important for everybody to notice that we are under a multi-party political dispensation. Uh, much as university trains its own people for purposes of the labor market, now, the political labor market in Uganda is that of multi-party political dispensation. Now, for you to ban parties here and at the same time pretend that you're actually training your people to become young leaders, to me, is, is to tell me that you have got a very great sense of humor. <laughs> it, it is extremely pretentious and, and uh, ladida to... to, to <laughs> 
I would like everybody to notice that one of the bromides that lingers at the subconscious level of every young person is that of being told that you are leaders of tomorrow. Now, it is not enough for you to be just young that guarantees you leadership tomorrow. It is not important be because being young is merely is, is, is a short period of time. It is, in, in proper English, it is majorly ephemeral and fugacious. It, it, is, it is short. But it matters a lot who is telling you. If that person telling you that your leaders of tomorrow is adult and not a leader, then that does not guarantee that you will be a leader tomorrow. So it is extremely important. And these are things that we need to look at, particularly Makere University, because I am more versed with this university than, than many other universities. This has always been the key to, to much of the future in terms of everything. In terms of everything, in, in proper English, the faucet or ego of everything. Whoever passes here definitely is destined for higher altitudes. But what is now the resultant effect of the bands that you are enjoying here? We have now started enjoying a world where idiots are leaders. And, and I am telling you, today now, what everybody needs to do is to develop an idiot detection system <laughs> if you are to flourish and develop politically. Because I can tell you that, that idiots are sometimes, of course, even brighter. They can dazzle you with wrong opinions and, and frameworks. They can even get promoted before you on a job. They can even be elected president. It almost happened. So I can tell you, and, and this is a, and this is a result of universities failing to do what they are supposed to do, and instead engage in what they are not supposed to do. I can tell you safely. <laughs> the views so, of Honorable Mukasambi, so, there he is alone. <laughs> So I can tell you that, that it is extremely important to leave political parties to flourish here if we are going to have a Uganda that is safer for us and even for yet for those yet unborn. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And we will be bringing on, on Anna to submit. But while Anna submits, I would like to call upon the rest of the panelists to begin to think about uh, strategies and approaches by both uh, universities and political parties that could have either preserved the autonomy or independence of student governance from external forces of particular political parties, the ruling governance system, or even the university leadership and their personal opinions on, on, on how student leadership needs to look like. Over to you, Honorable Anna. Thank you, Bella. So our sisters uh, present um, scenarios where each of the universities um, that they have you know, studied in have, uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, and most notably, are private institutions of higher learning. And private institutions have really devised their own modalities. So the only way that I can reconcile theirs and Macquarie or other universities is that it's a public versus private university situation. You cannot, I mean, Article 29 is very clear. I, our, we have a, you know, a freedom of expression, the freedom of religion. We are a secular nation that allows any religion to thrive. So in a public institution of higher learning, it's almost close to impossible to, to limit um, some, some things, actually to limit anything to religion. However, in a private university, it's, it, it's, it's being done. But recently, there's been, some, there's been developing jurisprudence that is really showing that even private institutions of higher learning can have their decisions vetoed by courts. The you know, judicial review decisions have been made, and that body of law is also growing to check how p private universities are regulating their students, are disciplining their students. So I would largely make a case for all universities 
to not to be restrictive in their nature um, in allowing students to freely express, freely associate themselves with whoever they want to associate with. Because really, as a country, we are a secular nation. Yeah, but um, for the private universities, I think it's almost close to impossible for them to uh, delete some of those things that are really the bedrock of how they are formed and founded. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And um, we're going to go to the next question, but I'm going to give uh, Christopher Okidi and Honorable Mukasambide the privilege of going first. Why? Because when we're looking at strategies and approaches to independence of student governance, but also the influence of political parties, we have already ascertained at this point that Priska and Sheila had a religious political party situation. So it would be unfair to subject them to this question. So we will have the two gentlemen go first, and then we will have a rejoinder from the ladies looking at any proposals that you would maybe put on the table on how um, students would have been better able to associate with their political parties, given that they were over the age of 18, but also how peace could have maybe reigned uh, within your universities. So over to you, Christopher. Okay, I hope I, I get the question right uh, on strategies. Uh, for me, one thing I think is, uh, I happen to be a consultant. I, besides uh, these other engagements, I consult on youth political participation. And I happen to have consulted for an entity that met the chairman of the Electoral Commission uh, last year. It was a group of young people called the Interparty Youth Platform. We, we really discussed some of these issues. I hope they reached the table of the chairman of the Electoral Commission. Uh, they we have actually, now reached. Yeah, we actually, said, reached <laughs> we actually said that Electoral Commission should understand that political parties deposit their constitutions with them. And in those constitutions deposited, even if there is an amendment, it must be gazetted and deposited with the Electoral Commission. And some of these constitutions have youth leagues. Some of these constitutions have students union. And by the fact that a, reg a regulator like the Electoral Commission is sleeping, when student spaces like, uh, like guild is being closed, this is, remember, uh, it is political democratic development we should move side by side with the development of political parties. I hope all of you will agree with me that our political, our political parties are in a very sorry state, which is also a failure of liberal pluralism because ask members of political parties, do they even know the ideologies of their various political parties? I was in the Democratic Party. I'm sure half of the population doesn't even know what DP stands for. Maybe only a few of us who used to go abroad to represent the party <laughs> understood it, you see? So uh, the functionality of these institutions must be both internal and external in terms of environment. Internally, they must, uh, political parties must first of all uh, offer sufficient training. Uh, when, when we had, uh, I see Julius Katerega somewhere, I saw him. Yes, when we were fronting Julius for Gil President Makerere, uh, Julius personally, I had known him for three years. When I was doing my bar course at the Law Development Center, he would come and I'd give him assignment and say, I'm very busy with LDC, I don't want to fail. Go and organize Makerere students under a football platform, take them to play football and give me a report. And he will do it. That is part of mentorship. So by the time we were fronting him for Gill president, we knew he understood, we knew first of all, his capacity was built, he was going to make good speeches, he was going to put the Democratic Party in good light, and he has the discernment to know at what point excitement border crosses over to chaos. Because what political institutions are dealing with is chaotic electoral processes, which is not only in universities, but in the country. We saw in 2021 20, elections, 
uh, the entire Kampala. Me, I was contesting in Gulu for parliament, but I would see on news Kampala was under siege. Uh, some people from Western Uganda had already packed their luggage and exiting the city. So chaotic electoral processes are a result of lack of mentorship. You see? I participated in, as Gil president. I, I defeated an NRM candidate who was first of all a major in the army and a trainer. He trains cadres at uh, Changkwanzi. But he's the person I defeated because I was prepared for it. I didn't have to be chaotic. All what NRM did is they brought in a lot of money and then I would tell people, there's a story nobody Mao likes telling about a man who went to heaven. That story Mao actually adopted it from my campaign. <laughs> I am not saying, I am not saying, I am not saying that I, it is an original thought of mine. I also stole it from the leadership magazine, uh, the Catholic leadership magazine where there was a reverend father called Carlos Rodriguez who used to write for the leadership magazine. So I also stole it and converted it into political communication. Why? Because I wanted to send a message and say, one time there was democracy in heaven and people were to choose between heaven and hell, which one is democratically, which one they would prefer. They went to hell and saw honey, people dancing in Domboloya solo, people were so excited. And then when they went, rather that was hell. Then when they went to heaven, the phone things were different. So, some of these, uh, it is about preparation. Your candidate will not mobilize people to go and attack another candidate because they are going to be overpowered over money. You just create. All these guild elections, UID has been winning. I, I, I even feel embarrassed to tell people how much we would give people like Kateriga to run <laughs> for elections. Sometimes I even have to switch off my phone and run away because the universities are too many and the resource envelope that EC gives to a political party based on numerical number strength is not even sustainable. So uh, a takeaway from what I'm saying is that political parties need to provide enough mentorship, mentor young people who understand real responsibilities, who can navigate complex political terrain, terrains in the country, and I think that is how we can navigate. But also, uh, it is the seat of power. Lastly? Yeah, lastly, of course. The seat of power. Let our elders in Uganda, I feel so embarrassed if elders in Uganda do not even understand the historical mission of Uganda. The historical mission of this country is to build a nation state based on democracy. That, that, that is it. And so we need to protect democracy. And democracy is not an institution of enmity. Leaders need to distinguish between excitement that elections brings and chaos. Thank you. I think sometimes they fail to make that, draw that line. That is why they come up with these unfortunate policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to the Honorable Mukasambide, without repeating what Okidi has said, we're looking at independence and autonomy of student governance bodies, and that is autonomy from uh, political party, negative influence, uh, but also from overbearing policies within the universities that they are working or that they're existing in. And given your examination of the years, you know, what are some of the strategies that could work now, could have worked in the past and enabled student governance bodies to actually thrive? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you have reminded me of, of my my former campaign days, the analysis I gave to Makere University, which obviously equally obtained is now to the whole country, uh, was that, and it is, that Uganda and majorly Makere University equally are now fossilized. Uh, fossilization to those who are scientists have, has the effect of failure of locomotion. It has gout and varicose veins now in every limb 
Honorable Mukasa, on the yes. point of gout, mm. we are going to come back on gout. <laughs> But let us get, it's, it, yes, on gout, and we will remember the gout, but I think our guests are here, and let's just hold this very exciting thought. Although now the guests are not here. But yes, okay, let's continue. Yes, so, now the role before us is, is to diagonize uh, the whole disease and its causes with microscopic exactness. Because if we fail to do that, then, then obviously we are missing a very big point. One time I was discussing, because you see, the Nigerians say that when a mother cow is eating, the younger ones are also watching to see the movement of the jaws. Afterwards, equally, that is how they also begin to move theirs while eating. Now, what you see here is majorly a microcosm of what obtains outside Makerere. So when you see the university policies seeking to curtail political, uh, political party rights here, it is not different from what is happening in the whole country. This is just a microcosm. This is Uganda made simple. <laughs> in Uganda, of course, we had, a, we had a ban of political parties from 1986 to 2005, which is clearly 19 years of ignorance about political party applications and operations. Uh, I hope we are not... Ladies and gentlemen, let's all stand up and welcome our chief guest in a very thunderous clap. Let's clap for chief guest as he joins us. His Excellency Jakaya Kikwete, you're so much welcome. It's such an honor to have you today. We have much gratified to have you here today. And now that our chief guest is here, we are going to stay standing as the Bantu troop will lead us in one stanza of each anthem, the Ugandan anthem, the Tanzanian anthem, and the East African anthem, Bantu. Jumu yet 
We have Honorable Mukasambide, the Iyala Member of Parliament. We have the Chairperson of the Electoral Commission of Uganda, Justice Simon Biabakama. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Makerele University, Professor Henry Adinitwe. The Guild Leadership of Makerele University, the Uganda National Students Council Leaders, the National Youth Council Leadership, University Guild Leaders and former Guild Leaders, representatives of NDAs, political parties, development partners, representatives, and those from the CSOs, you're all welcome. Our dear chief guest, before you arrived, we had a great conversation from the Professor Sarah Sali, the Dean of Gender of School of Gender, Makerele University, Center for Excellence in Notions of Identity. And here she identified a couple of issues which are very critical to our nation, not only to our continent. She said that the continent is exploited and uh, re-echoed that African Union and the African leaders have the answers to our continent. She called for the regional blocs to negotiate at that layer. Again, she emphasized the neocolonialism with limited knowledge on what the continent has to offer. She again emphasized that leadership comes with service. Shortly after that, Your Excellency, we had another speech from Justice Simon Biabakama, the chairperson, Uganda Electoral Commission, and emphasized the need of everyone to be inclusive in the elections of our land. He emphasized the youth to be very disciplined, but again, not to be used by political negative elements for their political gains, as Uganda looks for the roadmap of election. Your Excellency, as you arrived, we were having a conversation, and we are still having a conversation with the former guild leaders in national politics. We have former student leaders experience in the national politics and exploring the influence of political parties in student guild elections. And this is moderated by Isabella Akiteng, a researcher. I'm Andrew Chamagero as your host today. Akiteng. Thank you very much. And under the umbrella of the protocol that was provided for by Mr. Chamagero, I will proceed with my moderation because if I were to go through it again, yes. And uh, we are very grateful to have you all. And I'm not sure how to bring back Honorable Mukasa Mbide by reminding him that he was at the point of gout. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had provided my, my diagnosis that includes that, uh, of course, when you look at now Makere University, uh, particularly our senior guests that were outside, the question was having something to do with curtailment of multi-party political freedoms here at the university. And, and I was giving my, my analysis uh, that actually the Nigerians say that when the mother cow is eating, the younger ones are also watching to see the movement of the jaws. And, and afterwards, clearly, that is how they also begin to do so. That what happens here is just Uganda made simple. It must be amplified to include what is happening in the whole country. So I was giving an analysis that because we had some party ban from 1986 to 2005, that clearly provided 19 years of ignorance of political parties and how they operate. And that established now a fossilized society with the gout and the varicose vein is in every political limbo. To the, to the extent that when you look at political parties, the analysis then comes in. They are equally a dichotomy of two. There is, and, every, and of course, which is based on opinions, the intellectuals from universities also join political parties. But then those that are also found there that somehow are also popular by means of celebrity panjandram are also in the party. So it creates a dichotomy of two, and those two have been interpreted by the ignorant media as factions. So 
not knowing obviously that at the offices of the electoral commission you cannot have factions because parties are bodies corporate not every opinion can be a faction and, and these are things that we know should have happened civic education was necessary in the circumstances of course our chief guest you are the fourth president of, of the united republic of tanzania uh, for us we have had ours and we are not complaining for quite a long time <laughs> And all of us here are part of the traffic jam now. So at least for you, uh, of course, there has been some bit of movement so that the jam has been dealt away with. Us and all those near you are part of the traffic jam. <laughs> but we are still dealing with it, Thank uh, you. our chief guest. Yes. So it is important, cause and effect, a people's level to govern themselves democratically is, is proportionate to the degree of their understanding of the structure and functioning of the whole social body. Now, Makerere and, and other universities should be led to understand the structure and functioning of political parties to the extent then that we shall have leaders of tomorrow that understand it to the gist. That will be now the service provided in terms of body politic of the future. It starts here. If it doesn't start here, you are sending us fellows that are going to get stuck on the, on, on the streets. They don't know what to say. In fact, they will begin to mend. So, Mentorship begins here, and if it doesn't, obviously then you are starting a blockade, a fast lead, a fanfaronade here, and you are calling it education, and that on, will not be the and case. And on that note, mm. thank you very much, Honorable. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Honorable Mukasambide. For the guests who, are, who have just arrived, uh, the question to the panel was around strategies and approaches that could have better preserved the autonomy and independence of student governance bodies so that they would be able to thrive in a multi-party dispensation. And we had left uh, the two ladies, that is Sheila and Priska, uh, to come in last because, because of the unique realities in their universities. They say that in their universities they have religious political parties. So political party in its known knowledge is not accepted in those two universities, but it's an aspect of what religion do you subscribe to. So I will bring you on board to respond to the question. Over Thank to you, you Priska. Thank you very much, Isabella, and uh, Your Excellency, you're very welcome, and we're so glad to have you, together with the guests that have come with you. Just to speak into that, Honorable Bide spoke about fools getting to the surface. If we are sleeping as the elite, as the people who are ready and prepared, then fools are going to take over. In my book that I authored, Courage Under Fire, I, there was one philosopher that said that if the upright and righteous of society don't accept to lead, then they must accept to be led by fools. And I hope that sinks this, this, this morning in our, in our minds, that there is a vacuum if we don't prepare. First of all, what does university, what do university politics give us? Universities help us to prepare. How do you manage resources? How do you manage people? Regardless of how you got in, if you came through a political party or you came through a religious affiliation, it's okay. But now you're there. In, the, in that one year that you have in office, what are you doing? How are you managing your time? So for me, I think the bigger question should be, after the university politics, what next for us? Because that's the, 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 this is just a bedrock for us to come and do well at national level. If I am a good leader, I will still, I will still come through. Whether I've come through a party or not, I will still be able to find my way up. So the question should be for us this morning, afternoon actually, it should be that what are we doing with the different experiences that we share? And I think the purpose of this summit should be able to speak into that. How do we bring our, our knowledge? How do we bring our skills? How do we bring all that we learned and acquired through our campus time into the national level and make our offices better, our governance better, and leadership much, much better. That is where the real, real issue is. And if we don't look into these things and, and, and sort them critically and urgently, we're going to wake up 10 years from now and we'll have, I don't know what. So I think we need to take charge as uh, former student leaders and participate, we must involve ourselves. Okay, thank you very much Priska. Yes. And we will now have Sheila and we'll come to the audience after Sheila to take our only five questions, very brief questions for the panel. Yes, thank please. You. Thank you so much. Uh, the former president of Tanzania, I recognize your presence. Uh, for me, I think uh, what these institutions should look out for should be an avenue to mentor the young leaders into becoming national leaders instead of involving them in party politics, which of course we know in our country, party politics has spread so much hate. 
in youth, uh, amongst youth, because it is very easy for parties to take advantage of youth, uh, our youths to probably, you know, spread hate. We are easily used because of so many reasons. One, probably because of the financial uh, crisis that we have in our lives. Uh, different um, reasons why you could get used to, to, you know, spread hate, take an advantage of doing the criminal acts and all of that. So for me, I think that the universities should maintain their position to have non-political party uh, activities in their guild um, politics because that way the students are given um, opportunity to, to learn vastly so that you're not limited to a particular party that you might have subscribed to. That way you'll be able to learn a lot of things in that when you're out of university, you'll then choose which, un which party to subscribe to. Because that's why I believe um, a lot of opportunities, say for instance, we are, we are grooming, parties groom their people to only adhere to what it is that they be, say, eliminating a dictator or removing a dictator, this young person is going to grow up knowing that we are only focusing on removing a dictator. And then that is what is going to grow in the minds of this young person. So when you're out of university, you will take up that part. You will not have the opportunity to explore more on other avenues. So I believe the universities who, which do not have party politics are thriving very well. They, they have less of uh, um, uh, fights, they don't have these kinds of crises that come with, uh, with politics. So I believe that should be the way to go. Maybe they'll be able to traverse into this when, when they're out of politics, I mean, uh, university politics. That's what I think, Isabella. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much, thank you. And um, th there have been a couple of Hakana Rugunda talk about his time at the university and his experience. And hopefully, maybe in his address, he might just throw in a line or two. Is there anyone from, uh, from the organizers who could help move the microphone? Also, because men are oversubscribed in this hand situation, we will have a man and then a woman and then a man and then a woman, so yeah. But we'll have you. Your hand came up first, sir. Yes, please. Uh, and as you submit, yeah. please provide your name, the university you're from, and then a very brief submission. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Hudayfa Hassan from IUIU. So my question is to Madam Priska. As a female, as as a female leader and as a first guild president, uh, have you faced challenges, and how were you able? to tackle those challenges that you have faced. So that is my question. Uh, thank you very much. We have the first female in this trajectory right at the back. Yes, please. You can stand up so that they can see you. Otherwise, we might have a situation where someone else uh, takes the microphone. Uh, it was actually the lady at the front, but OK. Uh, Um, greetings all, good, a very good uh, afternoon to you. Um, His Excellency Jakaya Chikwete, uh, we are honored by your presence. And all Guild members, uh, thank you very much for this event, it's amazing. Um, my question goes to uh, Honorable Anna Adeke. As a Guild president, I firmly advocate for universities to retain from political engagement as much as we possibly can. Uh, my apologies, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Maria Mohammed. I'm the Guild President of Isbat University. We have to ensure that we prioritize our core mission in any university, which is education. And I feel like politics sort of distracts us from that. Um, we also have to ensure that we are educated enough throughout the level of the universities such that we are able to perform in politics later on, not during our, education, our educational journey. We also have, you mentioned the politics, but I'm, I'm an international student. I am a North African, I'm, I come from Egypt. And I've been in Uganda for over 13 years now, but then I feel like 
it still keeps me in the bracket of no, I, I should not involve myself into politics. Moreover, as a girl president of a university, Isbat University has students from 32 nationalities. Uh, in conclusion? Yes. Therefore, my question to you is, what would you have to say to a university like Isbat University with international students? And how would you advise for us to get into politics, and especially with a guild president from an international uh, uh, country? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, number three is right here. It's a quick one. <laughs> OK, well, this is not. Thank you very much. Uh, also, this is not how democracy works. This is one of the problems we have in our country. I am a student of law. This is how President Museveni came. This is also what we are trying to address. He grabbed the power and he established the legal order. And then here we are 40 years down the road. Anyway, my question is a quick one. My name is Moses Omujugujugu. And I am the leader of opposition of Makere University, the 90th Guild Government. <laughs> My question goes to Honorable Mukasambide and the Chairman EC. Here at Makere University, political parties have been totally curtailed. There is a, there is a lot of uh, dictatorship that even when you sneeze, tomorrow you receive a suspension letter. <laughs> I want to pick it from him. What are you doing, like you who enjoyed the political parties during your time? What have you done? And then what do, you, what do you advise us to do? Because we are suffering, we are dying, we are about, I don't know how even to express this. We here, we are being suffocated. We cannot talk, we cannot say anything. This was the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. If you ask him who won, he cannot tell you. He's here. <laughs> Colleagues, Michael has been suffocated. We are calling upon every stakeholder to do something so that we can do something for I thank you, uh, Ms. my president, my president. Uh, we are going to bring the questions to an end if that microphone moves to the president. Mr. President, sir, I am going to really ask, I'm going to really ask, I am going to ask that that microphone goes to that gentleman very kindly. No, I, I was, the, my hand was up. Yes, your hand was up, but there was an order. Uh, Mr. President, there was an order, and I hope that we can maintain order and decorum in this particular space, especially because our guest of honor is the epitome of decorum in the region. Indeed, thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Nyombi Haruna. And I am the good speaker of Islamic University in Uganda, Kampala campus. Uh, in my submission, I only want to agree with uh, my, uh, my, our, one of our panelists, uh, the former president of Uganda Matas University. In terms of religion, uh, religious, perspect in religious perspective, where universities are curtailing students to involve in political party politics, especially for universities like IUIU, Uganda Matters, and Uganda Christian University. These universities are based on values. And such values, I will take you, for instance, to my university, where our, uh, the mission of the university is to serve as an academic institution based on Islamic values that create knowledge and trains learners to fulfill society needs. Therefore. When you bring in political parties, remember they have different ideologies. And these ideologies, when you may not be able to align them uh, with the university values, first of all. Uh, for instance, she talked of the removing the dictator kind of scenario. When you bring into it into the university, to bring it uh, in line with the values, sometimes the students may be put in a situation where they cannot ably associate with others. For instance, if I am a Muslim, maybe I'm subscribing to another political party. If we bring in this political party politics, we may not be able to freely participate, except if we are left to express ourselves freely without aligning ourselves to the political parties. We can ably be able to associate with others, like she had hinted on. Thank you okay. so much. Uh, thank you very much. We will take the lady and we'll close the questions with the guild president.
Uh, the lady is right across. It, 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 will be a, it will be a nice thing for the gentleman to walk the microphone to her. Yes, please, the lady in black. The lady in black. Yes, thank you. I want to stand on the already established protocol. My name is Akampura Shamim, and I'm the Vice Guild President, King Caesar University. I'm going to be so brief, and my question is directed to Honorable Mkasambide. How do we navigate as youth our way to political space where the ones in power do not want to leave, and they are actually somehow intimidated by the youth, and they are concluding that that we are coming to, pol to the political space to bring chaos? My second question is going to be, to the female leaders on the panel, and uh, it's about the stigmatization of the female leaders and the females who aspire to be leaders. Uh, there, there is an issue of people wanting to fight females who want to be uh, guild presidents, and you realize that most times uh, for a lady to be a guild president, it's going to be after a few years in the university. So how do we fight that stigmatization? Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and we will close with the guild president. For the hands that are still up, I'd like to say that this is the first panel of the day. There is a second and third panel that I hope you can be able to participate in. So uh, let's close with the guild president, and I will ask that you just ask a question. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, being the host president, I will humbly request that uh, you permit me with a little bit more latitude to expound more on my point so that they can clearly get it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Mweshimiwa laisi wa zamani wa zamuhuri ya munganu wa Tanzania, Jakaya Murisho Chikwete, Jinalangu ni Lubega Nsamba, Mimi ni Sasa Natisini, Raisi, wachama chama. Vocation elections which were marred by total violence. But none of the candidates that were aspiring for the various positions inc was inclined to any political party. So why is it that when they are trying to verify? <laughs> so that puts us at a risk. That puts us at a risk of us being chosen leaders for. Because the issue cannot, cannot verify the results. He can't tell me that I got this number of results from my school of social sciences. He can't tell me that. He doesn't know that. Uh, our Justice Simon Biabakama, allow me to report to you that however much this country in 2005 we entered into an inception of allowing multi-party politics, that very statute I'm talking about under Section 6.2 does not allow us to politically associate openly. When they hear that Rubega Samba is associating with any political party, they are going to come after me and disqualify me from the race, which we believe it does not really work with the national laws because Article 29E allows us to politically associate with any political parties that we wish. And in Here at Makerere University, we are socially discriminated. In that same statute, Section 80C, Year ones are not allowed to stand. That is social discrimination, which Article 21, Clause 2 of our Constitution, which is the Supreme Law, does not go to that. So the leaders who are here, kindly and management, we are humbly requesting, let us look through these things. Because we all appreciate the important aspect of leadership, what leadership can do to any society. Honorable Mukasambi, I don't believe you will be the way you are if you are subjected to the same system that we are subjected to currently. I believe you. you must know what is taking place at Makerere, uh, the, the justice, the Abakama, who is the head of uh, elections in, in the entire country. We are about to reach out to your office, all the former leaders. We want to see how we can see how we can subvert this, because surely Thank you it very does much. not build for the future, it does construct Thank the future. You. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, yes, um, so we're going to come back to the panel, and whereas the panel can comment on that question, I would advise that we defer that question to the next panel, 
because the next panel is purely looking at youth engagement in policy formations, and it's also exploring students' leaders, in, uh, students leaders role, roles in influencing tertiary institution policy frameworks, and that is quite broadly. And thankfully, the chair or the moderator for that panel, Ms. Helena Okiring, is in the house, and she has elaborately had that question, and I believe it will be a good context to, uh, with which to open panel two. Uh, on that note, I will come back to uh, the main panel, and I'd like to say that we've eaten into the time by about, um, by about 10 minutes, so we really need to close this very quickly. So if we can limit our responses miraculously to a minute, that will be ideal. And we will start from my far right, which is with Sheila. Yes, please. I beg your pardon? Uh, we will start with you in closing. So I had oh, provided yes. guidance at the beginning on a few questions to respond to. And in case there's a particular question that was directed at you, uh, please respond. Uh, but let's not take more than two minutes in response. Thank yes. you so much. Um, there was no question referred to me. However, um, this would just be a very few remarks from me. I think it's very important that we should be service-based, service-oriented, and then focusing on political parties. Because then when we focus on political parties, I don't think there's much that we do, given we're in universities and other institutions. When you are looking forward to giving service to your people, I don't think there's anything that comes beyond that, other than worshiping and uh, probably, as they say, bootlicking, which is a very harsh word, I would, I would say, they use out there. People, people focus on parties so much so that they forget the the aspect of why they have been chosen in that particular or critical role. And also, I would think that student leaders should look forward to organizing the communities that they are the cheerleaders, because then it is through that organization that your performance is going to be looked out for. Because when you lead a, a very disorganized society, whatever it is that you do, I don't think it can be seen. And also, Maybe we could, uh, for, the university, for the universities that practice uh, party politics, I think it's only fair that maybe the students choose uh, what to go with, because at the end of the day, when you're out of university, what are you going to do outside there? What is it that you want to achieve? If you limited yourself to party activities right from universities, when you get out, the transition is going to be a little bit hard. Even the adaptation to these other environments, it's going to be a little bit hard. So for me, I think it's, it's important that you focus on service. It's important that you focus on growth and what comes with leadership. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving over to Mr. Christopher Okidi. Oh, thank uh, you so much. Just a reminder that it's two minutes. Oh, yeah, that is yes. even too much. Uh, thank you. There are things that we need to agree in this room that are non-negotiable. You see, there are things you can negotiate about, and then there are those that are non-negotiable. In any relationship, even with your girlfriend, you have to tell her that, you see, we can negotiate about this, but these are unnegotiable. And I think democracy is unnegotiable. There is, there is no need to pontificate uh, move around, scatter around the idea by trying to bring uh, justifications that are dead on arrival. For example, uh, how do you begin to say? By the way, for you, uh, I think I didn't give myself an elaborate intro introduction. I've studied in three universities in this country, and the fourth institution I studied in is at LDC. So I understand all these contexts. In fact. This was my guild president I voted for when I was uh, studying at political science here for my graduate program. And when I was doing law at UCU, I voted for Prisca. So I have been in these universities and I know. Uh, when I was youth leader of DP, I wanted to challenge uh, the Uganda Christian University uh, because clearly limiting students from participation, a, a student you admitted, you limit him to participate for guild elections because of religion, and yet, there are, and yet there are constitutional provisions about rights to your political opinion, social affiliation, and all that, all that, and the state is just watching. 
In fact, I'm very disappointed in Makerere Guild President to be complaining here in this Guild Leaders Summit. I expected him to be complaining in court by way of judicial review. I know Ivan Bowe is always there giving pro bono. So even, even uh, we were told by philosophers then, Aquinas, Augustine, to object to unjust laws, you see? In fact, you're helping Uganda in its democratic development by challenging unjust laws in some of these institutions. Let's take democracy as a non-negotiable. We shouldn't negotiate about that. This brings me to a point where I want to dissent with my, some of my panelists, including my uh, senior colleague in the Democratic Party, Mukasa Mbide. Uh, democracy is an inclusive institution. Democracy thrives on dissent. In fact, they say the cornerstone of democracy is dissent. Democracy is all about inclusivity. In fact, the simplest definition to define democracy is In that conclusion? democracy, yes, yes, is that democracy is an institution for conflict resolution in society. You have law, that is why there are rule of law, all those things. You have what? You go to constitutional court. You have a land problem, you go there. So democracy is something that, so humanity, it came up because humanity generally will have differences. Thank you. In this panel, we are not the same. We shall, we shall be different, even in opinion and what. But then there is democracy to moderate this. And finally, Sabella, this idea of saying people are idiots is what I really wanted to dissent with. Mm. Democracy being an inclusive uh, institution, there is really no need to stratify people in terms of who they are, their cognitive aptitude. Democracy should include everybody. Thank you. And those who actually, I just Okidi, Mr. Okidi Christopher. Uh, I just want to recommend two books. Yes. Kindly, those who think, those who think unreasonable people cannot bring change, I want you to read Ebad Hubbard, a message to Garcia, and see how someone you thought was stupid ended the Spanish, uh, the Cuban and Spanish uh, revolution. And then also there's Alfred Hitchman who writes about uh, the bene what is called beneficial ignorance. So even there is some ignorance that is also beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to Honorable Anna. I had two questions. Uh, the first that was raised by the young lady, the guild president of East Batch University, um, who's, who spoke generally about the fact that you go to university to get an education, you know, to get your degree, and you know, you shouldn't be so politically involved. I think that an education is more than just a degree that you have. Yeah. I mean, I, I was in Makere, I studied law, graduated with a second class upper, honors degree, CGPA of 4.01 on Dean's list, doing law, while I was also guild president. Um, I think I, I left Makere University with more than just a Bachelor of Laws degree. And I, I think that it it's also enriches your experience as an international student to increase your knowledge, increase your experience about what happens. You know, what distinguishes you as a student who leaves home to study in another country is your, your, your experience is going to be enriched by some other situations that other students back home will not have. So when you allow yourself to be politically involved, you also acquire knowledge, you acquire experience, and it's a good thing that you come from Africa, within Africa. Because we, we, we struggle, we grapple with the same challenges all over the African continent. So I think that you should allow yourself to experience these things so that you get more than just a degree, which, you can, which will be also a classic degree. You may get a classic degree, but also what you get outside, just that paper that you hold, 
will really enrich your, your, you as an individual and what you will become in the future. It, it will increase your ambition. I mean, I can't um, expound in detail, but it, it, it definitely makes you an edge way better than other students. Uh, that's why you find, I was in, uh, when I was in Makere, in the FDC we had an office for international relations, international students, because we wanted them to also be a part of this, to experience, and to, because it's a platform for your voice to be heard. So I think you should embrace it and experience it. Thank you. It, it, it will enrich you. Uh, there was another question that was posed about the stigmatization of females. And I just want all the young women here to know you're not alone. What you've been going through, we went through it. Uh, but now you have so many examples to cite about very successful female leadership in Uganda as a country, in our institutions of higher learning. You, in Maker, we have Shamim, Nambasa. At the time I became a uh, guild president, it had been Nora Njuba, Sarah Kajingo, Susan Abo, and I was the fourth. And now, Shamim, I'm so proud of her. She becomes the fifth female. And I'm hoping there'll be another female from Makere University. But you have all these examples to cite. And also, it's important as young women to get mentored. Don't navigate this journey alone, acting like you're the first to take this journey. You know, like John Speak, who they said was discovering Africa, yet we were already here. You have many people that you can share your challenges with. So don't navigate this like you are the first and the only one. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Priska, very briefly. OK, thank you very much. I had a question directed to me from my brother. I think he's from IUIU. On, a, on the challenges I have faced as a female leader, and now I've been able to overcome them. I ran for National Female Youth MP, her constituency, in 2021. And uh, I, I came fourth out of 12 candidates in that election. But there's something that election gave me. It never leaves you the same. So what I would implore anyone here in this room is that you have to, you have to, you have, to have resolve. When you go for something, you must have that resolve and say, at all costs, no matter the results, I'll have to stay on course. It's been three years since I have stayed on course. I've actually got better and better and better. But also that gave me a very big network of friends that I met along that journey, along that trace. And uh, one of the ways you can navigate the challenges you face as a leader is by having a, an inner circle that has your back. You must have friends that you can trust and count on. In this room, they have very many friends. Uh, His Excellency Ocheng Ocheng, Guild President, Guild President Chambago University, Ivan Wo, where we ran together, Anna Deke, she even gave me some fuel. You need to have friends who can give you money when you're going to contest. <laughs> yes, so you need to have friends who are genuine, but above all, also God. I'm a very, I'm a strong believer in Christ, and you must have your faith in God, because people can disappoint you, but God never leaves us. Thank so you. you must have your faith in God. The second question was about stigmatization of female leaders. What I'd like to say is that you need to distinguish yourself as a girl, because already there is patriarchy in society, and there are very many odds that are against girl, the girl child. So when you're competing, you must have an edge. Me, I can't, I can't get scared when I'm competing with a fellow, with a gentleman. No, 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 no. We are equally good, and, we, and the best has to win. So showcase, show cause, show cause. Be distinguished, be excellent, have friends and mentors that will impact into your life, that will really matter, and participate at all levels. Don't despise the door of humble beginnings. Begin from a small club, from a small chapter, maybe of an association, and as time goes, you'll get to the top. Thank Cream you. Always to the top. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. And lastly, I cannot, it seems it's, it's the DP gentleman I need to warn about time. So, Honorable Mukasambi, over to you in uh, conclusion already. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I had two questions and uh, what my brother called a disagreement, that, uh, or a difference be between me and uh, probably his interpretation of idiocy. <laughs> he has recommended a series of books except one, which is violence between the monkeys and the man. <laughs> so, now this is to you, the young people. 
First of all, who told you that joining politics and practically belonging to a political party gives you a bleak future? I am here. I hold a bachelor's of mass communication degree from this university. I hold a bachelor of laws degree from the same university. Diploma in legal practice, master's of laws, oil and gas, and a PhD honoris causa from the University of Philadelphia. Let me tell you why the difference between a PhD which is academic and one which is honoris causa. The one which is academic, somebody studies, majors in a field, and is actually subjected to a lot of scrutiny to the extent that then he is judged as fit and fair to be awarded a PhD. What about the one honoris causa? The university instead now studies about you sleeplessly to the extent that it awards you that degree. So that is the one I have. Now, I am equally a businessman and, I am flourish, uh, uh, and my businesses are flourishing. I don't think if there is anybody that goes hungry, that statistic cannot include me. So why don't you join politics? For the sole purpose that anybody tells you, you will now have a bleak future. Which kind of future do I have? If you want to look like me, or even better, just join. Number two, and in fact, join the Democratic Party. Number two, uh, my brother, the guild president, and of course somebody else, Mujugu uh, Jugu, who also posed the question. Uh, you have raised a very fundamental matter, that there is a statute that stops you from holding your politics here basing on multi-party political dispensation. My brother has recommended judicial review. It doesn't apply, of course. That is not the law. Judicial review applies to decisions. But this is a law. Now, what we are going to look at is the law, the law is very clear. I'm, I'm concluding. The is extending towards us. So yes, okay. in conclusion. OK, yes. because you see, they, they say the minimis non at rex. I hope that is not that, an that attack law, on me. <laughs> the law recognizes everything except very minor matters. Now, this is not a minor matter. Why don't I conclude on it? Because it is a matter for which there are a lot of frowns on the faces of university students. Uh, I think we are going to advise you. Mr. Gill, the president, take a decision as the GRC, recommending that we go to the Constitutional Court to have that statute expanded from the records of statutes in Uganda. Because that is the best way. I, I will be available, and I am sure many other advocates in Uganda will be available. We will definitely represent you. And I will make sure nobody charges you, not even me, who will be the lead, the lead lawyer. With, with only those, I, first of all, let me thank you. Because, because for me, this is a very great opportunity to, first of all, address the, the honchos and sachems of academics here in Uganda. I thank you so much. And uh, right now, Prime Minister Emeritus, I am always happy each time I see you. Our senior leaders that have led this university before us, you showed us the way. Right now, Ruchikaire and our other leaders, the doctors, so you have guided us, and I am sure we have not disappointed you. Thank you very much for God and my country. Thank you, thank you. I, I am going to pretend like I have not seen your hand, but it's been a great honor and privilege to host uh, this distinguished panel. A big thank you to Honorable Anna Adeke. Thank you very much. Let's clap for her. Um, a big thank you to Sheila Obia, who was a guild president with Uganda Matters University. Uh, thank you to Priska Nyangiro, who was pres Guild President, Uganda uh, Christian University. Uh, to Christopher Okidi, who was Guild President, Gulu University. Thank you very much. And to the Honorable Mukasa Ambide, thank you very much for being part of this panel. Uh, once again, this panel was made possible by Civ Legacy Foundation. And the Civ Legacy Foundation is a philanthropy support and advisory partner, passionate about curating and facilitating spaces for conversations on contextual issues on leadership, governance, transition management, succession planning across sectors. Civ Legacy is part of Civ Source Africa, which is a philanthropy advisory firm. So Civ Source, Civ Legacy, thank you for making this possible. And to the entire panel, Thank you very much. We should now exit before Mr. Chamagero comes back for us. Thank you.
Let's give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'm going to give more ground rules moving forward, especially for the, for the speakers and the next panels coming through. We don't have quite a lot of time. I understand we are young and youthful and we wish to speak from here to Timbuktu and back, but we won't have enough time. So the next speakers, I'm going to request that we, we try as much as we can to be brief because there is a lot more coming. We still have two more panels coming. And that is, um, I'll be shortly after lunch. The conversation is still getting much more exciting. But before I call another speaker, allow me to appreciate our key partners and sponsors today. We have the German Corporation in Uganda. We have the European Union in Uganda. We have GIZ in Uganda. We have Center of Excellence. They're equally part of our key partners today. We have Akinamama wa Africa. We have the Civic Legacy Foundation. We have the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. We have Action Aid, the Julius Nyerere Leadership Center. We have Uganda Youth Network. And we have the Uganda, rather the University Forum on Governance. And last but not least, National Enterprise Corporation. Anyone has had some water today by show of hands? You got some water? You didn't get any water? OK, those who got water by show of hands. That water is manufactured by the UPDF. Let's clap for them. Our dear chief guest, coming up next, we're going to hear from the EU ambassador and the head of the European Union delegation in Uganda, His Excellency Jan Sadek. But all speakers coming up here henceforth, we shall use the other entrance to access this because it's a little bit of operations this side and a little bit cluttered. Let's welcome His Excellency Jan Sadek to address us. Thank you very much, Master Cernis. It's great to be here as a partner of this event. I will try to be short, but I would want to uh, greet, to start by greeting His Excellency Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete, the former president of the United Republic of Tanzania. I could also say welcome to Uganda, because I was in your beautiful country last week, two very beautiful countries. Um, also, uh, the Right Honorable Ruhakana Rugunda, the former Prime Minister of uh, Uganda and Special Envoy for Special Duties at the Office of the President. <laughs> Honorable Matthew Ruki uh, Kaire, uh, the former Minister of Finance, should be here. And of course, Justice Simon Biakabama uh, from the... Uh, <laughs> Jack Obama from the, uh, from the Electoral Commission, right? Gave us a splendid speech before I can, about democracy. Uh, Professor Henry Arinaitwe, who is the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of this university, I'm very happy to be here, of course, with you today. We have Their Excellencies, the uh, Ugandan High Commissioner to uh, Tanzania and the Tanzanian High Commissioner to Uganda here. A pleasure, colleagues. Members of the uh, Guild uh, Presidents Leadership Academy Board and Secretariat, and of course all the uh, students uh, here at the university, including the very the great choir that you have here. Was that the Makoral or was it another choir? They sang beautifully for us. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here today uh, at this summit for former university student leaders in Uganda. Allow me to thank the Guild President's Leadership Academy for organizing such an inclusive event that takes stock of how youth leadership over time has been instrumental in contributing to Uganda's development journey. And it's a particular pleasure for me to be here because I was myself uh, a member of the Students' Guild at the Lund University. We spoke about that, uh, right, uh, Honorable. Uh, at the Lund University in Sweden sometime in the beginning of the 90s, then representing the medical f faculty in the uh, Students' Guild. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it was Julius Nyerere who once said, leadership is not an individual quality, but a collective one. It is not the lone voice in the wilderness, but the many voices in unison that make the difference. That was Julius Nyerere. And today, ladies and gentlemen, leaders from different generations are gathering together here. As we reflect on the theme of this summit, legacy and leadership, the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning, it becomes evident that the transmission of knowledge and experiences across generations is, a crucial, is crucial in ensuring a leadership continuum. And it is in this spirit of collaboration and mutual learning that we today have the honor of welcoming distinguished guests such as His Excellency Jakayam Risho Kikwete, the former President of the United Republic of Tanzania. Uganda's legal framework encourages young people to engage in development and democratic processes. That's quite clear from the discussions here today. Platforms such as the National Youth Council and the Youth Members of Parliament ensure that youth issues are heard and addressed from local to national levels. Institutions of higher education also play a pivotal role in nurturing career growth and fostering discussions on governance, democracy, and socioeconomic development. The representation of student leaders at the university councils facilitates meaningful dialogue between students and university leadership and provides opportunities for youth engagement in Uganda's education policy. This has produced influential leaders who shape policy and public opinion as manifested in the many stories of those present here today. Team Europe, which is the European Union and Germany in this case, appreciates to be among the development, development partners supporting this event. As we are committed to empowering youth, offering them opportunities and supporting them as key drivers of change. In partnership with the German Corporation, we support various youth organizations through the GIZ Civil Society Support Program and strengthen their capacities to engage with state partners. I would also like to mention here the EU-funded Erasmus Plus program, which we are very proud of, and perhaps, uh, hopefully, all of you know about it. It uh, offers mobility opportunities for Ugandan students and academic staff in Africa and Europe. In 2023, more than 400 Ugandan students and academic staff benefited from the program that offers them the opportunity to study and continue their research in Europe and Erasmus partner countries. Do please uh, study the opportunities of the Erasmus Plus program, all of you. In addition to our support to youth, we are thrilled about the youth sounding board that we established last year. This board is composed of 20 young dynamic Ugandans from across the country. Their mission is to advise the European Union's cooperation in Uganda, ensuring it is more participatory and better able to address the needs of young Ugandans. And I should say that there's also such a board in Tanzania. And as, as you know, we have representatives here like Belinda, I think we have Charity and Howard is also here from our board. Very happy to have you always with us. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I extend my sincere gratitude to the Guild Presidents Leadership Academy for organizing this event that advances the aspirations of young leaders across the country. The European Union is fully committed to supporting Uganda in harnessing the incredible potential of its young and talented people. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate you, Your Excellency Jan Sedek, our dear chief guest. Before you came through, we had a brief preamble conversation with Masesa Demian, who happens to be the executive director of the Guild Leadership Academy. Allow me to welcome Masesa Demian again to make these remarks in your presence. Demian, let's welcome him. Thank you.
you very much, uh, Chamagiru. And uh, before I could proceed, uh, quickly, my leadership that has uh, ensured that this event is success kindly just join me here. Uh, I know Professor Sarasali will not, will not, I don't know if you're comfortable, you could join. Uh, Yusuf, uh, Ayub Chiranda, Katolaban, Kaitesi Natasha, Agaba Kenneth Amponda, Kabila Dennis, Namudu Nabira, Atwai Rebaseka, and uh, Kshache David. Our chief guest, the Vice President, former Prime Minister of Uganda, former Minister of Finance, the EU Ambassador, Uganda High Commissioner, Tanzanian High Commissioner, the MPs uh, available here today, Chairperson of uh, the Electoral Commission, Deputy and uh, the Vice Chancellor, Guild uh, the Leadership. It is with great honor and privilege that I stand before you today as we gather for the inaugural Guild Leaders Summit here at Macquarie University. In the presence of such esteemed dignitaries, the Vice President of Uganda, Her Excellency Jessica Lupo, who is representing the President of Uganda, the Chief Guest, the Fourth President of the United Republic of Tanzania, His Excellency Jakaya Murisho Kikwete, we are truly witnessing history being made today. Before we embark on a journey of exploration and collaboration, let us take the moment to reflect on the significance of this summit. The Guild Presence Leadership Academy, in its pursuit of fostering leadership excellence, has brought together former student leaders from across generations and from all institutions of higher learning here in Uganda to reignite civic participation and to contribute to the strengthening of Uganda's democracy. Today, we stand on the shoulders of giants, trailblazers who have paved the way for us to follow. Our theme this year, Legacy and Leadership Continuum, the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning, resonates deeply with the ethos of this summit. It speaks to the timeless connection between the past, the present, and the future, a connection embodied in the legacy of our different learning institutions and the continuum of leadership that spans generations. Macquarie University, with its storied history and illustrious alumni, stands as a, as a statement to the enduring power of knowledge and the transformative potential of cross-generational learning. In the annals of history, Uganda and Tanzania share a bond forged in crucible of struggle and solidarity. The friendship between our two nations, rooted in a shared com commitment to progress and, develop and development, serves a shining example of cooperation and collaboration. As we gather here today, let us draw inspiration from the spirit of friendship that binds us, transcending borders and boundaries in pursuit of common vision for a better tomorrow. Knowledge is a cornerstone of progress, the currency of change, the catalyst for transformation. In the hollowed halls of our institutions out there, knowledge takes on a life of its own, nurtured, cultivated, and shared among generations. It empowers us to challenge the status quo, to push the boundaries of possibility, and to envision a future where anything is possible. We embark on a journey of discovery. Let us embrace the power of knowledge as our guiding light, illuminating the path ahead with clarity and purpose. But knowledge alone is not enough. It is through cross-generational learning that we unlock its full potential. When the wisdom of the old meets the energy of the young, like, we, like we see, we've seen earlier today, magic happens. It is, in this, it is in this arena of collaboration that innovation thrives that solutions are found, and that progress is made. As current and former Guild leaders, we have a unique opportunity to bridge the gap between generations, to share our experience, and to impart wisdom to the leaders of tomorrow. Let us seize this opportunity with both hands, knowing that our actions today will shape the course of history 
for our generations to come. To fellow former and current good leaders, I issue a call of, to action. Let us rise to the occasion. Let us rekindle the flame of civic participation, reignite the spirit of activism, like I had today, and reclaim our rightful place as architects of change. Together, we can build a future that honors the legacy of those who came before us and pave the way for those who will follow in our footsteps. Let us embrace the power of knowledge. Let us unnest the energy of cross-generational learning, and let us leave a legacy that will inspire generations to come. Let us also recognize the vital role that this summit plays in shaping the course of our nation's history. It is not merely a gathering of minds, but a catalyst for change, a platform for innovation and collaboration. As we embark on this historic journey together, let us do so with a sense of purpose and determination, knowing that the decisions we make today will echo through the corridors of time. In conclusion, let me leave you with a quote that has guided us throughout this journey. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Let us believe in our dreams. Let us believe in our potential. And let us believe in each other. Together we can build a future that is brighter, bolder, and more beautiful than anything we have ever imagined. I thank you. Our dear chief guest, permit me to request you to have a group photo with this team because they won't be coming back soon. I kindly request. Thank you. The rest of us can smile for them so that they get the effect. <laughs> Asante. Thank you so much, Your Excellence. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, the organizing committee of our very first Guild Leaders Summit 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have our chief guest will be joining us in a bit. But just to re-echo, those who are going to be participating in other speeches, especially panelists, we are going to maintain time. Time is of instance. And while we are having these conversations, let's think about the election roadmap, because we have already started. The conversation is, is looking to that direction. So as leaders who are here looking at the legacy and cross-generational learning, I think we need to pay more attention to that. And again, for security purposes, please note, from the very first red chair to this pillar, this place will be out of bounds. So no one will be allowed to cross in front here. For the fourth estate, you know how to take your angles without interfering with the, with the security. So the fourth estate, we shall use that corner and this corner and God help you if you can come up here to get a shot. That will be the very last limit. So that addressed, allow me, Chief Guest, to welcome the former Minister of State of Finance and Privatization, Honorable Matthew Rukikaire, as well as the former Guild President of Makerele University to come and address us today. You're welcome. As he's making his way, when the Vice President arrives, we shall all stand up. We shall equally sound the anthems again. 
and then we shall go through the protocol and the speaker will follow suit. But for now, let's welcome Honorable Matthew Rukikaire. Just one minute to allow the vice president to come in, if you don't mind. Ladies and gentlemen, let me request that we all stand up and we welcome the vice president of the land. The DJ, I request that you get ready to sound the anthems as and when she's at her seating area. And for the rest of us, as she's walking in, we shall all join and clap and welcome her in a thunderous clap. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, join me as we welcome the Vice President of the Land, Her Excellency Jessica Alupo. Thank you so much for joining us on such a great occasion as we are having our inaugural Guild Leaders Summit 2024. Now that she's here, now that she's here, let's sound the anthems, please. In the interest of time, we can take our seats. Thank you so much, Madam Vice President. Now that you're here, allow me to give you a brief of what has transpired before you arrive, Madam President. We had Professor Sarah Sali, the Dean of School of Gender, Makerele University and Center for Excellence in Notions of Identity. We had a keynote address from the Justice Simon Biabakama, the Chairperson, Uganda Electric Commission. Again, we had from the EU Ambassador to Uganda, His Excellency Jan Sadek. Present with us, Your Excellency, we have His Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Tanzania, Jakaya Kikwete. With us, we have the former Prime Minister of Uganda, Honorable Hakana Rugunda, and we have the former Minister of State of Finance for Privatization, Honorable Matthew Rukikaire, standing right here with me. We have the EU Ambassador, Jan Sadek, we have the Uganda High Commissioner to Tanzania, Honorable Wright, a retired Colonel Fred Mwesije. We have members of parliament present. Among these we have Honorable Anna Adeke, the woman member of parliament, Soroti. We have the Honorable Mukasambide, Iyala MP. We have the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. We have the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Makerele University, Professor Henry Adinitre. We have the Guild Leadership of Makerele. We have the Uganda National Students Council Leadership. We have the National Youth Council Leadership here with us. We have the representatives of NDAs in the country. We have representatives of political parties and development partners present, as well as representatives of CSOs. Right now, Your Excellency, we are to hear from Honorable Matthew Rukikaire, who happens to have been the Guild President of Makerede in 1962. Thank you. The guest of honor, His Excellency Jakaj Kwete Murisho, former president of the Republic of Tanzania, her Excellency Jessica Alupo, Vice President of the Republic of Uganda, Right Honorable Dr. Rakana Rugunda, Excellencies, Students Leaders, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to stand before you once again and share a few thoughts with you 
at this great institution of learning as we launch the inaugural Guild President Summit. In my view, the highlight of this launch is the presence of His Excellency Jakaya Chikwete, former President of the Republic of Tanzania, as our guest of honor. <clears throat> Bear with me as I remind you of what I told you on a previous occasion. 60 years ago, in 1963, I stood on the rostrum of the main hall as Guild President of Makerere University to welcome Mwari Mujiria Sinyerere, the President of Tanganyika at the time, Milton Obote, the Prime Minister of Uganda, and James Gichuru, Minister of Finance of Kenya, representing Jomo Kenyatta, who was then Prime Minister of Kenya. The occasion was to launch the University of East Africa and mark the breakaway from the University of London. I proudly stood as a young person with the three leaders as we made historic statements. Benjamin Mkapa, later to become the president of the Republic of Tanzania, had graduated from Makere the previous year, in 1962, one year before I was elected president of the Guild by an East African constituency. Benjamin Mkapa, was to return to Makerere in 2009 to receive an honorary doctorate for his services to Tanzania and East Africa. Today, therefore, is another momentous occasion when we are hosting another former president of Tanzania, the fourth president of the Republic. His Excellency Jakaya Chikwete remains a focus of attention and interest in the region of East Africa and beyond. While on a state visit to Uganda in November 2006, President Chikwete pronounced himself unambiguously on the subject of East African integration project. He said, and I quote, the East African integration project gives concrete expression of the sentiments we share as East Africans, that we are one people and seek to free ourselves from the territorial imprisonment by historical circumstances, end of quote. The theme of this summit, legacy and leadership, the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning is a theme of enormous complexity. In it is encompassed what we learn at school as immutable truth science, philosophy, geography, history, etc. These are universal truths that apply to everyone, everywhere in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. The knowledge we are concerned about is what is required to create a stable, just, free, and democratic society and the conditions and circumstances to achieve this are variable and have been different from generation to generation from the beginning of time. Some of us lived and grew up under the indignities of colonial rule, and we are witnesses to the horrors of the Second World War in which our people were conscripted 
to fight wars that were not theirs. Leaders of that era were shaped by those circumstances which generated leaders suited to handle those problems. On the African continent, leaders like Nyerere, Jomo Kenyatta, Nkrumah, Mandela, Leopold Senghor, and many others emerged to deal with the problems of their time. Those young men and women of the time had to mobilize and agitate against colonial operations and then set about establishing structures to govern their countries with all the intricacies involved. That generation of leaders had their successes as well as failures. Our challenge today is to learn lessons from their successes and to devise means to deal with their failures. Who we are, those of us who are still alive from those generations have lived and operated in both pre-independence and post-independence eras. We can bring the experiences learned from the past to the present and help the present in shaping the future. As our passing generation is transgenerational, so must yours be the coming transnational generation. And your challenge is to manage the economic and political integration of East Africa and hopefully of Sub-Saharan Africa. This challenge is not a wish. It is an imperative and a prerequisite for the survival of Africa in the world. As part of the continuing celebrations of Makerere University to mark 100 years of existence, I was invited as a guest speaker by Makerere in March 2023 to honor its previous leaders, chancellors, vice chancellors, governing council members, and others. At that time, I dealt with the critical challenge of Africa's rapidly growing population and its implications. Permit me to raise the same critical issues again in this forum, and I quote, from my speech over that time. Available population data shows that Africa is in the middle of what one demographer has called the greatest democratic upheaval in the history of the world. According to researchers, by 2050, only 27 years from now, the world's population will be about 10 billion. Of that, Africa's population is projected to reach 2.5 billion, or 25% of the entire world population. Africa's population will have grown 11-fold in the century from 1950 to 2050. By comparison, Asia in the same period will have grown fourfold, India alone fivefold. In 1950, Africa represented less than 10% of the world's population, while Greater Europe, for example, presented 20% of the world's population. By 2050, however, 
Africa will represent 25% of the world's population, while greater Europe will have shrunk to 7% of the world population. Africa will contribute 65% of the global population growth between now and 2050, and will still be growing strongly. 12 countries in particular are growing at the highest speed and will double their population between now and 2050. These include Uganda, Tanzania, DR Congo, Nigeria, Niger, Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, Mali, Chad, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, and Burundi. Nigeria, for example, will double its population from the current 200 to 400 million in 2050. Uganda will also double its population from 45 million today to about 90 million. Kenya will also double from 50 to nearly the same, in 90 by 2050, as will Tanzania. Secondly, Africa today is also the youngest continent on the globe. The median age of Africa today is 19 years. In Asia, it is 32. In Europe, it is 44. In Uganda, the median age is only 16. 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25. By 2050, the population of East Africa and West Africa will both be larger than the greater Europe, which includes Russia. By 2050, 40% of the children being born in the world will be Africans and one third of the young people of the world, i.e. between 15 and 24, will also be Africans. 38 out of 40 of the youngest countries will be in Africa. So what are the implications of this astounding phenomenon? This kind of population growth can either be a curse or a blessing depending on how it is handled. With the kind of population growth that Africa is witnessing, we can either become the largest slum in the world and the most politically unstable region of the world, afflicted by hunger, disease, war, massive migration, other countries. On the other hand, if Africa prepares her youth well, this population growth will spur massive economic growth, placing Africa among the powerful nations of the world. As things stand today, 11 million African youth are being turned out into the labor market, but only 3 million new formal jobs are available for them, meaning that we already have a deficit of about 8 million. How then can we in Africa ensure that we reap this democratic dividend? How can Africa tap into the potential of these young people to grow its economies at a faster rate than its population are growing? How can Africa provide decent jobs, food, health care, housing, and infrastructure for its youth? We must think again. Education. Education is probably the single most critical sector for the future of Africa. Africa's youth must be educated and equipped with sufficient skills to navigate their way in the economies of the future. 
we must ask ourselves what curriculum changes are required in our educational system to prepare our young children to create the wealth needed to cater for this phenomenal growth of population? How can education be made more relevant to the economy? Regional integration. And that's one area where I think our guest of honor is going to be critical. We can say with confidence that with this kind of population growth, no African country will be able to meet the demands of its youth by itself. Regional integration of markets and economies and even politics is critical. If we integrate our countries and act together, it will be easier to achieve. Microeconomic stability. African economies have grown over the last 30 years, largely as a result of overcoming inflation by instilling fiscal discipline and maintaining microeconomic stability. A return to inflationary behavior and fiscal indiscipline would be disastrous for Africa's economies. This discipline must be maintained. One should not minimize the economic measures which have been put in place, especially in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, in the areas of customs union and cross-border movement of goods and people. But these are not enough by themselves and cannot overcome the problems highlighted above. After my address on the occasion of marking Makerere's 100 years and, discussing, uh, and discussion that followed with Makerere administration and council, it was agreed that a center to spearhead the search for solutions to the problems for the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, covering economic integration, population and demography, environment, and related technical training to support these efforts be established under the auspices of the Center of Excellence already in existence at Makerere. Finally, let me make yet another proposal to the Guild President's Leadership Academy to consider. I want to propose that as well as becoming the annual event this institution should be expanded to become an East African Leadership Academy. <laughs> and that His Excellency Jakaya Chikwete be requested to become the Academy's pat patron. <laughs> In closing, Your Excellency, I'm sorry to have to say that, but uh, I mean it. <laughs> in closing, let me say that in the distant past, knowledge was passed on to the younger generation through tales and conversations between the older men to the young men and older women to young women. These days, Knowledge is passed on through books and media technology. Your Excellency, our chief guest, permit me to present to you a book I wrote about three years ago entitled 70 Years as a Witness, which covers my experiences, some of which are relevant to what we are discussing today. Thank you, Your Excellency, for gracing this occasion with your presence. Uh, just one minute. So I'll, I'll be presenting the, this book when I come down. But before I come down, I have a person here who, in the last three days, has written a short poem, which is on about four or five minutes. And I want her to come here and read it because it is relevant to what I'm saying. And she's no other than 
Eva Marie Rukikaire. My daughter. Your Excellency, the former President of Tanzania, Your Excellency, Vice President Jessica Alupo, distinguished guests, all protocol observed. Good afternoon. My name is Eva Richikeire Mwine. I am a writer and a poet and a passionate uh, East African. This is a poem I've written, and it's entitled East Africa Rising. I am East Africa. I am the remnant of a history broken and old glory stolen. Partitioned like a pie at a conference table in Berlin, my kings and chiefs were handed pen and paper, mirrors and gold to relinquish customary hold. In the name of civility, they ceded liberty. Since then, I have walked for generations the untapped potential of my lands, choked in a white collar, encumbered by the heavy weight of ill-fitting imperial boots. Dry like a tree, severed from its ancestral roots. But I have survived. Today, I am an East Africa rising. I am eight countries integrating and still counting. I am over 300 million people with a median age of 19, I am bulging with youthful energy, and the world must contend with me. Like the Grand Inga Dam of the DRSC, I am an explosion of potentiality. I am gathering my broken parts, reclaiming the amputated limbs of my Congolese forefathers lost in the cruel harvest of rubber under King Leopold's plunder. I am contemporary Congo, a priceless aggregation of globally coveted wealth. I come to the union suspicious of my neighbors, but trusting in the higher ideals and promises of unity. I am South Sudan. I am armed with the genetics of determination that saw the Dinka and the Noor and other tribes stand through centuries of Arab domination and human rights violation. I am the voice of John de Mabior Garang, who famously said at the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Nairobi, let us move forward with the momentum of history. I am a Rwanda. Like a phoenix, I have risen from the ashes of genocide, defying international prescriptions. I soldier on in perfect imperfection. Conquering my history, I am recognized globally as a miracle story. I am Tanzania, standing on the shoulders of Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. I am de-tribalized and healthily politicized. Conquering the African conundrum of transition, I am Ali Hassan Winyi. I am Benjamin Mukapa. I am Jakaya Kikwete. I am John Pombe Magufuli. I am Samia Suluhu. My institutional headship of this union is indisputably legitimized. I am Somalia, a proud pilgrim from Africa's horn seeking to be reborn. With a history of anarchy, I am war-torn. My many aspirations have been stillborn. I come to the Union with my warring clans and my unfulfilled plans. I come with an ingenuity of enterprise and a mastery of money. I come with my warrior ancestry. I come with the fear of Allah and the discipline of Sharia. I am thousands of miles of coastline. I am the Union's bridge to the world. I am Burundi. The majesty of my drumbeat has never been silenced 
by the genocidal trauma of ethnic violence. I come to Arusha desperately seeking to change the trajectory of my broken story. I am Uganda. I have given massive impetus to the reassembly of scattered people. Domestically, I am a tangible manifestation of grassroots integration. My doors are wide open. My policies are accommodative. My people are politicized to be empathetic and receptive. Regionally, my span is monumental. With my boots on the ground, from the Great Lakes to the Horn, my impact has been instrumental. I am General Yoweri Museveni. Rehem Bogwenjura, I have kept the flame burning. I have kept the flame burning through the dewy seasons of feigning political will. The lens of hindsight and history may portray the long season of my leadership story as having been necessary for the restoration of lost glory and the mental rehabilitation of the African situation. I am Kenya. I wear the scars of historical rebellion like a proud medallion. Energized by the Mau Mau who shed blood for sovereignty, I am pushing the frontiers of economic emancipation and integrity of my people. With a skilled and professional workforce, I am at the vanguard of the region's race to middle income status, leading the way for others to follow. I am proving that the union can have a better tomorrow. I am East Africa rising, Asante Nisana. Your Excellency, that is uh, Honorable Matthew Lukikaire and the daughter. Let's appreciate them once again. In a special way, ladies and gentlemen, I want us to recognize Honorable Retired Colonel Fred Mwesije. Thank you so, so much for the support you've given to this agenda. Thanks for your relationship with Tanzania. And at large, at this juncture, allow me to welcome the Prime Minister Emeritus Ndugur Hakana Rugunde to come and welcome our chief guest. Okay, let's first do the photo moment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's welcome Honorable Hakan Argunda as he comes to address us. President Jakaya Chikwete, the Vice President of Uganda, Jessica Alupo, Ndugumathuru Chikide, who has obviously made an excellent presentation, distinguished friends in their respective capacities. We are constrained by time so we will endeavor to be as brief as possible so that the main and chief guest can give you his remarks before he goes to his next appointment. But let me straight away salute the Guild's uh, union for bringing all of us together and for discussing 
in my view, serious issues of institutional in character, but also of national and pan-African in nature. And I was extremely happy to see a guild president who received East African leaders 60 years ago here with us <laughs> to celebrate this important occasion. If there is any doubt, as I saw and had some doubts, whether one should join student politics or not, I think Matthew Ruchikeide stands out as an eloquent testimony that is right to do so. <laughs> Apart from what he has said and what he has written, you may know, Mr. President, that the 27 young men and women who held their guns and attacked Kabamba spent two or three days at Ruchikiri's house in Makimye before taking off to attack Kabamba. <laughs> so he has been able to put at the disposal of the people of Uganda his knowledge, his experience, and his resources. And in the war of liberation, the protracted people's war, he was the chairman of the external committee of the national resistance movement. So really have confidence. If you have question marks about student politics, dismiss them and get actively involved because that's important training for your future. I'm extremely glad that President uh, Chikwete is here with us. He's somebody who is extremely experienced in issues of the youth and student matters. He's somebody who has gone up the ladders from the ground to the top in Tanzania, who has served the people of Tanzania both in the military and in the uh, political space and has served his constitutional 10 years as president of Tanzania and with distinction. So we are extremely happy that we are discussing this with him and is going to give the main statement in another few minutes. But before I call him to do so, let me also say that apart from Matthew Ruchikeide, Makerere University has been able to produce people who have had indelible impact in the politics and other spheres in Uganda, in East Africa, and in beyond. I'll just give you a few illustrations. Our guild president, one of the guild presidents when I was at Makerere, was Professor Peter Anyangnyong. <laughs> Peter Anyangnyong is from Kenya. He is currently the governor of Kisumu. He has been the secretary general of ODM the biggest party uh, in, in Kenya in a way, apart from now the ruling party. And he did excellent work as leader of the Makere Students Guild. It did not matter during those days whether you are from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, or anywhere, so long as you had the credentials, you would amass the votes. You didn't have to be a member of party X, party Y, or party Z. You had to have issues. 
Apart from him, I also mention Dr. Noah Miguda, also from Kenya, who was president earlier. There have been other presidents, but let me highlight one point. It was hazardous to be a student leader at times in Uganda. During the days of dictator Idi Amin, student leaders endeavored but became difficult for them to operate. The last two who operated were General Kahinda Otafire contesting against Amama Mbabazi. It was a hot race. It became so hot and the regime of the day said, if we allow this heat to continue at Makerere, it may explode and cover the whole country. So the military dictatorship banned the guild elections. And for some years, the guild had no elected leadership. But uh, I must say, Makere has had big leaders. You have had President Jibachi of Kenya scoring a first class honors degree in economics at Makere. You have had Jaramoji Ojingo Ding, the leader, the traditional leader of opposition in Kenya during those days. Makere was the centerpiece for them. Marim Julius Nyerere came here to learn to be really a teacher. He spent some time here. He was coming from Butiama and it was not easy for Marim Julius Nyerere to frequently go back for holidays in Tanzania. So, one of the Ugandan families the Nkata family in the neighborhood of Makerere brought him in. Manim was helping teach them Swahili and they were helping him to learn some Luganda and the like. So the point I'm really stressing is that Makerere has been a center for training of East Africans, East Africans who have had a very, very important role to play. Challenges for the students. I'm glad that you people have started this initiative. I'm also happy that students of various universities are brought on board, although at the very beginning I saw them being overwhelming or overshadowed by Makere's mobilization. <laughs> Make sure you exercise your freedom without intimidating others. <laughs> so, I think you colleagues should identify your responsibilities, your tasks, your goals. It does not matter that you are still young. You can do great things even when you are still young. You saw Adek and others doing very well in the parliament, Mbide here, speaking the most uh, advanced English you can think of. <laughs> so, Start your life early while you're at Makerere. Plan, define on what you should do for yourself as an individual, for society, for the country, for the continent, and for humanity. I believe when you are clear with that, you will score heavily. As you know, you have had it a number of times. You were receiving as a student at Ntale. Him and some students started organizing pastoralists to be more settled instead of going all over the place 
uh, looking after cows. And that program of making the people central and look after their cows well has, over the years, transformed that part of Uganda into a very wealthy area simply because of being mobilized to look after their cows better and earn more money from them. Therefore, why on the is right that we are faced with a substantial challenge from many Africans and many Ugandans, we can get solutions for this challenge by starting early, working with the people, and being able to uplift the standard of living of our people, and as I said, them taking a lead role, and us playing a supportive role, and sometimes a guiding role. I would really want to, because of rushing, and the president of Uganda is waiting for President Chikwete. I would like to conclude by making just one or two points. Matthew Chikwete has made a proposal that this initiative by the summit of guild leaders is a very good idea and it brings a new umbrella organization that brings Ugandan university students together. But he went a step further and said, this is good for Uganda, but why shouldn't we make it good for East Africa? You had his proposal. Uh, the clappings appear to be few, so perhaps. So it is clear to me that Matthew Chikere's proposal of setting up an East African body of student leaders has been approved. Is that correct? <laughs> so really, it's a popular position. And Ndugu Chikwete, who is a very well-known friend and mobilizer of the young people of East Africa, should be requested to be the patron of this umbrella organization. So I think the leadership has a responsibility of pursuing this general wish of us all to have uh, the organization and to have our patron in place. The last comment I want to make. When we were in school, even at our age, we were complaining about colonial occupation. We are complaining, and we still do, about Berlin Conference. And I'm very happy that Eve, in her poem, pointed out this. We are, in effect, complaining against colonial barocanization. Isn't that the case? But how long shall we complain? Can't we do something about this? Obviously, we can. So one of the main tasks, in my view, of the student leaders, guild leaders, in Uganda and in East Africa should be to champion and sensitize people about the need for deepening East African cooperation and integration. If we do that, it will increase our capacity to be able to meet the challenge of population that Matthew Chikere was talking about. Therefore, we request you, the leaders of the student movement, in your respective capacities, to be the champions so that the dream of our forefathers can be realized. I say the dream of our forefathers because, as you know, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere said 
Tanganyika was ready to delay its independence so that Kenya and Uganda could get independence at the same time and federate. If this had been done, I believe that East Africa today would be better in terms of resources, income, uh, and development than what we are now. Instead, we spent a lot of time in a tug of war over petty issues. So since our forefathers advised us a long time ago to end balkanization, which all of us condemn, since they worked so hard to dream about it, to work about, to work for it, but did not succeed, in my view, they handed the baton to us to ensure that this goal of getting the people together once again is achieved. After all, the African people have always been together except the temporary period of colonialism and the boundaries. And instead of erasing the boundaries so that we are once again together, we decided to piously believe in them and take them as if they were ordered by the Almighty God. So let us have young men and women led by this summit mobilized in Uganda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in the eight countries of the community so that the people of the community can deepen their integration, can essentially become one people, can essentially become one country for the benefit of all of us. It's now my great pleasure, friends, to request our chief guest, chief speaker, and the distinguished Pan-African President Chikwete to make his remarks. President, you are welcome. Your Excellency Jessica Alupo, Vice President of the Republic of Uganda. Dr. Hakana Gunda, Prime Minister Emeritus, Demiano Masesa, the Executive Director of the Guild President's Academy, who is the one who has brought me here. Justice Biabakama, Chairman of the Electoral Commission of Uganda, Mr. Matthew, the Deputy Vice Chancellor representing, who is sitting in for Professor. Barnabas, Excellencies, Ambassadors, I see the EU Ambassador, the Tanzanian High Commissioner, all protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to begin by thanking Demiano for having me here. He wrote to me, 
but I think young people are very dynamic. He forgot to follow the protocols. <laughs> when I met Prime Minister Emeritus in Namibia, I said, I got a letter of invitation from the guild presidents, but it came straight to me. It's not easy for me to come to Uganda without the authorities knowing that I'm coming. I think the, the Prime Minister did something, when matters were regularized, so that's how I've been able to come. <laughs> Otherwise, it, the invitation has been around for quite some time. We are working with the problem. But I sincerely thank Makere University for receiving me well and making me feel at home. But special thanks goes to the government of Uganda for the very warm reception and gracious hospitality. Let me say that I commend those who conceive the idea of organizing this important event that brings together under one roof student leaders of different generations from all over Uganda. We have already here seen the first guild president of 1962 speak passionately about his exploits and about the many things that he has done for this university and for the country. I also commend the organizers for choosing a very opportune theme, legacy and leadership continuum, the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning. This theme is not merely an academic inquest, but an urgent practical necessity. The theme is, a profound, is of profound significance to Uganda and the East African region as a whole. This is because our region's progress and stability are tightly intertwined with the personal roles, contributions of successive leaders since early independence days to date. When we talk about legacy, we are not, only, we, we, we are not looking at the leaders' tangible accomplishments. Yeah? Oh, OK. So guess I should book here. So I can buy sana. I'm not young anymore. <laughs> so I drink a lot of water. Uh, but I, I was saying that when we talk about legacy, we are not only we all not only look at a leader's tangible accomplishments during the time on the office, but also the various the values they espoused and their vision of the future. We look at how they shaped long-term trajectory of the institution and society they lead. A good leader does this by, among other things, preparing other good leaders to follow in his or her footsteps. Today's subject matter should resonate well with most of you who have been student leaders during your time at the university. You have witnessed firsthand how knowledge, how knowledge and mentoring has the ability to shape minds and inspire change. You are prepared as the next generation of your time to take on the mantle of leadership. It is my belief that you were able to rise to the, to the, to the to expectation, each one of you in your own varied ways and capacity. 
since legacy is also about lasting impact, we leave behind. By extension, this also means that each one of you is indebted to grooming the next generation of leaders. You know, when Kwame Nkrumah died, Amilcar Cabral was the leader of the, the party PAGC that was fighting for the independence of Guinea-Bissau and Cap Verde. Spoke at that. He says we should not cry. We should not pre cry so much and, and, and create an impression that we are desperate. If we do that, Nkrumah, we will have failed Nkrumah. It means that he did not spend time to bring on leaders, young leaders, to take over from him. So that's why mentoring others, you are president today, the important thing is mentor others to become presidents better than you, if possible. This is where the power of knowledge and cross-generational learning comes into play. As leaders, it is our responsibility to impart knowledge, wisdom, and experience to those who come after us. We must serve as mentors and guides, nurturing the potential of future leaders and guiding them with the tools they need to succeed. Cross-generational learning is reciprocal. It's like a two-way street. It acknowledges the wealth of, wi of wisdom and viewpoints that each generation possesses. As past student leaders, you possess a reservoir of knowledge and experience that can enrich not only your contemporaries, but also the emerging leaders who are embarking on their leadership journey. Similarly, the newer generation injects in the leadership arena novel perspectives, creativity, and dynamism, infusing it with vitality and rejuvenated landscape. I had the privilege of being a student leader during my time at the University of Dar es Salaam. That time I was very militant, I can assure you. <laughs> but that is how young people are supposed to be. If you find young people behaving like old people, <laughs> you have lost it. <laughs> if I come back home and find my grandchild there, sitting on the couch, thinking. <laughs> and ask him, grandson, why, why do you behave like that? He says, I'm thinking about the world. Then everything is lost. At his age, he's supposed to be not all, <laughs> naughty, <laughs> climbing on tables, doing this and that. All that you have to do is to guide this young kid with, with force of reason, not the club or the whip, that I've passed through that experience. I once climbed that tree, I fell down, and I broke my arm. Or oh, I saw someone who climbed, fell down, and broke his arm. But I had the honor of serving as vice president of the Dar es Salaam University Students Organization 1973. It's a long time. I'm not young. <laughs> the looks are, are deceptive. I'm 74 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I joined the University of Dar es Salaam in 1972. Museven was there two years earlier. And he was red. 
was leading an organization called USARAF, University Students African Revolutionary Front. <laughs> 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 he has been very militant. They went to Mozambique during the war against the Portuguese. And they spent some time there. So at times he is what he is. <laughs> uh -huh. At that time, the University of Dar es Salaam had three campuses. The main campus at Dar es Salaam, University Hill. The College of Agriculture at Morogoro. And the College of Medicine at Muhimbiri. So we had a federal system. We elect a federal president of the organization. But each campus elects its own vice president and its own government. So the real authority was in the campus government. And the main campus was the largest. So I was, I was, I was the, the power broker. <laughs> at the time, at that time, this was the time of the intense liberation struggle. And this was the time when revolutionary ideas, that's when the university became like a melting pot. And if you speak about, you don't, you don't throw the line, we just call you reactionary. Leave them alone. And getting elected, was quite a hassle. It was not easy. You had to establish campaign teams. You had to establish strategists. And my contestant was Bagambire, a Ugandan law student at the University of Dar es Salaam. So it was a very close contest, but I prevailed. I prevailed through the democratic processes. I was elected. So after that, of course, I joined the public service. Fortunately, my talents probably were spotted very early on. There were instructions from the president. And at that time, I'd be taken to the party. <laughs> so that's, that is how life is. I was told, you've already been given a job. Don't feel in any form for asking for a job. I worked for the party for one year, and then I was taken to the military trained, became an officer of the TPDF, later became a trainer at our military academy. From there, one day, President Mwini called me and said, I've appointed you member of parliament and I appointed you to be deputy minister. I said, President, this being de member of parliament is fine. At least I know I can just go and talk in parliament. I can, I can, from my life as a student leader in the youth movement, but being deputy minister is something I, I really don't know. I, I've never worked in government. I've been in the military, in the party. What he simply said, you are young, bright. You'll make it. God bless you. <laughs> so that's, that's it. I 
started for deputy minister in 1988. I was 37 years old at the time. Two years later, I became minister for water, energy, and minerals. Then Minister of Finance, of course at the university I studied economics. Because I remember after I was appointed minister, at first when I was appointed a minister for energy and minerals, one ambassador from the big powers came and asked me, how does a military man be appointed as minister? I said, don't ask me. Ask the one who appointed me. But then from there, in 1995, when I was Minister of Finance, <laughs> I, I tried to get nominated for the presidential seat. And we did well. I won the first round. But when it came to the second round, I lost by about 40 votes. But President Mukapa became our candidate. But the young people were so disenchanted. They were so angry. Because after, 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 after the meeting we came out, we sat down with them. They were asking me, why did you support the candidate there at the conference? You should have waited. We come out, sit down, and agree how, how to support and on what conditions. I said, look here, I cannot, I cannot use that, that position of mine for trading in. I'm not trading in anything. We tried to be nominated. We lost by a few votes. The good thing about us is that what we should be, age is on my side. Age is on our side. <laughs> At 44, losing the nomination, he said, let's just support President Mukapa. He will be there for 10 years. In 10 years' time, I'll be 55. And if I remain bright, if I don't have scandals, then I'll be heir apparent. And that is precisely what happened in 2005. <laughs> I was nominated with overwhelming majority in the party and was voted overwhelmingly. But the important thing here is, is grooming. Training and grooming. Giving young people opportunities to learn from people who have the experience. I was lucky, at this very young age, I was uh, writing minutes of the meetings of the National Executive Committee of CCM and the Central Committee. These are the major policy decision-making bodies of, 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 of Tanzania, the system of one-party state at that time. Even on the day after we were invaded by a fund, I mean. I was, I, was, I was a lieutenant at that time. But I was writing minutes for the, of the meetings of them. When President Nyerere called the Central Committee to brief them on what has happened. That say one crazy man has just overrun our country, says he was correcting the colonial powers. He has now become a professor of geography and history. The border should have been at the Kagera River. 
He declared that whole salient the new Mishenyi district. He says, we have to get back our land. He called the chief of staff, General Kiwero at that time, to come and brief that meeting. I was there writing notes. After the briefing, we had discussions. There was an overwhelming note, let's go. The other thing he said, I'm going to declare war today. So of course he had his own way of uh, communicating. He would call the elders of Dar es Salaam to a big meeting. And that is where he made the announcement that our country has been invaded. We have to go and, and re reclaim our land. Uwezo tunayo, sababu tunayo, nania tunayo. Because there was a lot of discussion People asking the, you know, because Idi Amin was a marshal. <laughs> so he was just terrorizing. You know, when you see a field marshal, he was the highest rank. Because the, these, first, these generals are four star. The field marshal is five star. So he had finished everything and got on top of that. <laughs> Some were asking, asking the chief of staff, are you sure that we can, we can, we can, we can beat Idi Amin? Then Marim said, you, you guys, shut up. Have confidence in my army, we'll do it. So, and then after that meeting, he said to Jakaya, collect all these pieces of paper that these guys have been writing. Go and burn them, incinerate them, burn them, bring back the ashes. Why was doing that? Because they were writing notes about the forming a place, the, con the, the concentration areas, and so on. These are the military terminologies on how you, when you move to the battlefield and the start line. This is the briefing that the chief of staff had given. So I did that, came back. But at my age, I was just privileged. But they were just grooming me. You spot a talent, you bring that talent closer, you groom it for leadership, future. That's it. So, but the other thing is, is patience. When we lost in 1995, when young people were so angry, outside saying, CCM bye bye, CCM bye bye, CCM bye bye. And then we sat down. I sat down with them. We argued until we agreed that this is not our time. We should not force it. Age is on our side. If God has destined me to become president of this country, it will happen. And it, it happened in 2005. <laughs> on the other side, you, it, it could have happened if I were too ambitious, and because I knew that the, the base, that conference has so many young people. When you look at the conference, it's very young people, just like you people. Whatever you do when you have, we have another cycle of election, you always have young people replacing the old ones. Voluntarily, democratically. So for, for an old person to win against a young man is quite a challenge. That's why I won the first round, but I did not get to the threshold of over 50. When we came back, we lost. But the point I'm saying, if you give young people opportunity to work with elders, to work with seniors, you impart knowledge, experience with them in them. So that's how I became president. But when I was a young leader at various levels and ultimately become president, 
I witnessed firsthand the transformative power and impact of education and leadership on individuals, communities, and nations. Investing in education and empowering young people to become learned leaders is the surest way of driving social economic growth, promoting social cohesion, and fostering peace and stability in the region in a sustainable manner. So it is up to those in leadership to identify young people, train them, groom them, as some of us had the little opportunity to be. But I'm saying, fortunately, after my retirement from the presidency, I continue to be involved in education. I've been involved in, in many, many things, but let me mention three. The first is the Harvard University. That Harvard University asked me to join in the steering group committee of a program they call the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program. This is a program for training ministers perform better and deliver better. You know, this is a huge university. It is 390 years old, that one, when we boast of Makerere being the oldest university in East Africa, but Harvard is 300 plus years. They've developed very elaborate curriculum for training ministers. In April, we, we work with ministers of finance. In, uh, in September, we work with other ministers of education and health. Fortunately, Uganda ministers are participating actively in, the, in this program. But it's, some of us are there to share our experiences. I've been minister, I've been minister of finance, been minister of foreign affairs, but at the same time, I've been president. So I'm there to share that experience. It's, it, this, this is how mentorship is. It is not a question of giving somebody a piece of paper right now, I'm mentoring you. is working with them, where you have peers discussing. You have case, case loads from Latin America. You have case loads from Asia, sharing their experiences. And at, at the end of the day, every minister is asked, you have finished this program. Write and report. What is it is going to be your first day thing when you meet the president the first time after, after this course, what are you going to report? So everybody is there pre presenting, and the others are discussing. They, they, pick ho they pink, pinch holes in some of the proposals, but that is how the whole program really works. But also, I'm chairman of the board of the Global Partnership for Education. This is the largest fund, this is the largest partnership and fund in the world dedicated solely to assisting low and lower middle income countries in advancing their education. We are active in Uganda as well. If you're going to ask the ministry, they know. We are active, we are in, active in 89 countries in the world. We assist these countries, develop their programs, structure, structural issues. It is them who decide. We want support in this and this and this. It's training of teachers, support of school infrastructure. It all depends upon them. It's a budget to, it's a budget to $5 billion. It's a small by, 
by those standards. It is based at the World Bank. It was established by the G7 20 years ago. And in those 20 years, it is the first time an African has been made a chairman. <laughs> Otherwise, it's an American, a European. I took over from Julia Gillard, the former prime minister of Australia. The institution they established, but it is doing a lot of work in our countries. And when you have time, Madam Vice President, ask the people in the Ministry of Education, they will brief you. We do a lot of work in Uganda as well. But the last engagement is my president, Magufuli, and after his death, President Samia appointed me to be chancellor of the University of Dar es Salaam. <laughs> so I am, I'm here in my other capacity now. But our goal in universities to ensure that all our graduates are equipped with the competencies and skills needed to succeed in the dynamic landscape of the 21st century. The world has changed a lot. During our time, we'd go to the bookshop and buy books. These days, all the books are online. A lot of the knowledge and information is in the internet. So working under those, under those environment is quite, 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 quite challenging, but we are trying our best. So I'm glad the scope of this summit has extended beyond the legacy and the importance of passing the torch from one generation to the, to the next. Because when I got that as a theme, I was a bit worried. And I said, I'm going to suggest. But hearing the panel, hearing the discussions, you have gone beyond that. There has been broader discussions and reflections on the responsibilities of leadership, on the point that come with leadership. Through good leadership, let me say, Institutions and nations have made enviable progress. But where there is a deficit of good leadership, there is either stagnation or complete lack of progress. So I'm glad you are discussing these issues and you have put leadership at the center of, of, of the discussion. There is no replacement for leadership. Luckily, generations of leaders who have, show, have shown that where there is a strong and committed leadership, progress is, is, a, is achievable. President Nyerere once said, it can be done, play your part. If all of us play our part correctly, it can be done. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to visit Makerere University for the first time. I've been around for a long time. <laughs> but I've had no opportunity. Of course, during the time of um, I was a leader in the, in the university, we had a lot of interaction. The Dar es Salaam University, Nairobi University, Makerere University Guild. And we've been working in solidarity, I can assure you. <laughs> I have not told this to, to Uhuru, but there was a time there was a problem with the Kenyan government and the students at Nairobi University. Because all the time, our colleagues who went to Nairobi University would take longer to finish the degree. Because after some time, they fight with the government, <laughs> they, get, they get sucked. And they come back, after some time they, they start again. So there was a time there was a rumor that there was a fight and a student was killed.
So we sent our president in solidarity with our colleagues in Nairobi University. I was left behind to organize a silent march at the university and make fire a speech <laughs> condemning the government bureaucracy and their brutality against the students. <laughs> Just as I'm hearing some, some of you guys here say. <laughs> so I made my speech. The envoy we sent landed, got into a taxi, landed at Nairobi University, and the police took him back into the taxi, took him back to the airport, back to Dar es Salaam. <laughs> <laughs> but at least we were able to demonstrate to our colleagues in Nairobi that we stand with you in solidarity. So, we are not seeing that anymore these days. Students organizations working together within the East African context. I don't know what has happened. You are the students, organizers, you are the student leaders. You should answer this question, what has happened? That you become so inward looking, I, I don't know. So this is one thing that I would really suggest to you guys, develop cooperation with other student organizations in the other universities in East Africa. You need it. Not necessarily like in our times when, when the government of Kenya beats the, that we sent a delegation. No, you just meet and exchange ideas. And exchange ideas, how things are working. I mean, the experience of another organization may, may be useful to another university organization. So this is, this is the other thing. But the other thing which, when I made the leadership yesterday, I said the same thing that you said, that maybe the other universities should emulate the example of Makerere. On, on, the, on, on, the, on this wonderful initiative of bringing together the former presidents and guild leaders and one roof like this one and talk about, about themselves, exchange, exchange ideas and experiences. So that's wonderful. Whether that academy <laughs> I'd be the patron or not is a matter we, we have to discuss that. We'll have to discuss that. You know, there was a time I was, I was elected chair, patron of the ULID Summit. Under the, under the auspices of the East African, East African community. I got a letter from the Secretary General of the EAC that we've been invited to, to a meeting of the youth this is a meeting of youth of the, of the whole of the East African community. So I go there, and as I arrive there, I say, patron, patron, patron. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what you guys, what is this? We have already chosen you, patron. <laughs> no, such pressure, you know, you cannot say no to young people. I love them. I grew up from that. From that I come from that part. I've been a youth activist a long time. I've said very little about some of the exploits I had when I was a young man. At times, we, there was a day we were, President Yerel called us to stay to State House and gave us a dressing down. I've never seen that, that old man become so angry with the university students. He says, you guys are not kids. Kids are in primary school. When I deal with university students, I deal with grown-up people. So you guys go back and behave. <laughs> so we stopped a lot of the nonsense that we are doing. <laughs> but I'm saying we have to discuss that. I'll also see the program that I have. But saving the youth of East Africa is something that I, I gladly enjoy saving. So. 
let's, let, let's agree on the modalities. What is it that is expected of a patron? You know, I'm retired. I'm spending my time in the village. I grow pineapples. I keep a few cows, not like you as the big and collect no, small ones. <laughs> so I, I need plenty of time to be to be there on my farm. Otherwise, if you are not there, things don't don't go well. But I said I'm I'm happy. This is the first time. But I'm proud to say that Makerere is the first university to be established in East Africa. So I can rightly say that Makerere is the credo of higher education in East Africa. There is no denying that. Nobody can take it away from you. You were there before the others were born. The event that uh, Matthew spoke about, the 1963 event of the launch of the University of East Africa. That university was launched, but it had three campuses, Makerere, Dar es Salaam University, and Nairobi University. But the main campus was here in Makerere. It's the oldest university. Dar es Salaam cannot take it. Dar es Salaam was, was established in 1961. Nairobi, at that time, it was called the Royal College, Nairobi, colon, very colonial name, yes. It was later after independence, they, they turned it to Nairobi University. But I think about three, three years before, before Dar es Salaam. So they not have the, the credentials and the gravitas of being the main campus for this. And Makere University has done very well. It was part at that time of the London University. But later countries, seven years later, in 1970, countries said, no, let's go our separate ways. The University of East Africa was dissolved. Makerere became an independent university. Dar es Salaam an independent university. And Nairobi an independent university. When the University of West Africa was established, Julius Nyerere was the chancellor. So we lost the chancellor of the uh, chancellorship of the University of Dar es Salaam. But you can see. But the other, the other unique thing which I really want to, to mention here, the importance of, of this solidarity. At that time, the three universities either by design or just by chance, had allocated specialization. Makerere University was specializing in producing medical doctors. All of the senior doctors in East Africa are graduates of Makerere. Be they in Kenya, in Tanzania, here in Uganda, they are graduates of Makerere University. That's why the, the medical school here is the premier medical school in East Africa. Dar es Salaam was assigned to prepare lawyers. All the senior lawyers, not, 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 not the second generation, all trained out of Dar es Salaam University. Amos Wako, the former Chief Justice of Kenya. I think the former Chief Justice of Uganda as well. There was a time I met him. They all trained in, trained in Dar es Salaam. So all lawyers in East Africa were being trained in Dar es Salaam. And the engineers 
in Nairobi. Because it started as a technical college and then became a university and that was their line of specialization. Well, we have, we have to look back and see how our universities can, can really collaborate exchange experiences, see how best we can, we, we can do our things. So we've come a long way. But let me speak about something which Matthew mentioned. the East African Integration Project. <clears throat> but of course we, apart from that specialization, other disciplines were there. But this university became a center of excellency in medicine. Nairobi, a center of excellence in engineering. Dar es Salaam, a center of excellence in law. But all these other disciplines were, were being taught. Julius Nyerere came out a teacher from here. Benjamin Mkapa learned political science in the English language. Now you can see how his English has been. So it must be quite competent here. Yes. Mwai Kibaki, trained here as an economist. I don't know if what Raila, what Jaramogi Odinga Odinga studied. Yeah? Diploma in education. But As I said, let me talk about the East African Community Integration Agenda. When we talk about, when we, when we talk about legacy in leadership, when I was a president, let me go back to legacy. When I was president, when I appointed people, and this is one of the issues at Harvard, everyone talk about his legacy. I told them I've appointed you minister of this ministry. The thing should always work on your mind is that what will people remember me for after I leave this ministry? You should take pride that I've been president of Tanzania. What is it that the people of Tanzania will remember me for? That is so the legacy itself. So, I would take some interest, I would talk to you about the African integration agenda. Fortunately, Yoweri Kaguta Museven, President of the Republic of Uganda, has made and continues to make an incomparable legacy in this regard. That's the honest opinion of East Africa. President Museven has been the bedrock of the current East African cooperation and integration process. His unwavering commitment to it has been keeping the flame glowing, as, as the poet was saying. The East, the East African integration agenda has had its lows and highs, its ups and downs. We had a vibrant community. But died in 1977. 
The cooperation and integration was started by the British colonialists. The first customs union between Kenya and Uganda was established in 1917. Because Kenya, Uganda were British colonies. They established that. Tanganyika joined later after, because we were a German colony. Then the, the, the League of Nations gave Tanganyika to be overseen by the British. In, 20, 20, in 1927, Tanganyika joined that. But it was the British that established the Tanzania, the, the, the East African Post and Telecommunications, the East African Railways and Harbors, the East African Airways, all these institutions were created by the, by the British colonial powers. And the governors of the three countries met in 1948 and established what came to be known as the East African High Commission. Just to, to, to be the, the leadership, to, to mobilize and organize all this. But come 1961, because of the way the, the independence movement was going, when it became evident that our countries will be independent, and Tanganyika would be the first one in 1961, 1961, the powers that be transformed the Af African High Commission into the East African Common Services Organization. So at independence, our countries inherited the East African Common Health Services Organization. But our leaders were not satisfied. It's an organization that was created by the colonial powers the occupation powers. They commissioned a study, and that study came up with a recommendation, which ended up with the establishment in 1967 of the East African community. Of course, all these gains that were made during the, the period were incorporated. The community worked hard in the first few years, but then Squabbles began between the, the partner states. There were nasty exchanges between Kenya and Tanzania. And here in 1971, the general took over. And Yerere said he's not going to sit at the same table with Idi Amin. So, so, and then there are so many other things in between. I don't want to bother you. I've taken too much of your time. In July 1977, the community died. After that, somebody called Dr. Victor Umbrich was appointed mediator on the dispersal of the assets and liabilities of the defunct organization. He did this work in 1986. He presented his report. But in that report, one, one, one close proposal was that East Africa, things have fallen apart, but East Africa should explore ways of cooperation. And you know, this was when Museveni came to power. So the three leaders, Museveni, Moi, and Ali Hassan Mwini, sat and discussed this proposal. Should explore ways of cooperation. It should not be, well, I'm a Muslim, and for us, when you, when you divorce, you get divorced, if, you, if it is three divorces, 
then there is no way of, of, of saying I want my wife back. She has first to be married and get divorced. That's when you can go and claim her. So you can just <laughs> connive with somebody alone. <laughs> when marry my wife for, <laughs> for a month and then divorce her, I want her back. But if you want to create an opportunity for discussion, for negotiation, you only give only one, one divorce ticket. That's it. So the proposal by Walter, by, by Dr. Victor Umbridge, is that it should not be three divorces where you cannot, you cannot, you cannot come back. You cannot come back. It has happened. Explore ways. So that is where our leaders. And that's why I said President Museveni has been bedrock of the East African integration agenda. And he, that's what the time when he was president, and he worked hard with, with his colleagues. And that working, in 1993, they signed the treaty establishing the East African Tripartite Commission on cooperation. 1996, the style of the secretariat was, was established. I was foreign minister at that time. That's why I remember all these dates, because I've been, what was it, I've been doing the cooking? No. I was just part of, part of, part of this process. In 1996, the Secretariat of the Tripartite Commission was established. Mudaura was the Secretary General. Nahamia of Uganda was the Deputy Secretary General. And Kazaura of Tanzania was the Deputy Secretary General. We had a Secretary General and two deputies. We had this Council of Ministers. As foreign ministers, we attend that one. A year later, we were given marching orders that by, 19, by 1999, we want our community back. Because in the Tripartite Commission, it's just cooperation. You discuss about road safety, road, road standards, how much the tonnage on the roads, you discuss cooperation in health, in, in justice, and so on. But then we want the East African community back. This is now is the stage of integration. Let's move from cooperation to integration. We commissioned a consultant. They came up with a proposal. And this proposal, this is why I want, I, I want us to, to know exactly what, what, what has been going on. In the treaty establishing the East African community, yes, we agreed the entry point is a customs union. Because in cooperation, it's just cooperating. But in integration, we are now trying to weave the economies of our three countries into one economy. And there are benchmarks. The first benchmark is what they call preferential trade area or the free trade area. When you allow goods from member states to move across the borders at zero tariff, no customs duty. After that, we have the stage of common external tariff, CET, area. You are now erecting an external wall to protect your region against externals, to, de to defend yourself against unfair trade. 
So some start with PTA or FROP and others. But we in East Africa said we are going to combine the two stages together at the same time. Free trade area and the common external tariff. Free trade area and the common external tariff is what, by definition, is the customs union. A customs union has to have these two. Free movement of goods and common external tariff. So we started that stage. That's why you will see in Comesa, they only have free trade area. Common external tariff and therefore they don't talk about a customs union. We got orders to have the customs union signed before 2005, starting in 2005. So we had to work hard. Those who happened to have been there, I think Rebecca was there, uh, the late um, Elia Kategaya was there, yes. That last day, the presidents had come. They want to sign the customs union in the morning. We had not yet agreed. And, his, <laughs> and the story is, when we were just about to conclude, they wanted exempted from, from tariffs. Oh, I was chairing that meeting. I can assure you, we had that meeting until daybreak. All day, all night, daybreak. Because the presidents were already, were already waiting to sign the, the protocol on the customs union. Fortunately, wisdom prevailed. We agreed on modalities. Our Ugandan brothers were accommodative enough. That's how we were able to, to, to move forward. So we came to the customs union. There is something which we, was built in, in the customs union. When goods move freely across the borders, there is the principle of rule of origin. That I cannot import goods from China, repackage, and write made in Tanzania. That to be cheating, diversionary of trade. That's why there is a principle of rule of origin that you have to prove that a certain percentage of the product, I think it is about 60% of the production of that product has, is originating from Tanzania. So that's, that's it. The other thing we built in was what came to be called variable geometry. That an economy, it is done everywhere, even the, the EU ha have been doing it. The economy that is stronger bears a bigger burden for some time to allow the weaker economies to grow. In our arrangement in East Africa, the Tanzanian and Ugandan economy were weaker compared to the Kenyan economy. So when, when, we, we, when we establish the, the common external tariff, we said, Goods from Kenya entering the Ugandan and the Tanzanian market will have to fetch tariffs. But what we've been doing is we've been graduating them downwards so that by the end of the five years, also goods from Kenya will, will move across the borders, zero tariff. These are some of the undercurrents which you, you may not know. You know just they're celebrating. But they've been a lot of work. And our Kenyan brothers were a bit difficult, but we have to say, look here, there is no way. The EU has supported Ireland, supported Portugal, Greece. For, for them, it was 15 years. For us, it was only been five years. In order to give them an opportunity to grow. And that's why in the financial crisis, 
You'll find again it is these weak economies of Greece, Portugal, and Spain that suffered the most. So this is, this is, this is what has happened. So behind those closed doors, <laughs> there's been a lot that is happening. Of course, we agreed after that, we move on to the customs, to the common market. Because people use this interchangeably, but the common market by, by definition of integration. In the, first, in, the FT, the, in the first stage of free trade area, it is free movement of goods. In common market now, it is free, free movement of services, free movement of people, free movement of capital, also the tricky question has been the right for resettlement and relocation. That when you find the Tanzanian getting a job here in Uganda, you don't have to ask him, why are you here? That's the customs. The, uh, that's the common market. That's why in EU, the Romanians are everywhere. One of the things that incensed the British was the idea of the people from Poland, from Romania, flooding the, the job market in England. They want them out. So the best way is to get out of the, out of the community. I'm not sure if they have succeeded. So that, that's it. Again, in the, in the, because of sensitivities, there are certain things that have been agreed on how to, pro to proceed. Every country has been asked, which jobs are you ready to, to seed them to, to East Africa? No country has said all the jobs. <laughs> Every country has said, this one, yes, this one, no, 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 no. This one is for Uganda, this one for Tanzanians only. But we gave ourselves, I think, time of five years for, for, for everything to be in order. From there, in 2013, this, this common market was signed in 2010. In 2013, we signed the Monetary Union. What we've been doing as, as East African countries is harmonization of fiscal and monetary policies. But when it comes to the monetary union, it's not harmonization. It's common fiscal and monetary policies. It's not easy. Because fiscal and common fiscal and monetary policies, you agree what percentage of the GDP is going to be the borrowing. You cannot just say, you know, I, I, I want to raise money, so I'm going to borrow from the banking system. And uh, the monetary union, you have to apply. This is what they're doing in the European Union. I think it's, it's worth 3%. Nobody can, no country can borrow beyond 3%. But in that one, we gave ourselves 10 years to transit into the monetary union which would also mean common currency and so many other things. 10 years have passed now. I don't know how far we are, but it's still this thing in discussion. In, in, in other economic integration gr groupings, the monetary union is the highest. But for us, in East Africa, we said the highest will be the political integration, the East African Federation. That is work in progress. So my humble appeal to you young people of East Africa, I've taken you slowly through these stages. We've covered a lot of ground. 
On the other stages, we still have problems of non-tariff barriers. We have to sort out non-tariff barriers. But the stages we have to now focus on is the monetary union and the political federation. This is where you have to shout to be counted. Make noise as young people of East Africa to be counted. And I see the importance of you people from East Africa, universities coming together, a voice from the universities, calling on the leaders to expedite the process and move fast, complete the monetary union stage, and move fast to the final stage, and after that, move fast to the political federation. This is where I'm saying President Museveni has been the bedrock, and he has been doing a lot of work in convincing the other leaders to move fast as possible through those stages and get to the political federation. Well, it's taken a lot of your time, but I thought, let me share this. These are some of the things you, you may not be able to get in your, in your classroom. These are the things that you get from those of us who have been in the kitchen cooking. It has not been easy. But it is through consultation and talking. The last thing I would like to comment on, which is not in my notes, is the discussion I, I, I heard here about political organization and political activity at the university. Well, countries are different. We have had that experience in Tanzania. But our problem, the problem we had was now even lecturers became political activists. <laughs> they, come, they come to the classrooms dressed in their party uniforms. We thought this was just a bit too far. So we said, okay, fine. The students are free to be members of the political parties of their choice. But they will not organize at the university. All political parties have been allowed to establish branches outside, and they will do their political activity outside. So for us in the Uni University of Dar es Salaam, there is a place called the Abiyani. We have a huge branch there. We do that. But the point is, is, is that you, you spoke about Anyang Anyong having been president of the guild. If you politicize, the university seizes it, its international character. Because Anyang Anyong cannot become a member of UPC. He could not become a member of DP. So that's, you know, there, there is, just think about it. The only thing that I find is completely prohibiting students from participating in the politics of their parties, that's fine. But politicizing the, 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 the whole university, well, it's something, of course, countries are different, but this has been our modality. This has been our modality, and it is working well. There are, there are universities where CCM has lost leadership to the opposition. There are, there are, there are universities where CCM has been in leadership. We support our, 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 our cadres there quietly, but not organizing inside the university. But I think the situation is different. If, if you, you make this one, this university, a bedrock of political activity. I'm sure you, 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 may, you may even choose lecturers. This one is not from our party. We don't want him. 
And the teacher can also say, ah, this one is from, is this one a card of Bobby Wine? He will fail this exam. <laughs> so, but this is for you to, to, to think. I, I've just shared our, our experience. We've had that experience, and this is how we manage it. But Uganda can, can manage it differently. Well, I took much more time than, than expected. But I thought, let me once again thank you, Emiano, and your colleagues for having me here. As I said, it's important to be here. I also had the opportunity to visit the Julius Nyerere Center. I've seen it. When I go back, I'll talk to my president, and let's see how the Tanzanian government also can, can contribute to making it better. With those many words and stories, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. But before you leave, I understand your schedule is very tight. But let's have these few group photo moments, and then we shall allow you to leave. We can take our seats, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to request the following individuals. They're going to come up here for a photo moment. I'm going to request the first panel that was up here to come and take a photo moment. And this included Honorable Anna Adeke, Honorable Priska Najiro, Christopher Kidi, and Honorable Fred Mukasambide. Please let's be very fast in the interest of time. And while they are coming, Etiang Frederick, Mariam Ichulet Arikosi, Moses Kidega, and His Worship Matanda Bubeka equally be coming so that we save time. And finally, we shall have Honorable Namazi Olive, Nabasa Shamim, Honorable Doreen Nyanjura, Bashira Nantongo to come. Please, all those that have read, please let's come very fast for a photo moment. Let's be very snappy. In the interest of time. All panelists, please come for this photo in the interest of time. All panelists, let's all join and we have one group photo for all panelists. Tanzanian students in Uganda, make it very fast, the leaders. Thank you so much, the panelists. Thank you so much, the panelists. Let's have the students, please. Very fast. All right, let's have this photo. And this should be the very last one before we have the awards and the portrait and then the distinguished leaders will have a photo moment later. Let us spread, let's spread. There is still, there is still space. Please don't be behind the president. Let's all stretch this side. Okay, let's do it this way. Let's just make two groups. Let me first have the group on the left, Kwanzaa. The ones on the right, you can take some 
Let's start with the, the group on the left, Kwanza. Please. Thank you. Let's have the second group. The first group you can you can leave the stage. Thank you. If you're in the first photo, please leave the group. <laughs> Come on, people. Let's be very civil. The ones who are done, please. Let's leave the stage. Thank you. Let me welcome Mr. Damiano Masasa to come and award this particular portrait, Your Excellency. This is to appreciate you for believing in this agenda from the very first time. His Excellency, retired Colonel Fred Mwesiji reached out to you. There is an award to be presented to Your Excellency by Mr. Masasa Damiano there. Okay. Let's give it a round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabrina Chitaka, for supporting this as well, and Damiano, the executive director of the Guild, Leaders Academy. Your Excellency, there is still a portrait for you, and this should be the very last one. The portrait. Your Excellency, this was done by Brian, and he's here, the painter, Ainamani. Brian Ainamani. Oh, he's here. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Asante. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you so much, sir. Allow me to welcome Honorable Rugunda again to do the rest of uh, the nitty gritty. Let's give a round of applause to His Excellency Jakaki Kwete. Such an honor with great speech. Uh, Your Excellency President Chikwete, friends, it's now my great pleasure to invite Her Excellency, the Vice President of Uganda, standing in for President Wilm Seveni to come and make her statement on behalf of the president. Your Excellency Jakaya Chikwete, the former President of the United Republic of Tanzania, the Right Honorable Ruhakana Rugunda, the Prime Minister Emeritus of Uganda, Your Excellency Colonel Fred Mwesije, Uganda's Ambassador to Tanzania, your Excellency John Sadek, the European Union Ambassador to Uganda, the Honorable Members of Parliament, 
Your Lordship Simon Biabakama, the chairperson of the Uganda Electoral Commission, development partners present, and members of the civil society organization, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, the vice chancellor of Makerere University, and indeed all the management and administration of MAC, leaders of political parties, the Gill president of Makere University, and indeed all Gill presidents present, and all the Gill leaders and former Gill leaders, all invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, I'm here with a short message of His Excellency, General Yorika Gotam Seveni, the President of the Republic of Uganda, who I got notification over the weekend to come and represent here in this August ceremony. I bring all of you warm greetings from His Excellency the President. Over the weekend when I got the notification, I sought guidance from him on how I should proceed today morning, and he guided that I start with cabinet. The reason I came here when the program had already started. And Your Excellency, by the time I was leaving cabinet, he was also announcing that he's stepping out to meet you. So I recognize that we are really time constrained, but at the same time, I am carrying his message. And therefore, I request Your Excellency that you allow me to present his message. But I would like to thank the management of Makere University for keeping this homely place in shape, both in terms of the quality of learning and teaching, and in terms of the organization. Your Excellency, I was here in 1994, and I feel very privileged to be here tonight because this is home. <laughs> the Right Honorable Hakana Rugunda has named the number of leaders who have passed through Makerere University, including His Excellency Benjamin Mkapa. His Excellency Julius Nyerere, His Excellency Mwai Kibaki, who I was with here to launch his library when I was a Minister of Education. So I would like to add, Your Excellency, that with the presence of the team from the, Repub the United Republic of Tanzania, I resided in the hall called the Complex Hall at that time, where His Excellency Julius Nyerere resided when he was in this university. So we who were residing in that hall used to feel very proud because Julius Nyerere is an exem exemplary leader across Africa. And we actually used to boast that we are like him. Though I was in a class of political science and it was a class of it was in a class of education. Having said that we are really time constrained, let me now read the message of His Excellency the President. I thank the organizers of the inaugural Guild Leaders Summit for inviting me to join you today. In a special way, I welcome my brother, His Excellency Jakaya. Chikwete, the former president of the United Republic of Tanzania, and I thank him for gracing this important summit of student leaders and young intellectuals. The inaugural Leaders Summit 2024 has been convened under the theme, Legacy and Leadership Continuum, the Power of Knowledge and Cross-Generational Learning. I am one of the pioneers of organized student leadership in East Africa. I started working on changing the people around me, changing Uganda through the student movement. And in 1968, our student group visited the liberated areas of Mozambique, 
while still a university student. Our student groups in the mid-1960s triggered the resistance against sectarian politics. Therefore, I recognize the importance of student leadership. However, it must be anchored on correct ideas by making a correct diagnosis of the problems of society and how to solve these problems. It is therefore important for young leaders to understand the challenges and bottlenecks that precipitate social backwardness and engage in efforts to address those challenges. Our student movement was able to identify 10 bottlenecks to Uganda's development, and they include ideological disorientation, a weak state, especially the army, underdeveloped infrastructure, i.e. the railways, the roads, electricity, telephones, piped water, ETC. The underdevelopment of the human resource, lack of education and poor health for the population. Interfering with the private sector, either by policy or by corruption. A fragmented African market on account of colonialism. Exporting unprocessed raw materials and therefore getting little money and losing jobs. This was caused by lack of industrialization. The underdevelopment of the services sector, e.g. hotels, banking, transport, and insurance, ETC. The underdevelopment of agriculture. And the attack on democracy. Your Excellency, after many years of struggle, peaceful and armed, and analysis, the NRM evolved four principles to address the above challenges, and these are patriotism, non-sectarianism of religion or tribe, no suppression of women, and no marginalization of the youth, the disabled, the underdeveloped areas such as Karamoja, ETC, ETC. Pan-Africanism, working for the Federation of East Africa and beyond, as well as the common market of Africa in order to guarantee greater prosperity and strategic security. The unity of the market of Uganda is not enough to guarantee our prosperity. A bigger market means greater pros prosperity and strategic security to defend our sovereignty against the imperialists. Social economic transformation. So as to change Uganda from being a peasant society into a middle income class. Skilled working class society in order to benefit from Pan-Africanism and from Uganda's unity, the society must undergo a group of metamorphosis socio-economic transformation. In our case, Your Excellency, this means transitioning from the pre-capitalist or subsistence mode of life to the modern money economy and eliminating bystanders or spectators in the drive towards increasing the household incomes and creation of jobs. As more and more Ugandans wake up and select profitable enterprises in the four sectors of commercial agriculture, industries, services, and ICT, production of Ugandan commodities and services will continue to go up. Therefore, it is easy to observe that in the long run, our internal market of 45 million people is not enough. Already, with just little waking up of a few Ugandans, we now have surplus milk, sugar, bananas, etc. Finally, ensuring the development of democracy. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I invite the young leaders gathered here today to make a critical study of the above bottlenecks and how to apply the NRM's principal solutions to these challenges. This will enable you to make a meaningful contribution to social economic transformation of our country. 
In today's rapidly evolving world, knowledge is more than just information. It is a currency of progress. It empowers you to innovate, to adapt, and to overcome the challenges that lie ahead. But knowledge is not static. It is dynamic and ever-changing. And it is through cross-generational learning that you can unlock your full potential. Cross-generational learning is not merely about passing down knowledge from elders to youth. It is a two-way exchange, a dialogue between experience and innovation. It is about harnessing the wisdom of age and the energy of the youth to forge a brighter future together. In this room, we have leaders from different backgrounds, different walks of life, each bringing their unique perspective to the table. By bridging the gap between generations, we create a synergy that propels us towards driving innovation and fostering inclusive growth. Finally, I urge you to harness the power of knowledge, embrace the spirit of cross-generational learning, and build a legacy of leadership that will stand the test of time. I thank you all. That is the message of His Excellency the President. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Let's give a high round of applause again. Your Excellency, before you depart, allow me to invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Makerele University, Professor Henry Adini, to give a vote of thanks to both of you. You're welcome, Deputy. Let's welcome our Deputy Vice Chancellor. His Excellency, the former President of the United Republic of Tanzania, our, our dear Vice President, Your Excellency uh, Jessica Lupo, the Right Honorable Rakana Rugunda, Prime Minister Emeritus of Uganda, the ministers who are here and former ministers, the MPs, the Ambassador of uh, EU to Uganda, and also, I should announce he's my alumni, alumnus at Lund University in Sweden. The guild presidents and former guild presidents were here. Uh, the Alua Center of Excellency uh, on Notions of Identity, led by Professor Sarah Sali. Let's give her a hand clap. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all students, all people who are here. Uh, I've been given a very difficult task of giving a vote of thanks. Uh, I should have, I think, talked at the beginning to welcome you to Makerere, but I can still do it and, uh, and say welcome to Makerere University, which is, uh, as you've already realized, the oldest university in the region, the center of excellence in many areas, and we all take pride in Makerere University, which has groomed people, including our vice president. Uh, I, I make a special welcome again to His Excellency Jakaya Kikwete and reflecting on what has been said that uh, Makerele groomed people like uh, His Excellency uh, Benjamin Mukapa as well as uh, Nyerere. And I want to say, I want to claim that by induction, you are also a Makerele alumnus because you learned from Nyerere and Mukapa. So I want us to clap for you for being an alumnus of Makere University by induction. Makere takes pride in such activities because these are the activities that make us known as Makere, as, as the greatest institution in this region. So we don't take these uh, activities lightly. They are the ones that give us prominence. And that is why Makere continues to shine, in, not only in Uganda, but in the region, but also globally. When you travel, when you go to Sweden, when you go to Australia, and you mention Makerele, Makerele is a big brand to reckon with. So I want to thank you. 
So mine was to give a, thong, a vote of thanks to the chief guest uh, and also to our vice president for sparing your time to come and be with us. I want to thank the prime minister emeritus and also my, our mentor in many ways for gracing the occasion and all uh, the people are here. Ours at Bakere is to say we shall continue with this legacy because since today we are talking about legacy. Uh, Nyerere built his legacy and it will always be there. Uh, people like uh, 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 Mukapa made their legacy. People like uh, His Excellency Chikwete made their legacy. And we want to continue building on that legacy without distorting uh, the facts. I, I want to just reflect on one thing that the student leaders have said that at Makerere we, we tend to gag issues of democracy. I think it was in that tone. And I want to say that at Makerere we are really very democratic. Uh, we are very democratic. We have institutions, uh, guest of honor and vice president, that we have got a university council, and that council comprises of two members of our guild. Uh, so the guild president, the deputy, sit on the McKinney University Council, which is the topmost organ of the university. And that's why we make decisions regarding our governance, regarding our leadership. And we should have the, I mean, we should move together with the, 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 the notion of uh, collective responsibility. That once we sit as a council, then we should continue with what we have decided, not to go out and say we, have, we, don't, we don't subscribe to what has been passed. I just want to give that pointer and also to request our guild leadership. Let's, let's work together. Uh, and all the guilds that are represented. You work with administrators. You see, in democracy, you don't create chaos. You, you need to work with the institutions in order to promote the good things that are enshrined in the governance of that institution. Mine was to give a vote of thanks, not to complain, guest of honor. And I think I've done that. So I want to thank all people of God for gracing this occasion. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, this is the last guest here you're going to give us. I'm going to request um, High Excellency Jessica Lupo to come up here. I'm going to request Your Excellency Jakaki Kwete to come up here for the photo moment. I request uh, uh, Prime Minister Meritus Ruhakana Rugunda to come up here. I request the Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Arinitwe to join us up here. The two High Commissioners to equally come up here. Uh, the European Union Ambassador to Uganda, Your Excellency, please to join us as well. I will request uh, Justice Biabakama to join us up here. Dr. Sally, the Guild President, Makere University in Samba, and Damiano Masesa for that photo moment, and then we shall break for lunch. This is the very last photo opportunity we are having, and then we shall break for lunch. But at, shortly after lunch, you have one panel session that will be running. Please don't go home before you listen to other brilliant panelists that are going to share great thoughts and guidance on a couple of issues. Let's smile for them, comrades. They get the effect just like that. Thank you so much, Your Excellencies. And I'm not going to permit you to go down. We shall have the two anthems, rather the three anthems, sounded while we're still up here. I'm going to request we all stay up. 
Your Excellencies? Okay. Protocol will help me on that. Let's all stay up and we have the anthem sounded while we're here. Thank you so much. Uh, the Guild President requests to stand next to His Excellency Jakaki Kwete, please. Let's give that a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our guest of honor and Her Excellency, the Vice President of our land, Uganda, the diplomatic corps who want to appreciate our great partners who have been with us, who want to appreciate the German Corporation in Uganda, the European Union in Uganda, GIZ, Center of Excellence, Akinamama Africa, Civic Legacy Foundation, West Minister Foundation for Democracy, the Action Aid, Uganda Youth Network, the Julius Nyerere Leadership Center, and the University Forum on Governance, and lastly, the National Enterprise Corporation. We are breaking for lunch, and shortly after lunch, we shall have just one panel, and then we will wrap it up. Thank you for coming.
Ladies and gentlemen, partners and our VIP guests, your lunch is in the Innovation Hub. Partners and our key VIP guests, your lunch is in the Innovation Hub. And the rest of us, we shall have our lunch at the back. And the timeline is 30 minutes. We should be done and back. Thank you. Thank you.
No. Yeah. Oh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever we are. I'm going to request us to quicken whatever we are doing and get set for the next session, for the next panel discussions that we are going to be having. So kindly, those that are done having lunch, please come back to the auditorium. Those that were still in pictures, kindly wind up with the pictures. The stage will be needed for the next session. Those that are eating, kindly try to hurry. Those are the serving points. Let's be a little bit more quick and have the session moving.
Them say me can no go where them is them set trap. I walk out with the leg like who they sell a trap. No mali, I no fear. My body how they tell you. If Corona boss me, I no still wear a mask. Say you remember when we no feel you the chest back. When we see the pushy, I no scoot too fast back. It's in my body, you no go fit left. Cause not the guy, my dad with the fit to end class. Papilo, papilo. Friends, in case you're done with lunch, kindly come back to the main auditorium for the very last session. It won't take long. Please return to the auditorium for this very last session. Those who are done for lunch, please join us again for another conversation. Thank you. Friends who are done with lunch, please, this is the last call for this very last session. Panelists, Kidega and the fellas, please get in and restart this session so that we're in position to catch up with quite a load. If you're done with lunch, please return to the main auditorium and let's have this conversation, please. Thank you. Baby, 
seated almost a while a good day. Sing a lullaby, so go on, no more. Keep it on the rocks, so go on, no more. Keep it on the rocks, so go on, no more. Keep it on the rocks. Don't tell nobody, don't tell. Our little security. Keep it on the rocks, so go on, no more. Keep it on the rocks. Don't Baby, Mukka, the
in my life. I am the knees necessary, me have to keep your baby. Stay near me, no ifs, no maybe. Man, I sing in your ears like a neary, but I mean, bitch, in your heart like bitch, cheery. You ever present when me call your girl? No hide and seek because it's official. Be sweet when you wrap up in these arms, me girl. And me heart to jump up like a carnival, so girl. Like a king without a throne, like a queen without a throne, Salon without a comb, Sprints without a phone, without you. My girl, you know me house is not a home. In my life, you need a girl, I realize that. Never gonna leave your side, I hope you recognize that. Nothing in life comes easy, girl, your love, I earn that, learn that. Me not gonna turn back, so You wanna see me? I'm here to stay. I will never leave your side. When you're watching on me, you're my darling. My mother, my curate, my way better. Deep down on the moor, it's a nigga for sure. This is a nango set and a kunda. Pretty, pretty, pretty girl for me. Tricky, tricky, I don't know how you do me. Tell me, tell me that you never leave. Those of us that are still outside, kindly get inside. As we prepare to start the panel discussions of today's afternoon. I'm going to be reading the various universities that have been present. Wherever you are, if you hear the name of your university, kindly get to the auditorium. Kabale University, you're missing in the auditorium. Kabale University, Gulu University, you're missing in the auditorium. Isbat University, Bara University of Science and Technology, Makere University, Uganda Christian University, Victoria University, we don't have you in the house. Uganda Matters University, we are not able to see you. University of Kisubi, Mountain of the Moons University. IU, IU, we are not able to see you in the room. 
King Caesar University, representatives wherever you are, kindly get to the auditorium. Hoima School of Nursing, KRU Main Campus, Bugema University, Cavendish University, St. Lawrence University, the various universities I am reading, kindly and kindly get to the auditorium. There is a special package for the various universities, so do not miss out. Kindly tap on your friends that have not made it here or that are still outside that they, are, they may miss on because I'm doing some roll call. Cavendish University, St. Lawrence University, King Caesar University, Bishop Stewart University, East African Civil Aviation Academy, Nkumba University, African Rural University, Kagadi, Ladies and gentlemen, various representatives of universities kindly get in. There is a special package for you and we are doing a short roll call. So if you're not present, your you may miss out. University, Hoima School of Nursing, Kampala International University, Bugema University, Cavendish University, St. Lawrence University, King Caesar University, Bishop Stewart University, East African Civil Aviation Academy, Nkumba University, and then African Rural University, Kagadi. As we wait for various universities to get in, we are going to go to the next program, which is likely to be our last program of the day, which is an amazing panel that is going to be put here. I have been notified that Muni University is equally present today. Ndeja University too is present. So I hope the way your names have been read, you are present. Ladies and gentlemen, going to the second panel of the day, which is going to be a combination of the second and third panel, and so I will be calling upon the following panelists to come and join me here. So ladies and gentlemen, the theme or point of discussion for the second panel discussion we are having today is on youth engagement in policy formation. And we are looking at, I've been told Lira University is present, represented by the Guild President. We look at explore roles of student leaders in influencing tertiary institution policy framework. We shall be discussing how the education system
can better prepare students to become informed and active citizens, emphasizing the responsibilities of future leaders. This will further be combined with the topic of discussion on gender inclusivity in political processes. And the, top, and the discussion will be analyzing the challenges and opportunities for gender inclusivity in political participation. Ladies and gentlemen, the following will be our panelists for today. To begin with, Etiang Frederick, he was the Guild President, Chambogo University, 2010 to 2011. Mr. Etiang Frederick, if you're present, kindly take up the front seat. Miss Miriam, sorry, Miss Mariam Ichulet Arikosi, Guild President, Mbara University of Science and Technology, 2021 to 2022. You're welcome to the panel. Moses Kidega, the Secretary for Labor Affairs, National Youth Council. Kindly get to the panel. His Worship, Matanda Abu Baker, Guild President, Islamic University in Uganda, Mbale Campus, 2023 to 2024. I'm going to request the organizing team to kindly tap on the various panelists wherever they are to get in and prepare for the next panel discussion. You're welcome, Honorable Moses Kidega, Secretary for Labor Affairs, National Youth Council. Kindly join the panel. Also present with us today is the Metropolitan International University we are glad to have you here today. Next on the panel is going to be Honorable Namazi Olive, Guild President, Chambogo University, 2012 to 2013. Joining us on the panel will be Mr. Philip Baitwa. Joining us on the panel will be Mr. Philip Baitwa, Guild President UCU 2013 to 2014. Joining us next on the panel will be Honorable Nambasa Shamim, Guild President, Makere University 2021 to 2022. Next on the panel, joining us today will be Bashira Nantongo, Guild President, Islamic University in Uganda, the female campus, 2020 to 2021. 
My fellow leaders at the back, I request that we get orderly and get seated as the discussion on the floor starts. Honorable leaders at the back. Thank you very much. Then finally, ladies and gentlemen, the moderator of this panel today is going to be none other than Miss Helena Okiring Okecho, the chairperson and board of directors, UONET. Let us give a round of applause for Miss Helena Okiring as she makes it to the stage. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Good afternoon. How are we? Have we had lunch? Okay. It's very good to stand before you. Um, and before I welcome members of my panel, um, I'd just like to introduce myself. So my name is Helena, Helena Okiring Okecho. Uh, and I'm the chairperson of Uganda Youth Network, and uh, we couldn't be more honored to host this panel because it's about youth and uh, policy processes. We're discussing gender, all of which are things that Uganda Youth Network has championed for young people in Uganda. So it's exciting to be here. Um, I'd like, are we all up here? Looks like, look like a full house, right? So we, we can start. All right. So we are going to be discussing. We're going to be discussing gender inclusivity and youth engagement in policy uh, formation. So we are going to have a conversation that touches both of those aspects, right? So youth participation and gender. I believe the members of my panel have been very ably introduced, but I'll ask them before you submit, just for those who are coming in, just share your name again and the office you occupied while you were at university, and then you can answer the question. Once again, we've merged this panel um, so even as you give your submissions, feel free to explore those nuances between youth participation and gender inclusivity. If you can find a sweet spot between both, that, that would be great, right? Um, finally, just for clarity, this is an experience sharing panel. It's not an expert panel, so no pressure. We're sharing experiences. I encourage us to keep our submissions short. I know we have so much to share, our experiences are rich, but we prefer depth over spread. So if you can just tell us one thing really well, that would be excellent. And then after that, we will uh, go to our audience. Marion Chirabo, everybody. Uh, Marion was the head of yes, you give it yes. so she she was on the <laughs> she was the guild minister for gender um, in her time I think 85th cabinet right yes so I think her panel is well constituted so. I'm going to start with um, 
Unfortunately, I can't see all our names. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, Frederick. Is Frederick here? Not yet, okay. Uh, Mariam, I saw Mariam coming up. Is Mariam here? Okay, I'll start with, Marion is catching her breath. So, who will I start with? I will start with, um, let me start with Olive, yeah? Let me start with Olive. We want to hear some tales from Chambogo. Yeah? So, Olive, um, just tell us very, very briefly what was your experience? What was your experience influencing policy at uh, Chambogo the time you were there? And also tell us if being female was an advantage or otherwise in all of that? Thank you, moderator. Once again, as I've been introduced, my name is Namazi Olive Nalongo. And uh, I'm a former guild president for Chambogo University, 2011-2012. I'm actually the last female guild president that Chambogo has had. We've not had another, and I was also the third. I am currently the LC5 woman councillor representing the areas of Nakawa A, and also work with His Worship, the Lord Mayor, Elias Lukwago, as the city minister for public health, education, environment, and sports. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I am a proud associate and also board member of the Guild Leadership Academy. Um, for starters, uh, I, I want to thank you, moderator, for the guidance that we just make it very brief. My experience in influencing policy at a uh, guild leadership level um, I must say that it is not a walk of light, not a bed of roses. Mm -hmm. Because as a guild president, you are only two that are representing the students on the university council because it is the supreme body of the university and that is the only opportunity that you have to influence policy. So usually we are beaten by numbers. I will give an example of Chambogo University. It has a council of about 23 members and you, the students, are only two members. So you find that usually when you have uh, student issues that you want to bring up, if there, are some, if there are some policies that you want to really influence, usually you are beaten by the numbers and it is going to be consensus at the end of the day. That is why you see that in some universities, probably when there are policies that are not pro students, like probably increasing fees or any other policies that are known for the students, you find that the student leaders, probably the guild president, will be the first person to lead a strike because, not because uh, they did not present their views, but probably because they presented their views and they were not heard, or because they were heard, but due to consensus, they were not taken over. So that is why when you are on the student leadership, usually your voice is gagged. I know that the guild leaders who are here, you know it is not easy to influence policy as a student leader. We know that usually the voice that uh, the university administration and management um, listen to is that when the students go on riot or strike. But for me, I think that moving forward, the student leadership should be listened to more and uh, their ideas should also be taken up. I believe at the end of the day, we shall have less strikes in the universities. Whenever your voice is gagged, whenever your voice, whenever the students lose their voice at that level of policy influence, they will end up with uh, issues like uh, strikes. 
you asked me if um, my being a, a female helped me in any way. I, I, I won't say that it helped me in any way because for me, when I am contesting for a position, I, I don't, I, I put aside that I am a woman because usually I am competing with men. When I was competing for guild presidency, I competed with nine men and I said I will not pity myself, I will not use that ticket of, oh, I am a woman, what, what, what. I felt like what a man can do, a woman can even do better. It was in my head all along and I was thinking that I, I will leave this quote in the interest of time, that um, if you want something to be discussed thoroughly well, you will give it to a man. They will discuss it very well. But if you want something to be implemented thoroughly well, you give it to a woman. If you can see civil societies that are led by women, organizations that are led by women, and areas where women are taking charge, at the end of the day, we have better results because of our um, characters as women and also our opportunities as women that we usually bring up to the front. So I won't say being a woman was a plus for me. I will say that it was a tug of war because those boys, they didn't have any pity for me saying, hey, Olive is a woman, let's give her more time. No, it was a leveled ground for me. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Olive. I will now come to Mr. Philip Mugume, Olive said when we give young people an opportunity to influence policy, it's some positive things can come out of that. And so I want you to just speak to that. Share with us what you are able to do in UCU. How are you able to influence uh, policy at the university? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Philip Veitwa. I served as guild at UCU in 2013. And uh, currently I run a mentorship organization aimed at nurturing a new breed of African leaders. Um, on policy and my time of office at UCU, I will probably share with you what most people will not share. I'll share with you my weaknesses as I entered that office. For me, my biggest challenge was to influence policy when I needed to policy myself first. <laughs> so I rose at a time, uh, I got popular in a way I did not understand. I did not know how to handle popularity in the university. I did not know what it means. You know, I, all I focused about was, you know, taking the role, but I didn't know what to do next. And so I had to first deal with internal policies. So by the time I began to influence policy, I had first to win very many private battles. So, um, all I can say is the few things we were able to influence at university and have them changed and have them successfully done was after we had to first deal with our personal discipline to deal to conquer our own issues. And that's when we were able to convince um, different people. But otherwise, we were seen as unserious. We were seen as mediocre until we had to first uh, understand different approaches, what methodologies work. And so, um, for me, I must say, one year is a very short time if you have to first organize yourself and then you have to organize others. And this is a challenge that I really see with uh, leadership in different places. There is so-called opposition, that's a government in waiting, but if you woke up tomorrow and they said here is the power, what do you do next? Are you really prepared? So for me, I must say, 
I did not excel at policy because uh, I needed to first deal with a lot of things on my side. Starting from understanding, uh, I had to deal with things like my reading culture, for example. If you are too lazy to read, you are too weak to lead. So which policy are you going to influence? So I had to up my reading. I had to up you know, uh, my presentation skills. I had to up my IT, IT skills. I had to up almost a lot of things you know, in order to best influence policy. So all I can say is I did the part as an influential leader because leaders, we are good at speaking, we are good at influencing, we are, but I didn't successfully do that. So maybe those who got successful can share more. Uh, there are a variety of people here. But for me, that was my challenge with policy. But given a chance like today, I know I can influence better. Thank you. Wow. I think, first of all, know what they are doing. We take it for granted. But also, the interesting assumption that men sort of have it figured out. So to hear you, I think, share so openly for me is, is quite um, eye-opening. Thank you so much for that. Speaking of challenges in leadership, obviously, um, leading an institution like Makere can't be an easy thing. So I want to speak, you to speak to us, Marion. What were your strategies for navigating? First of all, share with us some of the challenges that you faced being a woman in leadership, a young woman, and how did you navigate those challenges as you influenced policy at the university? Can you hear me? Um, uh, once again, good afternoon. My name is Marion Chiaw. I am a lawyer. I'm also the team leader at Next Gen Women Initiative, um, an organization aimed at empowering young women, especially in um, learning institutions, and basically empowering them to take up uh, political spaces in these institutions. So um, I was also 85th um, Guild Minister for Gender. I can see His Excellency Kateriga as my president. By that time, he's in the house. So you talked about challenges, and I think um, Philip opens up a very important, uh, something that we don't really talk about. I think um, we are always patronized as young people. I think it's a discussion I had with someone today. Uh, somehow people expect us to know it all once we get into these positions, that you are voted and because you won the election the next day, suddenly you know how this position works. Uh, you should be knowing all the policies in Makere. When you go there, you suddenly know how to negotiate certain things, you are supposed to get into um, constructive arguments with professors who have, I mean, been in these things for over 30 years experience, and somehow you're supposed to outsmart out them and uh, bring forth um, policies that actually work for students. I think that's not talked about enough, and I would think that for most of us, that's the biggest thing. And it doesn't help each matters that there seems to be no one to guide you. People are so quick to criticize each and every mistake that you do. No one will ever come to you and be like, you know what, I think you're struggling here. I can help you do this and this and this. You know, most of the time, you have to reach out for that support, but you also don't know where to get it from. As a young woman, I would say that it's also a double layer because, first of all, most people don't think you should be in that position. I remember elections I participated in, and uh, people just didn't think because I was a young woman that I belonged in that space in the first place. But even when you prove them wrong and actually win that election, there is still that uh, condescending way in which people look at you. You constantly have to prove yourself that I belong in this space, that I deserve to be here. I have something to say. 
Uh, we used to have a joke during our times that most, at, uh, you know, I served in two guild, uh, guild governments. So in the first guild government, you would notice quickly on that, you know, most of the girls in the house were like chess pieces, just there to smile and what, everything was being done by the men and basically you're just a pawn in someone's game. So those were the challenges. How did we overcome them? I think sheer determination and the belief that no one should be able to have a say on what I want to be, at least for me personally. Um, you have to have incredible courage and belief in yourself. Um, that once you work, wake up in the morning to go into that guild house, no matter how many people are looking at you and thinking, what does she have to say? You stand up and be like, you fight for your space, uh, irrespective of what people say. The second thing I would say, reaching out for help. Uh, like Philip said, you, never, you don't know what you're doing. That's the first thing. And I think the first downfall of a, a leader is to think that they know what they're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You absolutely don't know. It's not, and especially in an education system where you have absolutely no avenue for any kind of civic education. Um, you, you live in families who don't really believe in their children taking up political office. You get, so, so you come totally naive. So it's important for you to seek help. It's important for you to seek people who have succeeded and ask for their advice. It's important for you to have a support system of those kinds of, do not be afraid of people who may appear smarter or more successful than you. After all, the thing is that you're in that position, you know? No one will ever come and say that they are the 85th gender minister. It will always be Chiravo Marion. So there's no reason why you should be threatened by people who are more intelligent than you or who are more successful. Yeah. Wow. So the power for me of just sheer determination and resilience, and that stands out for me. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, Bashira, welcome to our panel. It's good to see you. Talk to us. Um, you are a leader, uh, or you are a leader at IUIU. Um, I want you to give me two perspectives. One, give us one policy you were able to influence at the university during your time, um, but also touch a bit on your experience as a female guild president in an Islamic institution. What was that like? Is it, is it on? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Nantongo Bashira. I was guild president, Islamic University in Uganda, Females Campus, 2020-2021. So we are the COVID leaders. <laughs> so um, when you ask a question of the policies, um, I would also wish to share that uh, the president closed the institutions on my day when I got to receive the office or the authority. On, actually, the day I was swearing in as the guild president was the day they say tomorrow, Wow. So I operated basically online, and most of the policies that uh, we actually advocated for were more into uh, online learning, online inter inter interactions, because uh, aside online learning, because that was a university policy of, of which I backed, uh, I fronted to the university that uh, in this kind of situation that students are going through a challenging time of COVID-19, a lot is happening. Actually, it was a, a turnover either positively or negatively in all of our lives. So I requested the university to uh, enable conversations or reaching out to students to get to know them. And uh, I also made initiatives at a personal basis 
I discovered one of my friends actually in that year of COVID lost a mother on Women's Day. So when she lost a mother, uh, she, she was the father, the mother, so she took care of this student. So when she reached COVID-19, that period of uh, the pandemic at home, she didn't even have the mobile data to attend classes online. So she was forced to join the UPDF, not by choice because she wanted, but it's what she saw was best for her at that particular time. So by the time I got to engage with her, she was like, this is not something I actually thought about properly, like how will it be, but it's something I chose because what would I do? After all, I had fees balances that were close to two million pending, and now it's another semester coming in, and still, so a lot of things. So I influenced a lot of policies that encourage creating safe spaces to get to know what is happening in the lives of many young uh, students that are out there due to COVID-19. And I succeeded, though, um, I, you know, when you, when, you read, when you wait to work with people, you don't impact society. I always believe that when you want to do something, it should always start with you as a person. So all these uh, reach outs, all these things, I actually initiated them. That's why right now I'm even running an initiative, Talk to Bashira. I talk to everyone I find, because I believe everyone has a problem. Whenever you share, you get to understand what is really happening. Mm -hmm. And for the experience I got, this is an Islamic university, and moreover, a single-sex university. Um, to me, it was a great experience, because now I'm dealing with fellow women. There is no time for me to hustle with men. You know, whenever we are in a mixed society, sometimes um, these men are very patriarchal, and sometimes they can't even control it. So me, when I'm in a women's space, I always enjoy my space. We get to talk about issues and policies that best suit us because we are all women. We have the same experiences and almost the same dreams and same likes. And you know, we share a lot in common. So I think it was a great experience for me. And uh, up to now, I always use it an, as an opportunity because right now I lecture at IUIU. I already spare 15 minutes. My students know me. I don't know whether they are some here, but my students know me. I spare 15 minutes and I tell you the reality is out here. Don't mm. think that coming to a class would always be, you know, the, the only thing you can do. You have to get to be well versed with whatever is happening. So it's been a good experience talking to fellow women and some even tapping you somewhere that, you know, you are the reason I'm doing ABCD. So it's really great. Wow. Thank you. I think that's, that's very, very interesting. Um, we've also taken note of something interesting that you've said about your leadership kicking off at uh, the start of a pandemic, I think whose impact the world hasn't yet fully come to terms with yet. And I think for me, just the ability to provide situational leadership at that time and you know, support what was not and still not is an easy transition to digital learning, um, I think for me is very inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. I would uh, now like to go to Moses. Um, so Moses, of course you've been involved in student leadership and now your experience in student leadership and now you're at the National Youth Council. What skills did you pick up, you know, uh, engaging in student leadership, influencing policy at the university that you now apply? Um, or are, is it a different set of skills needed? Are these skills transferable? Please tell us more. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, having this conversation right now is, is rather very tricky because we are from um, a very heavy meal that is almost close to the one we had on Eid. So, you know, there is so much happening in the body. But well, um, first and foremost, policy is a creature of the law. And it's very important that any society is governed by a given set of principles and a given set of, of laws that you choose to define or put them in the category 
of a policy. I happen to hail from a region that is very unprivileged in this country. I was, I was born, in, and born and raised in, in Gulu, and that's a Chodi sub-region. And for those of you who are well braced with our history, you know that you know, the 20 years of the Lord's, Lord's resistant army was a very difficult time for us, uh, the people who were born and raised in that time. So my unique childhood experience was that I remember my teacher telling me that, Moses, should you ever have to you know, forego the trauma that you're witnessing today, the bullets that you, that you get to you know, hear night in, night out, you must study hard and go to Kampala. Because Kampala was portrayed as, wow, it's a beautiful city, there are good roads, you know, tall buildings, and we all strived. And from that point, I knew that my fate was in my hands. So I, from that point on, why I'm sharing this is because policy and the law is very important, and absence of the same exposes everyone to risk. We, I, 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 I grew up in a state where there was absence of policy and absence of the law. Uh, anyone could do anything that they wanted. And that experience to me made me appreciate um, the values of all of us subscribing ourselves to a given uh, set of rules and set of regulations so that we can limit the excesses. And that's why today I find it, I find it prudent that you know, this discussion is very important. But um, a policy or any law is meant to protect the underprivileged. Those who are empowered economically, social and socially, and politically might not benefit so much from a given policy. If a law or a policy cannot benefit uh, the minority groups of society, then I don't know what purpose it is serving. So when we look at uh, the youth um, um, and us generally as a country, we are not homogeneous. We have young people with disabilities. We have um, you know, youth in school, those out of school. We have skilled and unskilled. So, any policy must be cognizant of the idea that these are not a homogeneous group of people and that these policies must be inclusive in terms of gender, they must be inclusive in terms of the unique disabilities. Today we have had a full day experience here. I have not seen an interpreter standing somewhere. Why is there something that every one of us here can, can see or, or there is no deaf person? So, that already shows that even in our day-to-day -day lives, we are either by, and okay, I don't owe it to subconsciousness, that we are not very conscious of the uniqueness of our societies. So until uh, policymakers and those who influence policies become um, conscious of the need to, to be more critical in analyzing what policy works for a given group of people, then the efforts will be as, as, as good as you know, having them on paper. But lastly, let me say this, and um, from my experience, whether the school or the student um, experience translates directly into the youth politics. I, I agree uh, completely. I served on the national, sorry, on the Uganda National Students Association before I joined the National Youth Council leadership, and the experiences are almost the same. The challenges are almost the same. You're going to have to, to find at so many times to strike a sort of balancing act between those who you represent vis-a-vis -vis those who exactly at times maybe wield the resources or have the power. So you're going to find yourself in so many situations having to strike that delicate balance. But I am very happy and, 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 and honored to say that at least in our tenure of leadership as the National Youth Council, we have managed to advance and advocate for principles, sorry, that for laws and policies that we think that are going to be very crucial. In, uh, in influencing the lives of the day-to-day -day young person. And if I could just mention two or three of them is that, one, we have been at the forefront of uh, pushing for um, the startup bill, a law that we think needs to protect young businesses, you know, that if a, an entrepreneur is a young person, why can we have maybe certain tax um, regulations or tax exemptions for maybe a period of one or two years when the, business has, when the businesses are up and running, then government can come in to tax them. Two is the public procurement and disposal of assets. We think that for so long, public procurement has been a privilege of those who have over time amassed wealth and have built a reputation in terms of business. But how about that young Makere student who has finished school 
and they cannot find a job owing to the 9% increase of unemployment, they are going to somehow try to find you know, another source of livelihood. If the policymakers are not thinking about how do we protect these young entrepreneurs and you know, so that they can grow in their businesses, then again, that will be a big shortcoming. The last is with regards to um, the issue of gender equality. I think that it's evident today, and you can see on this panel, it's, it's, it's overly subscribed with, uh, with the women, which is a very good thing. But I think that um, there is a general acceptance and there is a paradigm shift and people are beginning to acknowledge and move away from the patriarchal way of doing things. I think we are almost at an equal, okay, not equal per se, but there has been great progress in terms of the empowerment of women. I think conclusively is that this empowerment should not be seen as an act of conformity to a given policy. That because you have the affirmative action uh, enshrined in Article 33 of the Constitution, therefore you need to put or have women occupying these offices. I think it should be seen as a sustainable means towards empowerment and a sustainable means towards the transformation and development of any country. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just want to pick up on that before you switch your mic off. Just two things. One, talk to me a bit about transferable skills. You've been in different spaces. Um, tell me if those skills, you know, are the same. But also, you mentioned uh, that you have come up with policies for young people. Yeah. Are there any in particular that have been created specifically to encourage young women either to participate in the National Youth Council or yeah, anything specific for yeah. women. Okay, uh, just quickly, is that um, the aspect of transferring skills is actually very obvious because if you look at the psychobiography of the people who we are always, I don't say against, but as a student leader, you're most likely going to be against the administration. The administration and their psychobiography is similar to the people that we shall not be against exactly, but those who we shall reach out to to try and negotiate. Now, in my space, we deal directly with the government because we are under the Minister of Gender. So you find yourself engaging with either the Minister of Youth, the Permanent Secretary, but the people who we are facing fall in the same category. They're all privileged. They, I mean, if you read Henry Barlow's article on, on, on building a nation, is that these guys fall on the other side. They are the privileged group. They have, they have amassed wealth. You know, so, so, so dealing with them is more or less the same thing. So if you get these skills from um, your experience as a student on how to negotiate, on how to you know, create leverage, on how to, to, because to negotiate, you must have some sort of, some sort of leverage. I remember one of the tactics that the university administration used to, to play against the students was that they would somehow intentionally create so many issues so that if, you're, if your interest is, say, the tuition policy, they have somehow found a way to engineer even an issue with the holds of residence, an issue with the, with the infrastructure, so that by the time you come to negotiate, they appear as if they're giving you something to take back home but they are withholding the most important, which perhaps would be the policy, uh, uh, sorry, the tuition policy. So they'll say, okay, we shall, we shall renovate the halls of residence and things like that. So you go back feeling, oh, at least there's something you have taken home, but you've missed out on the elephant in the room. So I think negotiation skills, those are, are transferable. Secondly, on the issue of women, is that the National Youth Council is an all-inclusive uh, institution at every single level of the National Youth Council structure, from the village level to the parish, to the uh, sub-county district, to the national. We have a female representative in all of those committees because the Youth Council is formed from the village to the national level. So I personally went through 10 elections to find myself on the National Youth Council leadership. At the district, your party election and the general election, five times. So. At all those levels, there is, a, there is um, an affirmative slot for the girl child. And I think, like I said, the, the young women are there, but form versus substance. They are there in form, but like Marion said, are they just pawns on the chessboard or they're actually influencing policy? To me, that's the question. Okay, but most of my question was just that. 
what, what is in place to support them to influence. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think you've made, you've made a couple of good cases there. The importance of learning negotiation skills, we definitely need that. I mean, if there was anything, we took home from the morning panel. Yeah, there were a couple of hot issues, and if we're going to have follow-up engagements, we definitely need to have our negotiation skills in check. And that's mm. also an important skill for engaging in policy advocacy, especially for us young people. So thank you for that. Now, I'd like to speak to the, the panelist, the first lady, Shamim, Shamim yes, mm. Shamim. Um, the names were a bit mixed up when we blocked the panels, so I was afraid to get that wrong. So thank you very much. Shamim, um, I know this is a bit obvious, but please tell us, how did your experience um, in Makere or in your university, how did that influence your engagement with politics post-university? Have you continued being a leader or after this you are like, that's it, enough? Let me first go and do other things. Please share with us your post-university uh, leadership experiences and what influenced that decision, whether the, the decision was to continue or to do away with politics afterwards. What influenced that decision? Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Shamim Nambasa. I'm the 87th Guild President of Makere University. I'm a pharmacist. I'm doing my internship at Yumbe Regional Referral Hospital and National Drug Authority. I served as the 86th Academic Affairs Minister and GRC School of Health Sciences. Um, so to answer your question, I'm still doing my internship. So the post-graduation internship, I've not yet really had the opportunity to interact in a larger political space or at national level. But if I were to decide, I think I would still go in for it. Because um, first and foremost, I believe that I learned a lot. It was my experience as Guild President was more of an experience or a learning platform before I could go further. I think I would agree with Philip and, and Marion, I think, because there is constant fear of making mistakes, that you come into leadership at a time when um, Papower is being blamed of signing the 15% tuition policy. So you're seated in council and saying, God, please help me. Let them not bring any policy that is going to affect students. Because truth be told, you represent about 15,000, 20,000 students, and you're two students representing them. You're sitting on a council with people who have very many underlying interests. That you'll sit in council and someone is bringing a policy to close businesses because they have their other intentions but the students actually need these things. So I believe that it was a learning opportunity and I'm taking this year off for me to enrich myself with knowledge and skills to further myself politically. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much for that, um, for that Shamim. I think there are, many, there are many interesting things there. You spoke about you know, um, having to navigate interests. You know, you have yours, and the people you're negotiating with also have theirs. And that's just the nature of policy engagement. Uh, some interests are shared, and some are not shared, and you have to navigate that terrain. So thank you very much for sharing with us. Before I come to my last panelist, I'd just like to welcome those of you who joined us when the session had begun. Welcome. We're having a discussion on youth engagement in policy formation vis-a-vis -vis gender inclusivity in political processes. So we merged the last two panels so we could have uh, the most of whatever was left of our energy. And if you agree with me, I think this was the right panel for the conversation. So for those who have come, once again, welcome with me, our panel. And for those who are here, please welcome those who came after. Please clap hard, hard. Yeah. Someone said ED food is still in his system. So this is one way to get it out, right? Thank you very much. So once we take the last uh, comment or the last uh, response, 
We are going to open this conversation to uh, the rest of us in the audience. So now's a good time uh, to think about what you want to ask. I encourage you to write down your question so that you keep it short and so that as many of us as possible can have an opportunity to ask our distinguished panelists. How does that sound? Good? Good. Oh, we didn't carry notebooks today. Hey, hey, hey. So find, find paper somewhere and just, yeah, scribble that down. Yes, to my last uh, panelist, there's so many things I want to, to pick up on, but if there are people in the audience who are considering, aspiring for student leadership, what's the one thing, what's the one thing you would tell them? As a leader, where you stand looking back with a gift of hindsight and foresight, what's the one thing you would tell anyone contemplating, um, aspiring for public office at the university? Thank you. Thank you very much. The one thing I would tell anybody who is interested in aspiring or putting themselves in any position is do not be the person who self-rejects. Do not be the person who disqualifies yourself from anything before those who may have been given the jurisdiction to do that are able to. So it's not my job if I'm aspiring for the guild leadership to vote for myself. Well, you can vote for yourself. But it's not my job to decide if I'm not eligible to be the guild president or to be a GRC. That will be the duty of the electorate. So if you have an interest in, in aspiring, you should not be the first person to literally um, eliminate yourself from that position. If, let's say, there is, um, um, for example, I recently, um, got the Shevling Scholarship to pursue my master's um, in the UK. And in the website of this scholarship, there are certain uh, preferences that they want. They want somebody who has finished their undergraduate program. They want somebody who has uh, two years work experience. They want somebody who, they had a very long list. And if I was to look at that list, I would say, you know what, this isn't for me. Let me wait for some time, finish my program, and then I'll apply. But I told myself, it's not my job to eliminate myself from this scholarship. There is somebody who has been paid to read applications, to review applications, and then decide that this person should not get the scholarship. So what I did was I applied for the scholarship and let whoever was being paid to read the essays and choose do the choosing. And guess what? I got it. So if you're thinking of applying for anything, of aspiring for anything, it's not your job to to eliminate yourself. So there needs to be an element of us um, realizing that we must have a high sense of self. You must be able to move with your head held high. You must be able to be aware that I am unique, I am special, I have something to bring to the table. And like um, one of my colleagues said, that no one is perfect, everybody has um, a weakness here and there, but that does not disqualify us from uh, benefiting from these programs. Um, very many of us uh, have had situations where because we are young leaders, because you're women, because you're men, you're going to be judged more harshly for making errors. But when somebody else who maybe was older, like we, are, we, are, we have seen uh, more mature leaders, we have seen those who we would expect to act uh, a certain kind of way making mistakes. But usually, when they, when they make the mistakes, they are not reduced to the sum of their mistakes. There will be um, different reasons given here and there. But when you're young and you make a mistake, they'll say, oh, it's because uh, he or she was young. It's because uh, she was a female. But we have seen all these other people making mistakes. So your age, your gender, um, all the different uh, bio that you have is not a reason to disqualify yourself. So that would be one thing that I would tell someone. And the one thing that I, I as a person, never like to feel is regret. I, I, have, I hate the feeling of regret. If I lose a race, I know I will heal. I know the reasons why I lost the race. I know maybe why I didn't get that job or why I didn't get that grant. But when I don't apply, when I don't contest, I'll always, I'll always wonder, what if? What if I had contested? There are different things that um, I have never applied for 
and I saw people getting them, and I would always wonder, if I had applied, I would have gotten it. Now imagine the times I have applied, or the times I have contested, and not been successful, the healing curve is swifter. Because maybe I know, okay, maybe I didn't put time, I didn't put money, or maybe they rigged, or maybe they cheated. But for you who didn't even apply, tell me, what excuse do you give yourself? In public, you may say, oh, I was busy reading, I, had, I was doing a very difficult course. But if you're honest with yourself in your heart of hearts, you wish you had aspired, you wish you had applied. So don't be that person who looks back and wishes. Be that person who can say, I did it for you. What were you doing when I was contesting? Fine, <laughs> I didn't win, but I did it. You know? Thank you. So that's what I would say to anybody who is aspiring for anything. Wow. Thank you very, very much. Uh, two things. Congratulations on uh, the scholarship award. And when you get to London, do you plan to run for office? Do you, are these plans in the offing? No regrets, remember? So are there plans? Uh, um, no regrets. I, I actually just <laughs> come back from finishing You've my come back. Aha, so did you, did you take part in any form of student politics? I did, actually. Mm -hmm. um, OK, when I went to, to the UK, I was the only African in my, in my class. I was the, um, and there was room to aspire for girls' leadership, uh, to present the faculty, to present my program. And for someone who has literally um, caught bigger fish, it was so easy for me to go there and aspire for the positions. So. Without a doubt, when I reached there, I knew that if there was a chance to aspire for anything, to put myself forward, I would be the first. And even while I was there, there were different uh, programs I initiated. Um, in, uh, you know how in most situations, there's a very big space between the, the elites and uh, those who are lower than them. And so I made a program where the different faculty in the university would actually come every lunch, would choose different faculty to come every lunch and have lunch with the students and talk about their career, um, how they became who they were. And these are just simple things that actually uh, yield big results. So from my experience in trying, attempting, and fearing regret, I always aspire for things. I always go for different things. And I've never regretted trying, never. Wow, so Kampala, London. She's leading. I can't think of a better note to open this to the audience. So can I see any hands? We'll take, uh, I think let's do two rounds of five, five, right? So my first five, uh, is there someone to help me take the microphone around? I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So one, two lady in red is two. Gentlemen, you are three, you are four. And lady with the nice ginger hair, you are five. Right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Gift Peter, and I'm a communications student here at Makere University. I'm also a student leader. I want to take this moment to honor this event. I'm very glad that we are tackling a subject which I've been yearning for these years to speak about. We have a system of government whereby it is typical representation. Now that in itself is first of all a disadvantage to the majority because you are supposed to elect the representatives who are going to act as your voices. And the unfortunate bit will come when they become rubber stamping individuals. Uh, the instance here at Makere University, I would like to say ever since I joined this institution, I am disappointed by the leadership of the guild because over the years, you really don't see any meaningful reforms this is something we don't talk publicly for some reason, but I'm going to speak candidly on this. We do not have serious reforms, student-based. Even if policies are made at the dinner table of the council, these guild representatives that we send, the guild president and his acolytes, they are supposed to consult students to seek their views and opinions. But we have leadership that is completely detached 
from the student community. The time they surface with the students, most times is when they are campaigning. Now, after being elected, they disappear. So that is how terrible we have been. We don't have serious reforms at the Hill. I don't know what we can do. Perhaps any of you can guide what student leaders are supposed to do. Because for me, as a student, I am not satisfied with the quality of guild leaders we have. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much the panelists for the wonderful discussion and all protocol observed. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jacqueline Katsavi, the Guildy President, African Royal University, located in Kagadi, Midwestern Uganda, and it's an all women's university. Uh, I've liked the experiences that different panelists have shared, uh, but one, I've realized the weakness, like we're talking about um, policy formulation. Uh, one of the weaknesses we would have realized as leaders is capacity building. Like most of us have said that before you enter, when you've entered leadership, remember you have that fear in you. I'll give an example with us at African Royal University. We are trained in the visionary approach, whereby you have a vision for yourself, you have a vision for your community, you have a vision for your campus. That means if I join politics and I'm a leader, I'm not looking at gaining money from politics, but I'm looking at working for a vision of my university. So uh, the, I'm looking at it to remember if we are not trained these other, all the students. Remember, you don't know if you're going to contest, you're going to win. So they will not say, let's train Jackie, let's train this one because she's the one that will win. So let them train all the students such that we come from the lower ground when we are grounded. Even if you've joined politics outside campus, you make sure that you benefit the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Namanya Godfrey. I am the outgoing Guild Health Minister at uh, Guli University. I want to take this opportunity to appreciate and acknowledge the rightful choice uh, done by our moderator in the selection of the panelists that we are having here. Uh, we are talking about policies. And one of the panelists raised the issue about negotiation. Now, as a student leader in a situation uh, where you find there is unfair policy formed in a university, and you try to negotiate in a situation where negotiations cannot work out. So as a panelist, I'm inquiring now, which next step would you take, or which advice would you give in a situation where there is a favorable and fair policy, but you have tried all the steps, all the negotiations, but they cannot, you cannot find a change. Which advice would you give? Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, our dear panelists. Uh, my name is Chandra Kenned, um, a former guild official at Anna Christian University, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, mine is a quickie. It goes uh, straight to uh, Mr. Moses. Um, like uh, when you talked about that, you've been at the like the National Youth Parliament, the National Council, the like okay, like for a student. Who has, who's, who has just uh, uh, finished, like, let's say, student politics, or like is interested in national politics, 
how, how best can you advise them to prepare? Like, what are the qualifications needed for one to, to like, to, uh, to position themselves, like, to apply, like, let's say, at district level, regional level? Should one, like, have an organ that they are attached to? Like, should one be in a particular, uh, let's say, party or something? Like, uh, is that way, is that like, uh, a perfect like a way someone should like uh, like the necessary steps they should take like in case they're interested in national politics. I would like you maybe to elaborate more on that. And uh, yeah, that's that's mine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aloikin Praise Apologi, and I'm a student from Akira University studying a Bachelor of Laws. Uh, my question goes to Moses Chidega. You spoke about uh, striking a balance between you, the people you represent, and the powers that be. Uh, I would love to know how do you personally strike that balance. My second question still to you is uh, about Chigati. Uh, Chigati is a term that is rising among political youth where, uh, you know, uh, they use it a lot in political spaces to mean sort of like a bribe or something of the sort, interest, personal interest that you get from being within political spaces. And uh, this has led to young people get keeping places of power. That's why you see when you come to most of these formal spaces, it's the same people. And uh, we have failed to reach to the actual grassroots of people and enable, develop them into better leaders for tomorrow. What are some of the strategies that you could propose Propose to ensure that as young people we do not become the threat that we want to fight, quote unquote, the junta we always allegedly say we want to fight. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for those first five. We will now come back to our panel. Um, I think, Moses, your plate is most full. So um, I think you had three questions one on transition pathways, how do people prepare for national leadership? Uh, and then the other was on striking um, the balance, you know, between the interests of leaders and those they lead. And then the third was on, was it called, my Luganda is terrible, so I'm warning you. Chi? Chigati. Chigati. <laughs> that one. Yeah? Uh, yes, Olive? Mm. Okay, great. Uh, Moses, have you okay. accepted to receive yeah, the help sure, after? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Oli. I, I need every hope I can get now, so <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. All right. Um, just a quick one, is that um, um, the politics of this country has been, over time, increasingly monetized. And um, whereas we might want to um, exempt ourselves from that liability, I think we are also vicariously liable as the participants who have either encouraged or by virtue of accepting this mode of uh, political practice, we have encouraged the culture. I, I agree that it has become a norm by those who wield the power to see young people as, as mere tools they can use in a political process. In 2020, when the streets of Kampala were burning down, the, the people who were actually orchestrating and you know the architects of that violence were not themselves on the street. They were seated somewhere in an AC room, sending I, I don't know money or you know rubberizing the public, and you know encouraging young people to get out there and demonstrate and do all these things. So I think if young people go into an electro cycle without knowing what they want, then they end up running their agenda of those who wield the power. So I, I think young people, young people must continuously define their agenda. What do you want out of an electoral process? For as long as you don't know what you want as a group of young people, you are going to find yourself driving the agenda of President Museven, the agenda of Bobby Wine, the agenda of Mugisha Muntu, and all those guys. So I think we need to define what we stand for and what we achieve, what we want to achieve in any political process. Two is um, the balancing act. It is 
um, not simple, but I think it goes back to your personal principles and the values that you stand for. If you think that something is right or is wrong, you must be able to speak against it. You know, we have, you know, mere silence alone can be an act of condoning. That the moment you don't speak against something, you can be seen to condone. In the legal practice, there is, uh, there is a common maxim that we say that a fact that is not disputed is assumed to be true. So if you cannot speak against these acts, then you're somehow then, you know, um, condoning the same. So the balancing act, it is difficult, but if you have your principles and values that you stand for, I think you can maneuver through them. Lastly is on the aspect of transition from student politics to national politics. You're already doing what you have to do. You're finding yourself in these spaces, having to share thoughts and ideas with whoever is here. I think that is what you have to continue doing. There is no blueprint somewhere written that, oh, to join uh, the Youth Council or to join national politics, you must do A, B, C, D. No, no, no. Just put yourself out there, continuously involve yourself in these kind of spaces, and you know, every day that comes by, you're learning something, and you're subconsciously preparing yourself for bigger responsibility. Yeah. Great. So the way to learn is by doing, yeah, in this doing. case. Fantastic. All of you wanted to add something on uh, preparation, transition pathways. How do you, what do you need right now so that you can be a, a great leader? Yes. Uh, thank future. you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want to start. Unfortunately, that gentleman has moved out who was saying that, uh, okay, he's here. He was disappointed with the quality of leaders. And uh, I mean, you, you could be right, but I think just like uh, your former guild president has ably mentioned and uh, my colleague here, that when people go into guild presidency or leadership, there is no... That they don't usually have any kind of training. When they get there, they are literally gambling. I can ask you, do you know how long it takes for a project to get through procurement? Do you know if you miss? Do you know the single treasury account? So when, do you know the budget? The university, you have a guild budget, but there's also a university budget that you have to fit into as a government or as a guild president. So when those people get there, they are literally gambling. And if they fall in the wrong hands, you find that they are practically not going to do anything. So when you go into leadership, for me, in my government, I was able to leave something on ground, but you find that most of them don't leave anything on ground because as they get there, as they're trying to get their balance, time is running out. It is only nine months. But for me, when I got there, I was like, let me think of projects that can go through procurement probably in four, five months. Before I leave my, my, my office, I should be able to leave something on ground. But some of them will pick projects, maybe to build a student center, and the student center will take five or six years. So sometimes you blame them, but usually it is the choice of projects, it is the lack of experience, and many others. So just be, be be kind to them and try to understand them because tomorrow you are going to be in the same position. I know you may even be contesting the next election, so you will get there and you know what takes place. Um, the issue of transitioning. For me, I am very sure that even in this house, we have, uh, we have people who are going to the National Youth Council in 2021. We have people who are going to be youth MPs. We have people who are going to be LC3 councillors, LC5 councillors, I'm very confident that you people are here. But you have to prepare. For me, when I was, I was a guild president in 2011, 2012. From there, I went to Pepsi and worked for a few years. I contested in 2016. Uh, good enough, I was in the same community. So what I have to tell you is that don't take such engagements for granted. For us, we didn't come from heaven and fall. The confidence that we have today, the eloquence, the research skills that we have today, we didn't get from heaven. But we have worked with different, uh, uh, you, I think some of you are unlucky that some of these CS, uh, civil society organizations that are helping us, some of them have run short of funds because of some government policies. But I am an alumni of the Leadership Academy which was, I think, at that time uh, supported by uh, Uganda the Uganda Youth, Youth Network. Network. I am an alumni of AMWA. 
Amanda alumni of the John McCain Fellowship for Freedom. So those opportunities that we have had at the youth, at the Leadership Academy, I met women that I was looking up to, like Betty Kamia. I interfaced with uh, with uh, Miriam Atembe, the Nobat Mawas were there. And these were people at that time who were in active politics. And I felt like, no, I think as I transition, I should go into active politics. But I had to prepare. Because during those trainings, they taught us how you can uh, work on public speaking, how you can fundraise for a campaign. Because you can't go in a campaign without money. You'll get there with all, the, with all your eloquence and what. But if you don't have posters, you don't have a PA system, you will not manage at the end of the day. So get mentors. I will not move away from that get mentors, be prepared, and be focused. It is very important for you to be focused, to know your journey. Don't think that you'll just wake up and contest. At the end of the day, you are going to end up losing. But if you're focused, by now you should know where you want to stand, if you want to go into national politics. If you want to go to UNSA, you should know that I want to be this. If you want to go to the National Youth Council, you should know that in 2021 I want to be here. And look at the people that you need. Start looking for them. If it is mobilizing resources, start mobilizing resources because people are already on the ground campaigning. So for me, I believe all of you here, most of you here, you are the leaders of tomorrow, and you can do it. You just have to do what we have talked about today. You can easily transition, because for us, we are in council now, I will tell you. My friend Julius is here. He's a graduate. But we are in council with P2 dropouts, uh, with uh, P3 dropouts. And we are, uh, one of our roles is to budget for the city, is to initiate policy for the city, is to bring the views of our people. But because there are no um, academic qualifications to being a counselor LC5, you can imagine, or LC3, we end up with such people. Because you people are not taking up these spaces, you people who have got this opportunity to interact with very good people, you have not taken up these spaces. So 2021 is around the corner. Please 20, take up 2026 20, 20, is yeah. around the corner. Please take up these spaces. You are, there's Thank a lot you. of space for you. Thank you very much. I'd like to bring this to a wrap. Before we do, uh, Shamim has something to say. Please do so in a minute, and then I'll come to Marion. Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much. I wanted to reply to the gentleman who raised an issue on the quality of leadership that we have, and he raises disappointment in the guild leaders that sit on the council. But I want to say that our leaders are a reflection of our society. If we are unserious as a society, we shall have unserious leaders. And it comes to the level of engagement and discourse that you have. That if as a GRC house, you're going to discuss the flavors of soda that the speaker brought, you're going to discuss food, you're discussing things that do not affect students, your student leaders will go to council, sit down, get allowances, and leave. I'll give you an example. When I was guild president, I did have it on my agenda that I wanted to talk about whole renovation. But until one of the GRCs from University Hall shared pictures of leaking roofs in their halls of residence, we sat down and discussed it as a GRC. I promise you that the next retreat we had, it's the only thing we talked about, me and my vice president, and Kateriga was also there. Mm. And I, as I speak of today, Lumumba Hall is being renovated. There you so, go. Rep your leaders represent who you are. If you're not having a good discourse and engagement, they will not have what to present as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So it's up to us as students also to shape the agenda for our leaders. Thank you. Lastly, Marion, what do you do when negotiations fail? So in your experience, I know you are involved in <laughs> A number of eh? where you're taking me, I might not be invited back and be accused of inciting students. <laughs> um, um, I so I understand that the the space, but also we are talking about at least today we have been able to talk about national politics and related to what is happening in our institutions of learning. I am aware, and I would not, and I don't say this lightly, um, being an organizer in this space, 
um, being a student leader. There's certain things right now I can't tell a student leader to do. Why? Because the space has changed. It's, it's not like in our days, unfortunately, for the student leaders now, you do not have some of the protections that we had as students during our time. During our time, we knew that the courts of law actually worked, that you're not going to get suspended over whimsy things and stay out of school for a full year and not come back. That you know that, that you will go and you will go before a court of law and if the reason for your suspension is very whimsy and the fact that the courts at that them did uh, respect the freedom of expression, you know that you will come back. That the courts at that time did respect the freedom of academic freedoms generally, you would come back. So right now I, I, I would hesitate to tell someone to do the things that we did during our time. And before you do what you think that we did during our time, I would want to tell you the pros and cons, but also at the end of the day, it's important for you to stand up for the things that you believe in. But then when you're standing up for those things, you be mindful of the risks that come with it. But also when you go into those steps, make sure that you have buffers. I, I always tell student leaders that, or generally any person that I'm working with in the political space, I find it very irresponsible uh, for our political leaders to tell us to do certain things when they know that the risks are involved and they do not take active space to make sure that they buffer us. I know that there's little that you can do uh, in such a space that is uh, suffocated, but I'll give you an example. During 2021 elections, um, most of us participated. Uh, I know that a lot of my career students were polling agents. And a lot of them uh, got arrested with these, um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, those those um, results, results what? DR, yeah, DR forms. A lot of them got arrested with DR forms. But I'll tell you that um, I had to help some of them get out of the country because CMI was looking for them. They w their lives were in danger. But in order for them to get out of the country, we needed letters from some of their parties to confirm that these people were actually polling agents and they actually need help. These leaders switched off their phones when you would tell them they started denying these people. Later on, they started accusing these people of Simani selling themselves to the state and, and yeah, selling DR firms. So I hesitate always right now to tell uh, whether it's student leaders, whether it's young people who really have strong values and they want to stand up to them to do certain things. Because I know that when you get into trouble, these people who are propping you to do some of these things, they're going to leave you there. Some of them will just abandon you there. Yes, they'll be on TV, our people, our people, but they're doing, and I'm not saying anyone particularly, don't quote me and say that I'm accusing someone. I'm just giving you a general picture. It is important as a leader when you have people who are following you and you want them to do something, yes, we have to fight for things that we believe in. But also, it is important that you protect your people. If you are a student leader and you know that you have a demonstration, that you want to have a demonstration, which lawyers have you contacted to make sure that they are getting these kids out of jail the next day? Right? And we did some of those things. I think mm. Helena can testify. During our FISMAS four strike, we reached out to people like them. We reached out to, at that time she was in civil society, working with some organizations, we reached out to them. We made sure that there was protection for our people. We were following up our people 
to make sure that wherever they are, they could be found. So I hesitate unless you can do the level of organizing that we did during our time and there is protection for your people. I hesitate for you to go the extra mile because I know people are lazy. You know, time comes and you, you're tired. You don't even want to hear. Leaders have switched off their phones. They don't want to know. Problems are too many. <laughs> but as a leader, you have you. to take responsibility for your people. Thank you very much, uh, Marion. And uh, you just botched my yellow dress plans, but. Um, <laughs> uh, now, I have been advised, and this is a tough decision. I have been advised that we have overstayed our time, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to close. I know it's, it's tough. Uh, yes. So it's late, and we have to close. So. Um, I'm going to give each of the panelists who have not spoken just 30 seconds to close, all right? So just in 30 seconds. And then for the rest of us, um, I believe some of these guys are not going to leave immediately, so please connect with them. Um, the time was really short. You all understand we were working and we were making do with the little time we had left, so kindly, kindly Forgive us. I will not be taking any more questions. I have been advised that uh, the time is up. So I will just ask my panel, please close in 30 seconds, and only those who have not said anything. So Bashira, um, Mariam, yes, and uh, sorry, Philip, Philip, right? Yes, and Philip, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I want to close with two quotes. The first one is, we are in a generation where we have to act right now. Because right now we are looking at the government uh, overstaying, all the, our leaders overstaying and not uh, giving us the spaces, but we are taking too long in this quest. And by the time you get to office, you will be actually too old for the young people that are coming after you. And they will not be as tolerant as you have been to the current leadership. And lastly, what cannot defend itself shall not be defended. What cannot defend itself shall not be defended. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Mariam? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Okay. Um, what I would tell young people is that we are actually um, multi-hyphenate people. We are multi-passionate people. And there are several ways that we could express ourselves, that we can express ourselves. And we must be able to look at the various options uh, available to us. We must not um, limit the horizons within which uh, we view our future in only things that maybe we have seen around us, we must also be willing to create um, a future, a reality that even those around us haven't seen. And though this day we have um, focused a lot on political parties, the political space, um, there are so many ways of um, serving society, um, propelling yourselves to higher echelons, and we must look at the ways that have been spoken today, but also look at the different talents that we have within ourselves, the different interests that we have, and then through that dichotomy, find a way of actually um, creating a reality that when we look back 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we will be proud. Um, there are very many people who, let's say, are in the, the political space, and they are proud, they are moving with their heads held high, and there are also those who um, would have done things differently. So let's not only look at these different um, things with um, fairy glasses, but we must be aware of um, the actual realities that are available to us, and be willing to do the work and create the world that we would really love to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. Finally, Philip. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to speak to those who are not looking at joining politics. Uh, it seems to have been coiled that leadership is all about joining politics. Uh, for me, I'm in business. I'm into modern farming. I'm into value addition. That area needs leaders. 
the church needs leaders, mosques need leaders. And so I want to, I want to ask the, the brains behind this idea to immediately rethink of that vision. I have seen that our vision is to aim at looking at people going to parliament and the, NR and the structures. That's narrow, it is small. So I am looking at a vision of nurturing leaders for Africa. I am not looking at um, only politics. Two, for those who want to join politics, it starts with why. Why are you going to join? Is it a question of you just joining to be part of the problem and advance it? Or it is to join for a cause? So I want to say leadership is missional. Every generation has a mission to fulfill or not fulfill or deny or betray. The generation of the Nyereres, the mission was liberation. The generation of the Musevenis, it was peace. What is our generation of course? And to me, the leadership generation of our time should be looking at good stewardship and tackling things like corruption. That is our bush war for me. That is our bush war as a generation. Can we get leaders now who can make sure? Because your car gets stuck bribing the traffic officer. Somebody gets knocked to get into hospital. It is money for your patient to be worked on from hospital. I mean, everywhere, every institution, the criminal justice system, the, 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 the law and order sector, all the way, it has issues because there is lack of good stewardship in our leadership. So for me, I want to conclude by saying, young people must prepare when two men were given a big tree to cut, one went and began cutting, but another one spent more than half of his time sharpening his ax. So I want to emphasize that we must prepare in order to deal with the problems, diagonalize, go to solve something, not being an addition into a problem. One thing I for sure do not wish to be is a member of parliament. I don't want. It is not something I admire. I want to sit back and nurture, nurture those who want to go there to solve a problem, but not going there. Thank you very much. Okay. So time negotiations happening here. We, <laughs> we have really, really uh, tried. Um, but I have one request from the organizer to permit one person to speak. So I'm going to do that in one minute, sir. Um, do come. Where's the microphone? Just a minute, and then after that, I will hand this back over. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Katumba Salim. I am a, a senior policy analyst at the Parliament of Uganda. I was a member of the 80th Guild, and uh, I am the chairperson of the University Guild League. So you people are talking about policy, you are talking in my field. I was representing the School of Social Sciences. That's 2014. Uh, now, <laughs> and my wife is what? Hey, my wife was a social affairs minister in, uh, in the 80th, 83rd Guild. Um, I want to, my point I wanted to make when I was negotiating with for time is what he has brought out. Uh, the organizers are looking at the leaders at universities, the young leaders, eventually now becoming national leaders or going into politics. But there's another angle. Because first of all, when we have come to university, we are studying to get the qualifications. So, and uh, politics is not a career. Uh, politics is uh, something where we are providing a free service, although in our world now, it is no longer a free service. 
So we can look at an angle of other young leaders at university, finishing university, and do other things and provide leadership at other levels away from just politics. Uh, like he has said, I have a problem. I work at parliament, but I have a problem of becoming a member of parliament because I think I cannot be in a house with a senior six lever. I, I, I think the qualification should be high. I cannot be having these masters three or four you are aspiring to have a PhD and then you are discussing with a senior six lever. My thinking is that um, since we are members of parliament, anyone, councillors are policy makers and are lawmakers, they should have at least maybe uh, something at law school because they are lawmakers. They have to interact with the law somehow. So, please, organizers and young leaders, not everything is supposed to be in politics or going into national leadership. You can be a leader at university. It, actually, every one of you should be, try to be a leader at university. It's a very good vehicle. Even us who are into policy, as a policy analyst at parliament, it's because I was a university leader that I got engagements outside, and then I, it became easier for me to know, you get, then I got the job and all that. So at university, it's a good trait. It's a good idea to be a leader. But do not look at only being an MP, LC5, LC3. We are not all going. I'm not going to aspire against Katerega, my friend, for a position. If Katerega runs, I'm like, no, I will not. I would rather support him. In 2021, you would find, personally, I had a budget of around uh, five million for my colleagues who are aspiring for buy, for buy for them posters and what, because I know when they go through, and I'm also on the wall, I can take a Ganakua poster zange. So please, nange nyamba wano, you get. So now, what he's saying, helping ourselves and what. So others, we should look for other things. The ones who have tried and it goes through, yes. If it fails, you went to university, you acquired that degree, put a degree in use. Thank you very much. All I right. think my time you gave me is not a wasted time. Thank you very much, uh, Salim. And thank you very much to our panelists, Marion, so, Moses. Me, ex what I forgot to talk about, we have a Makere University Guild League final match day. It's, and none of my members spoke about it, even if you are Shamim. It's on 5th May at uh, the rugby ground, and uh, the guest of honor is uh, engineer Moses Magogo, the former president and a uh, member of parliament. And we invite him in a capacity because he was a member of the SCR for Livingstone okay. Hall, and also Honorable Fiona Nyamutoro, the current uh, minister for uh, state energy. So please, we call, and the former guild, guild, guild president of uh, the 81st Guild, we call upon you to come and mobilize others for the grand final of the Makere University Guild League. The Guild League brings together all former leaders of Makere University into a football, not so much competitive league every fortnight to know ourselves and to network. Thank you. Okay. So take note of that football where the goal is not to score, but uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so once again, um, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you, Marion, Moses, Philip, uh, Marion, sorry, Mariam, Olive, Bashira, and Shamim. Another round uh, to them. And also another round to each of you. Thank you for staying to the very end. It has been an honor to host this panel. Once again, my name is Helena Okiring Okecho, and I'm the board chairperson of Uganda Youth Network. Thank you to all the organizers, uh, to the team, Damian. Damian is not here. But once again, congratulations on this milestone summit. And as the Youth Network, we look forward to working with you on many more. We look forward to continuing to work with university students uh, as we continue to build for the future. Thank you very much. Let's clap for them as they leave.
Another round of applause to the wonderful panel that was here today. All has been said, what remains is, what do you go back with? At the end of the day, I have a friend, uh, she's a lady called Naiga Doin. She always asks people one common question, which is at the end of the day, what would you want to be remembered for, or what would your contribution to such an event be? Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to recognize a very important person who is seated amidst us. Many of our elders left, but there's some who stayed and had not been recognized. But allow me to take this opportunity to recognize Mr. Cheruput Toskin, the Executive Secretary for the Uganda National Students Association. Do you mind saying hi to us as Cassius comes on board? Long press on it, just. Uh, thank you, moderator. Salim says we should close UNSA. <laughs> oh, you are dissolving? This one is will eat you up. <laughs> so, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am privileged to be here today. Let me thank the organizers for inviting us. And uh, the discussions have been very good. Today, I chose to be a listener so that then I internalize exactly what the students want. So, thank you very much. We shall have more interactions with them in other panels and in other engagements. I'm here with the, the president. You know him, but let me recognize yes. him. He already yeah? said hello to us. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and also to another... And former speaker. <laughs> to another great leader that uh, has not been recognized, Mr. David Nyaribi. It is a pleasure to have you here. For those of you that have listened to him speak, I uh, know what I talk about when I talk about a great leader and mentor. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being part of, uh, of the Leadership Summit. Right about now, allow me to welcome Cassius, who will give us the closing remarks as, uh, from, team, from the entire team and flag us off and wish us farewell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda. Uh, I know time is fast spent, so I will make haste with my submission. Uh, before I go any further, I, think, I don't think he had been recognized uh, uh, the president of Chamgo University, His Excellency Reagan. <laughs> ah, there he is, there he is. Seated in the crowd. You know, it's very nice giving a speech when, they, when they, the whole building is packed to the rafters. So, my speech will be brief. I first want to thank you all for uh, attending. Yeah, the people that are moving out, don't worry, the speech is going to be like three minutes stopped. So you can wait a little bit. First of all, I want to, in this absentia, the chief guest, the keynote speakers, the panelists and moderators, the volunteers and the organizing team, uh, the partners, the numerous partners that we had here, that made this dream come into realization. And also a round of applause to Makere because uh, the first Guild Leader Summit is held in MOOC and it shows that MOOC is taking this on and we're happy to partner with MOOC for years to come. And to you all, especially those that are uh, remaining here today, right now. I think Damien did mention it in his submission but for just some context of how this organization came into place. We started this idea, I think two years ago, and I remember we used to meet in, in Tinder, uh, the number kept on reducing. We first invited people, there, was, there were 30 presidents that turned up, the number kept on reducing, 20, 10, 5, to now the originals that you saw here in front of us all. And I want to thank you all, the team members that stood by Damien and that stood by this idea of the Guild Presidents Leadership Academy. And I also want to appreciate you all for the feedback that you've given to us. You have to remember that this is a, a summit first of its kind. 
It would be very egotistic of us to assume that everything would be perfect. But I want to thank you all for the thorough feedback. I had feedback about the vision, uh, feedback about maybe uh, incorporating uh, uh, sign language interpreters and so on. This is very rich uh, feedback that we need and to grow and to make this even better. So I want to appreciate you all for that. And also, you could see that all the keynote speakers have inspired other people to be leaders. And I think what the greatest virtue of a leader is the ability to create other leaders. Am I entirely right? It's like as if someone is clapping here. Thank you, Belinda. Belinda is paying attention. So I want to encourage us all that even after living here with all this beautiful knowledge that you have amassed here, please spread it to other people. Make sure that next time we come here, this place should be packed like people should even be outside there. We're going to even look at getting a bigger location. Uh, our target was 300, 400 attendees from the data that we have right now with our sheets and that, uh, data forms. We have so far clocked over 700 attendees. Wow, that is a very, very big um, sign to show that as the young leaders, we're taking this idea on. And I want to encourage you all that we're not a competitor. We're not here to rival any other organization, no. We're just here to contribute to the leadership of tomorrow. And as someone has said, it might not be political, it might be somewhere else in the civil society world, somewhere else in the business community, but then all leadership has a fundamental uh, grounding, and that is the grounding of you, the young people. And I think as young people, we should take great pride in that. Um, as I conclude, I want to thank you all. Uh, this is the first of its kind. Uh, preparations are already underway for the summit of next year. And I can assure you, Atmos, I can assure you, it is going to be a lot, lot better. There's something we're cooking, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure all of you will enjoy it. And um, I thank you once again for attending. Uh, God bless you all. Johnny Masses, uh, the executive director I couldn't be here. He had some other organizational matters to handle. But from us all, from the organizing committee, from the partners, I want to thank you all. God bless you and safe journey. Thank you.